eyes. There might have been a small smile, too, but it was quickly replaced by a hint of suspicion. It was hard to tell with the scar on her cheek pulling her face up on one side. He moved on to Rogers and Dankirk, two blocky Midwesterners, both Sam's choice. Alex had read their charts. Both had good histories in the Rangers and Seals. They had the right experience and excelled out in the field. Rogers, Dankirk, you know where we're going? Alex asked. Hell and back, sir, they responded in unison. It was the standard Hawk response. Basically, it didn't matter which hellhole or meat grinder they were dropped into. They'd enter, win, and then vanish like smoke. Leave with a smile and a shoe shine, as Hammerson always said. Alex nodded and moved on to Barclay Jackson. The SAS man stood a couple inches taller than him. He had scars on his cheek that ran down underneath his chin, evidence of a brutal life. Jackson, I don't know you yet or what you can do, Alex said. The moment we step on that plane, we cease to exist on paper. We're effectively dead. But if you fuck up in the field, then you might get us all dead, real dead. I'm not going to let that happen. Understand? The man's eyes never wavered. I'll keep up. Damn right you will. Once again, the technician, Walter Gray, met them as they exited the elevator. He rubbed his hands together when he saw Sam. Lieutenant Reed, good to see you again. He smiled briefly at the others, and then looked at Alex, who nodded, then continued down the sterile white tunnel. The others fell in behind him. Gray walked fast to keep up. Er, uh, Lieutenant Reed, Sam... How's the combat harness? Sam didn't slow, but looked down. Good. Fair bit of weight, but manageable. Gray was walking in a crouch, peering at Sam's lower half. He reached out to touch Sam's leg, but Sam batted his hand away, then grabbed the man's shoulder. Easy there, Doc. I already had my physical. Barkley Jackson grinned. I think he was hoping to do a quick prostate check. You're not a young man anymore, Reed. Sam glared at Jackson. You and me are going to have at it before long. Don't mind him, Frank said, jerking a thumb at Jackson. Him and me don't have to worry about getting ours checked. I hear it's really only a problem if you have balls. Jackson threw his head back and laughed. I'll show you mine if you'll show me yours, Franks. She snorted. You're not my type. Too girly. Walter Gray cleared his throat. Very good, everyone. He turned to Sam again. I have the new power packs if you're interested. Might lighten your load a bit. What you got? You are using the standard Mark V, right? Gray asked. Sam nodded. Thought so. Gives 5,000 watts of power for 96 hours, or 24 in a maximum activity burst. But they're heavy cells. With the Mark VI, we're using degraded plutonium sheeting. It's smaller, lighter, and will last a month, even at high activity. Sam nodded, impressed. Any radiation or heat signature? Gray smiled. No more than normal background trace. Sam grunted. Sign me up. The Hawks went from room to room, stocking up on the gear they needed, knives, explosives, and handguns. They selected some wireless assault projectiles, or WASPs, mini over-the-horizon missiles with enough smarts built into the tiny launcher that you could pick a target several miles away and then let it go and do its job. The blast radius and impact was equivalent to a fragmentation grenade, a small delivery package with a big punch. In the close quarters room, Gray looked over his glasses at Alex. Cartridges for your HKs. I'm assuming 9 millimeter parabellums? Alex shrugged. Sure, they get the job done. Sure do, for standard kit. 
But I want you to see something else. Gray pushed a stud, and a door slid back into the wall to reveal a long, narrow corridor with the target dummy at one end. On one wall hung a row of guns and other weapons, many of which Alex had never seen before. The Hawks and Jackson crowded around, and Gray looked delighted with the sudden interest and attention. He took a pistol from the wall, selected some ammunition from a red box, and loaded a single bullet, also red-coated, into the chamber. He handed the pistol to Alex, then nodded to the dummy. In one smooth motion, Alex spun and fired, hitting the dummy in the center of its chest. Almost immediately, a red spot appeared between the pectorals and bloomed outwards. Even from a hundred feet away, Alex could feel the heat, and as he watched, the dummy melted from the inside out. Jets of halon gas whooshed down on the mess, suppressing but not fully dousing the flames. Bam! Franks clapped. I like it. Alex sniffed the barrel, then handed the gun back to Gray. Thermite? Gray nodded. Aluminum oxide thermite packed into a standard shell, safe and stable until the projectile's impact friction delivers enough heat to start the exothermic reaction. Burns at 4,000 degrees, wet or dry. He grinned. Makes for some great fun in the dark, and sure to get your adversary's attention. Alex couldn't help smiling at the scientist's boyish enthusiasm for the deadly ammunition. Pack a box, for each of us. Yeah! Casey Franks high-fived Ben Rogers. Next stop was the combat body armor room. It's like Christmas, isn't it? Gray chortled, rubbing his hands together. Alex grinned. Okay, Santa. The biological body armor. I want it for the entire team, and we need it processed now. Gray nodded. We can do that. I can get the design program started immediately, as soon as we've got the morphology measurements. He motioned the team into the room. Lady and gentlemen. Alex hung back and stopped Gray following them in. The laser prototype. Gray nodded. Yes, yes, the K-belt. Klystron beam emitted light technology. We've perfected the miniaturization and added a pistol to the range. You have experience with them? Alex nodded, remembering the rifle he'd used on the Dark Rising mission in Iran. No stock, held like a sawn-off pump action with a square casing over the trigger. There were two settings for the laser, high and low energy pulse. High energy cut a pencil-sized hole through anything. Low energy gave about the same result as a hundred pounds of TNT, delivered in a single, focused, explosive punch. Did you overcome the short battery life? he asked. Gray nodded and took a step closer to Alex, his voice dropping. It's still highly classified. Only one man below the rank of general knows about it, Colonel Jack Hammerson, and now you. He looked up into Alex's face, studying his features. His eyebrows came together. You sure we've never met? Yes. Alex put his hand on Gray's shoulder. Now show me the K-belt pistol. Hammerson stood with his two teams on the runway. Alex, Sam, and their unit would leave first, with Reese Thompson, Matt Kearns, and Rebecca Watchorn boarding the second aircraft to Crete. The Hawks' suits, with the inbuilt synthetic biological armor plating, made them look like dark, segmented insects. Their rides, Lockheed SR-71 Blackbirds, were supposed to have been retired around 1996. However, the long-range reconnaissance aircraft were far too valuable to mothball and were still in use for special payloads, spec op teams that needed to be somewhere fast. Each looked like a missile with its short wings and two huge muscular thrusters in close to the night-dark body painted with radar-reflecting paint. With a J-58 P-4 engine, 
that could produce a static thrust of 32,000 pounds, the Blackbirds could cruise at Mach 3.2, fast and near invisible. And if they were detected, at high altitude, they could outrun a surface-to-air missile. Both planes had no insignia, and their pilots were also off the books. Once they crossed out of U.S. airspace, they stopped existing. Hammerson knew too well the burden this anonymity placed on the Hawks and on him. Too many young men and women lay in shallow, unmarked graves around the world, Alex Hunter's father being one of them. Hammerson gazed at Alex. The young man's gray-blue eyes were clear. No hint of anything other than eagerness, intelligence, and explosive energy. He hoped the thing lurking somewhere within his mind remained chained behind whatever barrier Alex had created for it. If not, Hammerson didn't want to think about the other one taking control of his protege in the field. He looked around the group. No tension, just eagerness to get away. Time for the talk, he thought. The impossible jobs are ours, he said, and looked hard at his two senior soldiers. Win or lose, no one knows but us. This is our lot. We are the Hawks, the first line, the strongest line, and the last line. When we go in, others stand aside or they die. Clear? Hwa! the Hawks said in unison, their eyes blazing. Hammerson placed his hands on his hips. Commander Kamel Baikal of the Turkish SF Commandos went down to this thing. One hundred Special Forces soldiers, all lost. They threw everything at their target, but Magira went through them like they weren't there. General Chilton has authorized a small Hawk unit intervention. He stepped in closer to the two big men. So, goddamn intervene. I want to know what this thing really is. We know line of sight is high risk, and even viewing it remotely can be hazardous. We're working on some tech to get around those limitations, but for now use caution. As a minimum, we want to know if it has a physical form. If it does, we can destroy it. And watch your backs. Borshov is on the ground there somewhere. He stood back and saluted. Hawks, it's our turn now. Make it count. Good luck and Godspeed. Alex saluted, then turned to his team. Load em up, people. The Hawks and the SAS man piled into the first Blackbird. Alex was last, and he turned and nodded to Hammerson before following his team onto the plane. Hammerson's face was grim. Magira, Borshov, and the Arcadian, all in the same place at the same time, he thought. Hell on earth. Turgutlu, 24 miles west of Izmir, NATO base. Uli Borshov and his six Spetsnaz left the truck several miles outside the town. It was still dark, with dawn several hours away. The communication intercepts had informed him of the fate of the Turkish Special Forces team, and he had to guess the Americans were here by now or on their way. Whoever or whatever was wielding the weapon that had been decimating the Turkish population must be taken, alive or dead. The value of such power to Russia was incalculable. Borshov knew he had a head start on the Americans, and he would use it to prepare a little surprise party. Obtaining the weapon was his priority order, but to him it was secondary to his personal objective. If he got to tear Alex Hunter's head from his body, then he would be happy. He had fought hawks before and obliterated them. And he had killed Alex Hunter, or so he'd thought. This time he would make sure. This time he would take a trophy. Cut the head clean from his body, or slice his beating heart from his chest. 
No coming back from the dead this time, he thought grimly. From his position overlooking the city, he saw that at its center the buildings were fairly modern. But on the outskirts the dwellings were more modest, single and double-story homes, some looking well over a hundred years old, with smoke curling from their chimneys. It was as if the further away from the center of Turgutlu you went, the farther back in time you traveled. Borshov split his team into three units, with himself as a fourth. They would find dwellings to hide out in and wait, for either the mysterious weapon to arrive or the hawks. He circled his finger in the air, and the groups split and jogged toward the houses. If there were occupants, they would be subdued or killed. Chapter 22 The Lockheed Blackbird dropped to just a few thousand feet above the ground, and its bay doors whined open. The hypersonic craft was virtually soundless at high altitude, but lower down its engine sounded like the scream of an oncoming train. It dropped again and slowed even further, and three large drum-like objects were ejected, falling several hundred feet before their large chutes opened. Dawn was still a couple hours off, and the dark night chutes and matte-black canisters were invisible as they fell to the ground. The plane roared away, climbing rapidly. In a few moments it was nothing but a dark speck on a dark horizon. The canisters burst apart on impact with the ground, and the hawks walked free, like they'd just stepped out of an elevator. Alex turned in a slow circle, scanning the dark countryside. Satisfied, he turned back to his team. Weapons check. Guns, grenades, knives, lasers were slid out, pulled back, ratcheted, and sighted one after the other in smooth, almost mechanical fashion. It was all over in sixty seconds, and the four men and single woman came to attention. All were clothed in the active camouflaged biological armor, and their outlines dappled between full black and silver stripes as shafts of moonlight ran across them. Sam and Corporal Barkley Jackson were at the center, half a head taller than anyone else. Lieutenants Casey Franks, Ben Rogers, and Steve Dankirk looked like three tethered wolves, waiting to be let off the leash. Alex pointed in the direction of the small town. We take up a defensive position on the urban perimeter, plant some pipes and try and get an idea of what we're dealing with before we get in its face. If it has one, Sam responded. Alex nodded. We know it has a physical form. Commander Baikal said that any soldier who got close to it got torn to pieces. We should be safe from a distance, but we don't know what that distance is yet. He looked along their faces. Basically, we don't have workable intel, so we get that first. Questions? We didn't come here just to take pictures, Jackson said. Will we engage? When I say so, and that's sir. Jackson raised his voice. Listen, sir, we've got a base full of men and women just down the road. If we get a shot, we should take it. Alex looked Jackson full in the face. Are we going to have an authority problem, Jackson? Because I got a real fast solution for that. Words seemed to form in Barkley Jackson's mouth, but as he met Alex's eyes, his lips clamped shut and he looked away. He shook his head and mumbled. Alex stepped forward. What was that, soldier? No, sir. Alex glared at him a moment longer, before turning to gaze along the dark strip of highway leading into the city. He closed his eyes, breathing in and out slowly, and allowing his consciousness to reach out. He could feel... something. He grunted and turned away, then paused. He turned back to the city, his eyes narrowing. Something up, boss? Sam asked. 
Alex continued to stare in the direction of the first row of buildings for several more seconds. Maybe. We stay alert, we stay alive. I get the feeling we might have a reception committee waiting for us. Borshov? Sam put a scope to his eye. Alex shrugged. Someone down there is watching us. Alex kept Sam at his shoulder as they jogged toward the line of buildings. He could hear the faint whine of the mech suit's hydraulics. The big hawk turned to run backward for a few moments, holding out a small silver device before spinning back. Got something coming in fast behind us, larger signature than a person, but Rita can't decide if it's a single biological mass or a million of them. Gotta be our primary target. Alex nodded. I know, I can feel it. It's like a cold breeze on my neck. We'll take cover and read the data from the pipes we laid down. Alex turned to address his team, then felt his senses jolt. Hit the dirt, he roared as he dived to the ground, dragging Sam with him. Alex had sensed the bullets before they arrived. Sniper or high-velocity rifles used rounds that were shaped for speed and traveled at over 3,000 feet per second. The farther they traveled, the more friction slowed them down. But by the time they reached the Hawk team, they were still moving at a subsonic velocity. Alex had tried to warn his team, but they could never hope to move as fast as he did. The first bullet took Franks in the chest, blowing her backward to lie sprawled in the dirt. More bullets thwacked into the ground and exploded off rocks. Sam rolled and lifted his rifle, sighting at the first row of buildings. He quickly reached into a pouch for a longer scope, which he slotted onto the weapon rail. He recited and said softly, Guess that answers the reception committee question. Alex rolled onto his back. Hawks, sound off! One after the other, his team shouted their call numbers. Franks's groaning voice was last. Franks, you okay? Yeah. No holes, boss. But reckon I got one doozy of a hickey on my left tit. Alex grinned. The biological armor plating had done its job. He rolled back into position. You got him, Sam? Sam continued to scan along the dark houses. Not until they fire again. I can take a guess, but I don't want to total a house full of sieves if I'm wrong. Alex looked over his shoulder. Well, we can't let them keep us pinned down out here. We got a storm coming in behind us. Armor's holding up, but a single headshot and we're dead. He concentrated on the dark shapes of the buildings in the distance. Got a window open, first house to the left of the small lane. Sam looked through the scope. I see it, but it's black as a coal miner's ass in there. Put a round in and see what happens. Sam fired. The bullet hit the window frame, blowing wood chips into the air. The response was immediate, a volley of high-velocity bullets smacking into the earth around them. Alex pulled his K-belt and held it in a two-hand grip. He flicked it to narrow beam and fired a two-second burst. The stream of super-compressed plasma-charged particles struck the wood and passed through, and probably continued through a number of internal walls. Anything biological wouldn't stand a chance. That'll give him something to think about, he said. Sam lifted slightly and scanned the rows of houses until another few rounds smacked into the rock near his face. He snapped his head back down. Jesus, they're good. Not that good, they missed. Alex grinned. But got to be Borshov's Spetsnaz. He popped his head up for just a second. They must be using bafflers. There's no muzzle flash, and I can't pinpoint the source by sound alone. I think we'll... He felt a strange tingling at the back of his neck and quickly rolled. Oh, Christ! Sam hunkered down. I hate it when you do that. Alex could see it now. 
In the distance, what looked to be mist coming fast down the highway, not rolling in along the entire plain, but concentrated along the roadway. It slowed about five miles out. He could pick out a dark mass at its amorphous center, a nucleus at the core of a dreadful atom. He closed his eyes and concentrated. There was something else, a sound, weeping. He rolled back toward Sam. We're about to be the meat in a sandwich. Alex looked up at the sky. A small blush of light on the horizon signaled sunrise within the hour. He peeked again over the rocks they were hunkered behind. There was still no sign of where the snipers were hiding. He knew he needed to buy some time. We can't stay pinned down while this thing washes over the top of us. I'm going down the highway to try and slow it down. I can't look at it, so you need to guide me in. Use the scanners. Alex peeked over the rocks again, then touched a button over his ear, sending his instructions to all team members. Primary target is coming down fast on R6. I'm going to buy us some time. Stay low while I draw fire, but keep moving forward. Do not, I repeat, do not turn around to look at me. If things get too hot, zero sniper positions are to remain viable. No exceptions. Alex looked at Sam, who nodded. He knew what Alex was asking. They'd need to obliterate most of the houses closest to them, confirmed enemy targets or not. Innocent people were about to die. Ready? Alex said. Sam raised an eyebrow. Are you? Alex smiled grimly and exploded up from the ground. He'd sprinted half a mile back down the road before the snipers even got a bead on him. He dived and came up hard behind a large rock. Bullets flew past, but he was safe. He glanced briefly at the mist ahead, now moving again, then instantly looked away. Don't look at it, don't look at it, he told himself. It was just a few miles away now and closing fast. He heard the sound, the weeping, clearly now. It sounded almost human. What the hell are you? he whispered. He sensed it slowing even more and knew it was aware of him. He looked over the line of rocks at the hawks. All except for Sam were belly-crawling below the sniper fire toward the line of buildings. The air was slight gray now as dawn rapidly approached. Soon the sun would lift over the horizon and be at their backs, giving them an edge and bad news for the snipers. He drew the K-belt and took a deep breath. Remember the force, Luke. He grinned and closed his eyes, concentrating on pushing out his senses to determine where the thing was. He lifted the pistol and fired. The thin beam of pulses streamed across the desert roadway, traveling the single mile to its target at the speed of light. Even over the short distance, the pencil-thin pulse opened to more than an inch and entered the center of the swirling mass. Nothing happened. He could sense it still coming at him. Shit! He put a finger to his comm unit. Sam, confirm hit on target. Dead center, boss, and no pass-through. Fully absorbed with no discernible effect. Alex moved the pistol calibration up to pulse. Okay. Let's see it swallow about a hundred pounds of TNT. He lifted the gun, allowed his arm to move a fraction to find the target, and fired twice. The twin pulses, like balls of lightning and as large as softballs, moved at a blinding speed. Once again they entered the mass, and this time there was a reaction. The mist boiled, and heat and a crackling of energy bounced back at Alex. He lifted an arm to cover his face and felt the body armor scorch. His comm unit pinged in his ear. Direct hits by two, but it's still coming. Sam's voice had an edge to it. 
Boss, you'd better get back here, or you're about to meet an ancient god face to face, and it ain't the friendly type. Alex dropped his arm as the heat died away. I heard that. Coming back, out. The creature was nearly on him now, a mere few hundred yards down the highway, but approaching slowly, almost with caution. What did Baikal miss? Think. Burning, shooting, stabbing, lasers. It seemed the thing was immune to physical trauma. It couldn't be made of the same physical matter as they were. Alex grimaced as the weeping became louder in his ears. Think, damn it. He remembered Matt Kearns suggesting they try talking to it or singing to it like the priest had. His mind sorted through the information Matt had given them about the Gorgon legend, the Codex, the few words written on the cavern wall in a long-dead language. Boss, get the hell out, now! Sam's voice was barely audible above the creature's wail of pain and suffering. Alex grunted as his eyes began to open. It was as if they weren't under his control anymore. He strained to stare at the ground, using every ounce of strength and willpower not to look up. The rocks before him were starting to cast a shadow as the sun rose. The mist enveloped him, hiding him from the snipers. But now he was facing another danger. Magira was on him. He sucked in a breath and slowly got to his feet. It hurt to look down now. Every ounce of his being was being pulled from him. He felt the creature tugging at his face, trying to drag his vision upward. In the center of his brain, something just as ferocious fought tooth and nail against the force in front of him. He held his hand up, and immediately felt a sensation of cold creep up his arm. Perspiration ran freely down his face as he pushed back, his own mind now pulling at Magira. Sensations washed over him, starting small like a tiny flicker of blue light, then exploding into images of darkness, water, a landscape dripping with mosses and lichens. In the blue twilight he saw cities with silver spires that touched the sky, beings with heads writhing with monstrous ropey polyps escorted thousands upon thousands of smaller creatures, moving them like cattle along a silver highway. Above them in the sky, a dim orb that could have been a sun or moon was draped with a blue veil that gave the scene a subaqueous feel. Alex's jaws clenched from the pain he was picking up from the creature. There was an overwhelming feeling of illness, sadness, and something else like a longing for home. But there was also madness there, an insane rage, and it was building. Alex grunted as he struggled with it, as he probed deeper. The thing seemed to become aware of what he was doing and immediately ejected him from its consciousness. The cold in his arm turned warm, rapidly getting hotter, building to an unbearable intensity that scalded his skin. Alex felt the blisters forming beneath his armor-plated glove. Stop! he roared. Amazingly, the heat snapped off and was replaced by the sensation of confusion. Alex was suddenly enveloped in pain. He knew he was losing. He couldn't look down any more. He couldn't resist. It had won. He brought his face up. As the thing came into focus, the golden glare of the rising sun blasted down the highway. The boiling mist dissipated, and the being itself, Magira, seemed to collapse into dust or particles, flowing like water into the soil at his feet. What the? Alex watched it bleed away, and with it went the sobbing sound. A lingering sensation of anger and confusion remained, like a spirit hovering over the dark road, but then it too dissipated in the sunshine. Boss, what just happened? Sam asked. Alex looked around. There was no physical trace of Magira, but he could still feel the thing close by. I... 
I don't know. It just fell apart. Did we get it? Sam's voice was hopeful. Alex shook his head. I don't think... The bullet took him between the shoulder blades on the vertebra, punching him forward to the roadway. It hurt, physically and mentally. Once the mist had gone, he was exposed, an amateur's mistake. Idiot, he told himself, and rolled until he was behind cover. The armor had stopped the penetration of the round, and the vertebra was already knitting back into place due to his accelerated metabolism. He looked up, and another bullet whizzed past, slicing his cheek. Fucking Borshov. He touched his comm unit. Sam, we're wasting time. We gotta clean out that hornet's nest once and for all. Release some wasps. With pleasure, boss. Alex watched as Sam reached into his kit and pulled free a small box. He set some switches inside before placing it on the ground beside him. Immediately, a flurry of small machines lifted out and swirled over his head for a few seconds before spreading out and heading toward the line of houses. Sam watched their progress on a small screen. Eyes in, boss. The miniaturized explosives split up as they approached the houses, then swirled in and out, through open windows, chimneys, and under doors, the vid feeds on their twin rotator wings letting Sam see inside the buildings. After a few minutes, he shook his head. I know they're in there, but they must have gone to ground or be wearing some sort of deflective armor. Time's up, Alex said. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. Put some pulses into the front row of houses. I want Franks, Jackson, and D.K. to go in on left flank. I'll take the right. You and Rogers lay down suppressing fire. Pulses on three, two, one, go! Balls of superheated plasma shot into the buildings and exploded inside. There were no fires as the heat of the charges literally seared everything in their path. Go, go, go! Alex shot out first, his speed making him an impossible target. He passed the other hawks as they were still getting to their feet. Franks, Jackson, and D.K. went in on the left flank, zigzagging fast while Sam and Rogers let fly a hail of bullets into the houses. Alex went through a door in an explosion of wood. He rolled and came up fast, searching for a target. The three hawks on the left flank did the same, charging through doors or diving through windows, glass shattering and splinters flying. Gunfire rang out. The fight had commenced. Chapter 23 Casey Franks dived in through a window and rolled to her feet. Though the sun was rising, inside the house it was still near total dark. Before she could orientate herself, the gunshot, shatteringly loud in the small space, blew her across the room to land behind a ratty old sofa. Franks lay flat, her hearing temporarily useless, the ringing in her ears a continuous scream. She pressed her cheek to the floor, feeling the footfalls as the agent approached. At the sofa, he leaped, confident, possibly expecting a fallen hawk with a hole the size of his fist through their chest. Instead, he found empty floor. He spun, gun up, but still took the armor-plated fist directly on his jaw. Franks got in close and delivered another flat-handed strike up under his chin. The Spetsnaz was big and fast, and clad all in black with Cyclops' night-vision goggles over his face. He adjusted quickly to the attack, never making a sound, using his long leg to sweep around and take Franks off her feet. She went down on her back, feeling the bones grate where she was already bruised from the bullet strike. The pain was agonizing, but like her foe, she didn't make a sound, and instead used the floor to bounce straight back to her feet. She came up fast, but the agent had vanished. 
So too had the screaming in her ears, just in time for her to hear the tiny sound of a knife coming from its sheath. She could guess what sort, a kizliar, preferred by Spetsnaz and ex-KGB for wet work. There would be no gleam from its blackened blade. Frank stayed low and threw herself sideways and under the swinging fist that held the blade backward, trailing it to bring its razor edge across anything the fist struck. She counterpunched twice into her opponent's iron-hard torso, then blocked the blade again. This time she felt it work at her armored forearm. She drew her own knife, the tanto-edged K-bar, shorter and stouter, and laser-sharpened enough to perform surgery. She grinned in the dark. In close-quarters combat, guns just got in the way. The blades came together, clanging as if they were dueling in a long-gone age. The Spetsnaz managed to nick her body twice, but the armored suit easily deflected the steel each time. She fainted with her left arm, then swung down with the small blade in her right, looking for the side of his neck. The bunched trapezium muscle would be tough, but it was a gateway to nerve bundles that, if severed, would render his entire side useless. Her knife never found its mark. Instead, the Spetsnaz caught her wrist and headbutted her, the Cyclops' goggles pounding into the bridge of her nose. Franks was trained to deal with pain, but nothing could stop the automatic physical reflex as her vision swam for a split second. She was propelled backward, her head hitting the ground, and found herself lying against an ancient wooden table and chairs. Her blade was gone and he was on her now, coming at her with the wickedly sharp blade raised. There was no time to draw another weapon, and his skills seemed a match for hers. There was one last option, incidental proximity weaponing. Use whatever the hell you can find. She grabbed a chair by one leg and rolled, bringing it around fast and hard into the Spetsnaz ribs. He angled one arm down and partially blocked the impact. But by then Franks was up on her feet and bringing the chair around in an arc to smash down on the top of his skull. This time it was his turn to go down. On his knees, he drew his arm back, the blade held lightly between his thumb and fingers as he prepared to loose the dark spike at her. But time was on her side now, and a hundred options for disarming, disabling, or dispensing death went through her trained mind. She chose death. She pulled her gun, its magazine loaded with red-coated thermobaric bullets, and fired at near point-blank range into his chest. The reaction was immediate. The Spetsnaz shuddered, his eyes wide, his mouth open. Steam poured from his throat as the exothermic reaction raised the temperature of his body to 4,000 degrees. His torso glowed redly, giving off thick, greasy smoke before falling open. He dropped in a heap, the remaining mass hissing and bubbling. Damn fucking right, Frank said. She wiped the blood and perspiration from her face and holstered her gun. She touched the button at her ear. Clear, one bad guy down, moving to next building. The houses were small and close together and D.K. could hear the sounds of smashing furniture, breaking glass, or the thump of fists and boots against human flesh. He eased open the door and snaked into the room. It was dark, just outlines showing, and his senses immediately moved into hyper-alert mode. He crawled to a corner, came to his feet, and then froze, listening and allowing his peripheral vision to search out trigger shapes, in the outer area of the eye, the retina had more cone cells that were better at seeing in the dark, and all hawks were trained to use their peripheral vision to scan for body or weapon-shaped targets, or even a hint of movement. He stayed that way for several minutes, barely breathing. He'd already seen the two bodies on the floor, an old man and woman. By the angle of their heads, their necks were broken. 
he brought in his other senses. There was no sound, but there was something, a smell, like bad breath and cheap vodka. D.K. held his rifle loose but ready in his hands. He lifted it and looked along the scope, using the light enhancer to search the darker areas of the room that his peripheral vision couldn't penetrate. He slowly rotated, seeing nothing but phosphorescent green shapes. He switched the scope to thermal and rotated again. The green shapes turned to various shades of blue and green. The bodies were pink, some residual warmth still evident in their core. Gotta get moving, he thought, and turned another few degrees. A flaring red giant stepped from behind the door. He'd been on DK the whole time. The giant grabbed the barrel of his gun and wrenched it from his hands. DK was six foot and weighed 220 pounds, but his attacker outweighed him by at least another 80 pounds. Ogre, he thought, as the man lifted him. Muscle memory overrode shock, and the hawk struck out with his fists, the sharp edges of his elbows and his feet. He connected, but even with the armor plating on his gloves, the figure absorbed the blows as if they were nothing. Then he countered, the pile driver blows coming fast and accurately. D.K. managed to use the force of the punches to throw himself backward. He landed on the floor, his face wet with blood, rolled and came up smoothly, already gripping a K-bar blade. The big man followed, and a black spike appeared in his own massive fist. The big man slashed back and forth, fainting and lunging. D.K. parried some, but as he jumped back, he felt a trickle of warm blood run from under his arm. Unbelievably, the giant had managed to get his spike in between the suit's biological plating. The rule book said to get in close when fighting a bigger adversary and neutralize his longer reach, then use his own body weight against him. However, D.K. didn't trust this maxim with the grizzly bear in front of him. The man was huge, but in no way lumbering or slow, and he seemed as expertly trained as the hawk. Getting in close would probably only allow the beast to get a grip on him. D.K. needed space, he needed to even the odds, and he needed a single second to draw a gun. Hand to hand against this opponent would be a one-way street to death. The bearded giant came at him again, fainting to the left, and then coming back at him not with the blade, but with the back of his fist. D.K. saw stars as the blow connected with his cheekbone. He went down, and before he could spring back to his feet, the slim black blade pounded down into the meat of his palm, pinning his hand to the wooden floor. D.K. grunted from the pain. Before he could ward him off, the bearded giant was kneeling on his chest, swinging sledgehammer-like blows across his face, a left, then a right, sweeping back and forth, over and over, until blood and broken teeth filled his mouth. His head swam, and reality dropped away. The brutality seemed to be happening to someone else, and he was in a pit, watching it, then falling into the bottomless dark. Borshov saw that the hawk was losing consciousness, but he continued to rain blows down on the unprotected face. It was hard to stop. The sensation of hot brutality was one of his few joys. He just wished it was Alex Hunter's face he was pounding. The hawk's muscles relaxed, and he lay still, a wet, ragged breathing coming from his smashed nose and bloody mouth. Borshov grabbed a tablecloth and used it to roughly wipe the young man's face and then his own hands. He drew a small box from his belt and pulled from it a long black needle, close to eight inches long and attached to the box by wires. He carefully inserted the spike into the hawk's nostril, wiggled it once or twice, and pushed again. There was a small feeling of resistance as it penetrated the upper nasal cavity, then traveled smoothly up into the brain. 
Clear cranial fluid momentarily flushed onto the hawk's upper lip. Borshov ignored it as he continued to probe slowly now. He needed to plant the spike in a specific area of the brain, between the hippocampus and the amygdala, associated with memory and emotion. Borshov watched the small box he had set on the ground. The tiny light remained red. Eighty years ago, scientists had found that some brain functions could be reprogrammed through physical manipulation. The process was called a lobotomy. In Russia, they had taken it a step further, using the technique to make interrogation so much easier. The small light flashed green, and Borshov let go of the probe. The hawk's eyes fluttered as if he was in REM sleep. His brain's electrical impulses began to involuntarily fire. Borshov leaned forward, his lips close to the man's ear. What do they call you? D.K., Lieutenant Steve Dankirk, he responded dreamily. Borshov smiled. D.K., you are safe now. It is me, Alex Hunter. What is your operational status? Boss? D.K. frowned. Yes, I am Arcadian. Did we get him? Yes, all of them. Borshov smirked. We need to move. What are our next steps? You know, boss. Borshov exhaled impatiently, ignoring the temptation to pound the man's face some more. I know, but you are hurt, and I need to check if you are still optimal. Can't feel my legs. Can't feel anything. You are good. Safe now. Now answer the question. That's an order, soldier. We need to protect the NATO base at Izmir. And then hope that egghead Kearns finds something in Crete we can use to put Magira to sleep. D.K. coughed blood onto his chin. Magira? Borshov frowned. They go to Crete? Yeah, to some cave. He and the English won't... The window behind Borshov exploded inward as a figure came through it like a missile, then readjusted its trajectory to hurtle toward the big Russian. Even though Borshov outweighed his new assailant by at least fifty pounds, he was thrown backward like he was a child. He was quickly on his feet, however, standing like a colossus in the center of the room. He drew another of his thin black blades, but didn't get a chance to lift it. He suddenly found himself in the air, lifted above the newcomer's head, then slammed down to the ground, splintering a chair as he landed. He cursed and rolled away, coming up with a heavy chair leg in his hands. In the dark, he could just make out that the newcomer was kneeling over the fallen hawk. Borshov knew him now. So, Arcadian, you were dead. I killed you. Then you came back and you were stronger, faster. His eyes narrowed. What did they do to you to make you so strong, huh? To make you this Arcadian man? He backed up, holding his hands up momentarily, before dropping one to feel behind his back. One day we will peel you open and find out. Alex Hunter turned toward him his eyes shining silver, and slowly got to his feet, his fists bald. You're the dead man here. Perhaps, but not today. Borshov tossed the incendiary grenade at Hunter's feet, knowing he couldn't get to him and save his soldier at the same time. The Russian spun and dived through the smashed window, taking most of the frame with him. He rolled and was immediately up and running. The explosion blew the roof off the small building. Superheated gas and flames gushed out of the door, every window and every vent and crack in the walls. Chapter 24 
Sam sprinted into the burning house, scrabbling through rubble and lifting burning beams to search for his comrades. He found D.K. first. The man was a shredded mess, eyes open, the spike still embedded in his nasal cavity. Ah, oh, fuck no! Sam called over his shoulder. Jackson, get him out! The SAS soldier appeared behind Sam and kneeled next to the body. Goodbye, brother, he said, then shut DK's eyes, lifted his ragged remains, and carried him out. Sam continued his search. He lifted the burning couch to find another body, smoke curling up from it. Alex was intact. The armored suit had held him together, mostly. But the unprotected areas had paid the biggest price. His face was a mess, burned and ripped where debris or shrapnel had torn the flesh. On his forehead, a dime-sized piece of bone showed through, and a finger-thick splinter of wood was embedded in his cheek. Sam could also see that one arm was hanging wrong, and there were probably more bones fractured. Shit! Sam splashed water on Alex's smoldering skin, then gripped the large splinter in his cheek and drew it out. He pressed his hand to the wound. As he'd expected, it coagulated quickly. Alex groaned as Sam helped him up. He opened his eyes. Grenade? Yep, incendiary, and I'm betting you just ate the lot of it. Sam held the canteen to Alex's lips. He pushed it away. D.K.? Gone. Sam kept his hand on Alex's back, feeling the strange heat the man generated. He knew that Alex's metabolism burned hotter than normal, more so when fury took him. Then he became like a furnace. Alex nodded and held his head, groaning again. Borshov got away? For now. Sam took his hand away. We took down four Spetsnaz, but two of them and Borshov are gone. You need medical... No, just wrap me up and let's get the hell out of here. This party's going to attract attention, and we need to be ghosts. He grabbed Sam's arm and hauled himself slowly to his feet. Besides, I doubt it was me that frightened Magira away. We don't want to be here when night falls. Franks and Jackson appeared at Sam's shoulder. The big SAS man took a look at Alex's face and whistled. Nasty. There goes the modeling gig. Alex turned to Jackson, smoke or steam still lifting from his battered shoulders. As he stared at the SAS man, the missing patch of skin on his forehead seemed to sizzle for a second. Then the ragged flesh at its edges crept across the wound. Holy fuck, did you see that? Jackson's mouth hung open as he turned to Frank's. She just smiled, ignoring him. No, we didn't, Sam said. He plastered some hawk field patches over Alex's wounds, then wrapped his head and face in bandages, leaving just his eyes and mouth clear. The arm break was clean across the ulna and radius. Sam splinted it and wrapped it as well. But his head just started to... Jackson's eyes were wide. It was still fucking burning. Leave it, soldier, Sam said, and put his arm under Alex's shoulder. Alex gritted his teeth and sucked in a deep breath. Let's move. Jackson snorted and shook his head. You are a freak, and now you look like a fucking mummy. Alex turned his bloodshot gaze on the big man. And you look like a pack mule, so you get to carry D.K. until we find a place to bury him. More like a jackass, Frank said. Then she turned to Alex, her face grim. We're winning. Alex nodded. We always do. Now let's go. We need to call this in. Borshov engaged, we're one down, and Magira has disappeared. And I get the feeling, not for good. The hawks jogged into morning sunshine. The temperature was already close to 90 degrees and rising steadily. 
but was still bearable because of the near-total lack of humidity. However, Jackson, carrying DK's body, was struggling. About fifteen miles from Izmir, Alex called a halt. He pointed to a patch of ground. I want that man at least three feet down, and the area above raked so smooth not even Sherlock Holmes could find him. Oh, fuck! Alex rounded on Jackson and brought his face in close. I am not in a good mood, soldier. Jackson nodded quickly. I get it, boss. Alex turned away and looked down at his splinted arm, flexing his fingers. He unwrapped the bandage, made a fist, then grunted. Sam with me. The rest of you take some rest. He glared at Jackson. Not you. Start digging. Jackson's jaw clenched in anger, but he kept his lips clamped shut. Alex and Sam walked a few dozen paces away and sat on some exposed boulders. Sam swigged from his canteen. Borshov used a cranial probe on DK. Alex nodded. Don't know how much time he had, but we proceed on the assumption that Borshov knows what we're doing and where we're going next. He drank from his own canteen. That big bastard killed DK, and I let him get away. Sam blew air, dismissing the statement. He dropped a grenade on you. You won this round. You lived, he ran. You'll get him next time. Alex stared out into the desert. Next time. He sucked in a breath. Now to give the hammer the good news. He clipped an enhancer over the communication pill already in his ear. It immediately uplinked him to the satellite, signal jumping to confuse anyone trying to intercept the data sent and received. The colonel was waiting. Go, Arcadian. We encountered Magira five miles outside of Turgutlu. Also Borshov. We lost DK, Alex said slowly. We took down four, but Borshov and two others got away. He lost four, you lost one. That tell you anything? Hammerson's voice had an edge. This is the business we're in. Now tell me about Magira. It was weird, Alex said. I was right in front of it. Then the sun came up and it just vanished. You confronted it and it vanished? No. I get the feeling I had nothing to do with it. I think the sun struck it and it disassembled, turned to powder or something. But it was still there, not dead, just, I don't know, waiting. Alex's brow furrowed as he remembered. Have any of the attacks been during daylight hours? He heard Hammerson moving at his desk and imagined him pulling data up onto his screen. He snorted softly. No. Then maybe this thing doesn't like light. We might be able to use that. Good. I'll get on to R&D and also see if Kearns or Ms. Watchorn know anything about intolerance to sunlight from the legends. Okay. Alex's face was itching under the bandages. There's something else. Borshov probed DK before he died. Give Thompson a heads up in case they get company. You got it. Hammerson paused for a second or two. You okay, son? Alex reached up to scratch his face before violently ripping the bandages away. He tossed the bloody shreds onto the sand. I'll be better after I tear Borshov's head off. Works for me, Hammerson said evenly. Listen, just one thing. Before you grind him into the dirt... Ask him about Captain Graham, and make him answer. Graham's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, and I want him back. Alex remembered how Graham, head of the military's medical division, had sent three automatons after him, wanting to reel Alex in so he could cut him up and see how the Arcadian treatment was a success with him, but a failure with others. Do I want him back? he wondered aloud. No one messes with our people, 
Hammerson responded. I'll deal with Graham. Alex shrugged. Okay. We're heading into Izmir. Let me know if Kearns finds anything we can use. Over. Over and out. Lasithi Plateau, Matt said, as he looked out of the plain window at the mountains rising up around them and forming a massive horseshoe shape around the valley of Selacano. They were thickly forested with pines. Home of the Caves of Zeus, where we hope the pieces of the puzzle come together. Rebecca grinned. I've got a good feeling about this place. There might be some clues in the relics taken from the caves during the first excavations. Some were found in areas that are inaccessible today, though. She looked across to Thompson. We might need to make them accessible. And that's where I come in, Thompson said evenly. Matt nodded, continuing to look down at the landscape. There was once an underground river in the caves, but it was sealed off. At the very lowest level, several hundred feet down, there are still pools, some quite deep in places, and that's where the relics were located. Cave diving and potential demolition work in a site of national and cultural significance. Thompson grinned. And I thought you guys were supposed to be the nice ones. He snorted softly and glanced out the window. We're rising again. More mountains coming up. Matt pointed to a plateau. Where we're going has been described as the Machu Picchu of the Minoan civilization. That plateau area was the last stronghold of the race, a final sanctuary. After the fall of Knossos, the Minoans' political and cultural center, a fragment of the Minoan race survived there for another four hundred years. Then they simply vanished, Rebecca added, and no one really knows why or how. This place is home to a myriad of myths and legends, the caves where Zeus was born, where Perseus fought with the Medusa, where Theseus battled the Minotaur. We need to consider how all these things interrelate and overlap. The Minotaur? The bull-headed beast? What's that got to do with Megira? Thompson asked. Maybe nothing, Matt said. But as a kid, did you ever play that game where you sit in a circle and someone writes a phrase down on a piece of paper? The first kid reads it and whispers the phrase into the next kid's ear, then the next kid whispers it into the following kid's ear, and so on and so on. At the end, you compare the final phrase with what was written, and guess what? It's different. Maybe only a word or two, but it's a perfect example of how things can alter over time. Now imagine a myth or legend being told and retold for hundreds or thousands of years. It can end up vastly different from the original telling, or several versions might develop, depending on the district or subculture. The tale of the Minotaur is like that. Something terrible might have lived in those caves once, but what exactly? You think it might have been the Magira? the SAS man asked. Matt shrugged. There are no signs that Knossos was ever a military site. For example, it didn't have fortifications or places to store weapons, but it was the local center of power of its time. In Greek mythology... King Minos lived in a palace at Knossos and had a labyrinth built to hold his son, the Minotaur. But other variations of the story say the labyrinth existed before the kingdom, that the palace was built over an existing system of caves with something already living in their dark depths. Another variation has the early Minoans finding something down there and then controlling it. Who knows, perhaps it was their secret weapon. Thompson shook his head. Still don't get how the bull Minotaur has anything to do with the Gorgons. The Greek myth says that Theseus, a prince from Athens, was forced to fight a terrible creature called the Minotaur, Rebecca said. But as Matt mentioned, there are other variations of the story, recovered from pottery shards and wall tiles that are markedly different. They don't refer to a bull-headed beast at all, 
A Knossos tablet, written partly in Mycenaean Greek, refers to the creature in the caves as the mistress of the labyrinth. People who were sent down into the caves became frozen with fear when they saw what lived there. Thompson exhaled and sat back. A lot of theories, bloody old theories. Matt grinned and opened his computer. Better to have a lot than none. He scrolled through some images and turned his screen to show them. And I'm still going to be including this one until it's proven wrong. What does this look like? Rebecca groaned when she saw the screen. Thompson frowned. Well, what does it remind you of? Matt asked with raised eyebrows. The ancient image showed two tall figures surrounded by smaller bipeds. One figure's head was a mass of coiling tendrils. The other's was encased in a familiar round shape, with a sort of open visor over the face. Thompson snorted. You have got to be kidding me. A freaking space helmet? Rebecca put her hands over her face. Oh, for God's sake. Matt nodded. Remember, the priest in the Codex referred to Celestis and then pointed skyward. He snapped his computer closed. Weird stuff, and I don't know how it helps yet. But in the absence of evidence, all information is useful. Thompson sighed. Sounds like you've got too much information, too many theories. Perish the thought, Matt said and grinned. We scientists expect historical anomalies, but given what we're seeing in Turkey, they suddenly mean a hell of a lot more. Thompson looked from Matt to Rebecca. There are masses of caves in Crete, right? How do we know we've got the right ones? Good question, Rebecca said. A lot of the caves were blasted open in the 1920s, but heavy rains caused silt to pour into them, and many of the networks were destroyed or closed. Remember the story of the Minotaur. It lived in a labyrinth. The geology here is primarily carbonate. You combine that with heavy rainfall, and you get significant tunnel systems. Maybe it all used to be a single massive network down there, but it's been blocked over time and become a series of individual caves. So they might all be the right cave. We just need to find the right way in. So what are we looking for? Thompson said. First off, I mean. First we need to go to Heraklion on the coast. It's the capital of the island, and where most of the artifacts from the caves ended up. It's also where we'll need to beg, borrow, or steal any supplies we might need. Hammerson can't help us any more. The ground, sea, and air borders are closed. Thompson nodded. Sounds like a plan. He jerked forward and put a hand to his ear, concentrating, then turned to Matt. Hammerson wants to talk to you. Matt fumbled in his pocket, extracted a small flesh-colored pellet and jammed it into his ear. Go, Jack. Professor Kearns, Matt. Events are moving quickly, but we have news that I thought you needed to hear. The older soldier paused, and Matt concentrated as he continued. Alex Hunter has engaged with Magira, or whatever the thing is out there. Just like during Baikal's interaction, it seems impervious to any physical assault but there was something new. Alex said that when the sun came up and touched the creature, it just seemed to melt away or fall apart. Could have been the light or warmth, he wasn't sure. But here's the thing. We checked. All the previous attacks occurred at night or underground. He exhaled. Does that mean anything to you? The sunlight... Matt tried to remember any reference to a gorgon being affected like this. Hmm, I don't think it was the warmth, he said at last. Me either, Hammerson said. Matt, Alex also said that even though the thing seemed to vanish, he could still sense it. Might mean it's there and you just don't know it, waiting for the dark. Okay. Matt sat back, frowning. 
Anything else? That's it, Hammerson said. But be advised that Alex and his team are heading to you now. Until he arrives, be on guard and stay in contact, you hear? Great, Jack, you got it. Matt disconnected and sat staring into the cabin. Well, Rebecca said, what is it? Interesting, Matt murmured, his mind working furiously as he tried to assemble all the facts. Thompson leaned forward. Give it up, buddy. Alex and the team are en route to meet us now, Matt said. They just encountered Magira outside of Turgutlu, but according to Alex, the sun came up, and it just seemed to melt away, or rather disassemble. But... He frowned. He thought it was still there somehow. He could sense its presence. Well, that sounds like crap. What the hell does it mean? Thompson said. Matt shook his head. If Alex said he still sensed it, then it was definitely there. Rebecca frowned. Melted away, or sort of disassembled, like it deliberately vanished? Matt shrugged. Don't know, but I can't see the heat of the sun causing it. The Turkish used thermobarics on Magira, 1,000 degrees, and it walked right through them. He continued to stare at the cabin wall. Maybe the light, the sun's rays, or the energy? He sighed. Or something we don't know about yet. The sunlight, Rebecca said, musing. You know, that kind of makes sense. When Perseus killed Medusa, he had to enter her subterranean lair. Perhaps it needs the dark to survive. No, not survive. I don't think the sun killed it. But maybe the sun's rays change it. He looked at her. And you're right, the Gorgons lived underground. Maybe we can use it. Chapter 25 NATO Base, Izmir, Turkey Alex and his team were waved through the checkpoint and escorted directly to the command center. Mid-level brass from several nations sat around a long table as Alex and Sam pushed through the doors. The rest of the hawks sprawled in chairs in the corridor, more than happy to let Alex and Sam do the political work. Alex looked along the table, four men sitting and one large, bearded, older man, his face grim, standing with his hands clasped behind his back. He was first to speak. Alex Hunter. It wasn't a question. Alex recognized the rank and came to attention. General? General Aykut Bozlak Erdamir. At ease, Captain. Alex stood at ease, with his big second-in-command behind him. The general pointed to some chairs, and the two hawks sat. I understand you had the same success as we did at stopping Magira, Erdemir said, and now it has disappeared. Alex nodded. The sun came up and it vanished, but it's not gone. I could still sense it. Sense it? One of the soldiers in a blue uniform, his accent clipped British, frowned with disbelief. Can you sense it now? Alex looked at the man, his own gaze flat and indifferent. The British officer reminded him of his own Captain Robert Graham, both from the physical appearance and also the way he carried the same sense of self-importance. No. Alex turned away. He didn't feel the need to explain. The general placed a hand on the British man's shoulder. Major Mallory Butler, British Armed Forces. He indicated the men along the table. Colonel Frank Harper, U.S. Armed Forces, Major Thierry Gallouin, French Armed Forces, and Colonel Abdullah Yilmaz, Turkish Defense Forces. Erdemir folded his arms and glared down at the British Major. 
and we all need to hear anything new that may assist us against this strange and formidable force that is fast approaching. Or already here, Alex said. It was at the edge of the town when the sun's rays struck it. I'm not sure it was destroyed or even hurt. Perhaps it changes its state during the day. Maybe it becomes more benign or goes into some sort of suspended animation. He shrugged. I'm guessing. We know so little, because if you get close to it, you'd die. Erdemir clasped his hands behind his back and paced around the table. Then we have four hours before the sun goes down, and then it may return less benign. Mallory Butler tapped on the table. It's still basically following the old caravan trail along the Ankara Highway. Outside of Ulakak, there's three miles of empty space. We can set up a wall of fire that a roach couldn't get through. Erdemir pursed his lips, making his mustache jut. Major, this thing went through hundreds of rounds of armor-piercing ammunition, fragmentation grenades, thermobaric RPGs and also physically ripped our men in half. I lost nearly all my best SFCs and their commander, a good man and one of my best. His voice trembled with suppressed rage. Short of a nuke, what do you suggest? Butler looked down at his hands. There are around one thousand personnel at this base, but there are over four million people in Izmir. And you estimate we have four hours. We can't evacuate them all by sundown. And we can't sit on our thumbs and hope it passes us by. Maybe we don't have a choice. Erdemir sat down heavily. Frank Harper leaned forward. Hunter, is there anything you can remember that might give us an edge? Anything at all? Maybe the general is right, Alex said. Maybe we don't have a choice. It's going to go through whatever we put in front of it, so don't put anything in front of it. My guess is it's heading somewhere. His mind whirled as he remembered the feeling of torment within the creature. But there was something else, like it had a purpose or a plan. Harper rubbed his chin. Go on. We don't need to evacuate the entire city, Alex said slowly. Just leave a corridor. The general stood again and leaned forward onto the table, resting on his knuckles on the dark wood. The weeping. You heard it? Alex nodded. It seems to be more focused. Originally it was seeking out populations to feed on, but now it seems to be in a hurry. It's only engaging when it's engaged. Well, if it's not coming here, where is it going? Butler asked. Sam spoke for the first time. It's going to Crete. Good. The British Major sat back and exhaled. Very good. Harper got to his feet. Like hell it is. That's where the goddamn Seventh Fleet is right now. Gentlemen, I've got some calls to make. He saluted and pushed out of the room. Alex rubbed his chin and turned to Sam. Makes sense. It's trying to get home. Sam nodded. We better get word to the Colonel and Professor Kearns. And we need to get over there fast. Alex got to his feet. Erdemir walked over and placed a large hand on Alex's shoulder. We'll impose a curfew from sundown and evacuate a route to the waterfront. Good news is, once it leaves Turkey, it's not our problem anymore. Bad news is, the problem hasn't gone away. It now belongs to the world. Borshov hunched over a small table in a house in the hills overlooking Izmir. The sea in the distance was an electric blue, and the city's ancient minarets and Greek Orthodox churches rose above a plain of terracotta roofs and modern office blocks. 
The NATO base was tucked behind some hills to the south, and the grey steel of a ship's bow could just be seen easing around the headland. Borshov spoke into a cell phone that was dwarfed by his large hand. We saw what this thing did to the Americans. It is unstoppable. He frowned as he listened, then shook his head. I don't know what it is, but I do know that the Americans have sent some scientists to Crete. They believe there is a way to either control or communicate with it. Maybe they find out in Crete, duh? He looked out over the miles of houses and grunted. No, there is no more we can do here. We will go to Crete and stay ahead of the hawks. He listened for another second or two, and his broad face broke into a grin. Good. I knew this Graham would be helpful, both with the Arcadian treatment and access codes to their weapon archives. Send the package to Crete. I will collect it there. Now we will see who is the strongest. Borshov hung up, got to his feet, and stepped over the bodies of the house's owners. We move fast. A boat will meet us at main wharf in Alakati. He and his two remaining Spetsnaz jogged toward the sea. Walter Gray whistled as he used a small and powerful mobile crane to load the crate onto a pallet. He pushed his clipboard under his arm and lifted the lid of the crate. Inside, carefully insulated, lay the top half of a metallic skeleton. Gleaming steel armor plating, pistons, and wires. He checked the power pack, ticked off the items included, then sealed the crate back up. He signed the release form under the twin signatures of General Marcus Chilton and Colonel Jack Hammerson, an urgent priority order. Someone's in a hurry, he said, then started whistling again as he wheeled the pallet into the silver elevator. Destination, Crete. Mustafa Kamalak spat tobacco from his lip. His small wooden cottage was so close to the sea, he could hear the ripples as the waves washed the pebbled shore. He was a fisherman the same as his father, and his father's father before that. He hoped one day his sons might also be fishermen. But he had his doubts, given they were more interested in listening to music on those little boxes they had permanently plugged into their ears than spending six mornings a week hauling nets. He sucked in a deep breath. He envied his boys their worlds of sound this night. Izmir hadn't been so quiet after sundown since the end of the Greco-Turkish War in 1923. All the buildings along the central roadway to the coast had been evacuated. Those who remained in their homes were huddled inside, lights out. Mustafa kept his small radio playing, its volume down low, as he listened to the news updates. Something was crossing the country, devastating towns. A poisonous cloud of gas, a deadly germ, a devil, a djinn. No one knew, but everyone whispered. The army quarantined whole areas after it had passed through, and no one from within the affected zones was ever heard of again. The voices on the radio speculated, using scientific terms Mustafa had no hope of understanding. But one thing was clear. They all sounded scared, which made him feel sick in his guts. His lips moved in prayer. He'd heard the old women talking about God punishing them all for turning their backs on the traditional ways, for embracing a modernity that was repellent to the pious. It is our fault, they wailed. The voices on the radio rose in pitch. The monster was now in the streets of Izmir. Mustafa turned the radio down so low it was little more than the breathy whine of a mosquito. Then he heard it, another sound beginning to manifest. He turned toward the boarded window, and through its slats saw a tall shadow pass by. There was sound, too, weeping, moaning, a jeremiad of despair. 
The sound was so pitiful, Mustafa also began to weep. May God save you, he whispered. The shadow paused, and Mustafa felt his heartbeat in his throat. Move on, please move on, he prayed, crushing his eyes shut and holding his hands over his ears. Chapter 26 I think I got it, Jack. Jerry Harris fed the images through to Hammerson's office. Hammerson's screen flickered, and then he saw the dark mass moving along the Izmir Street. It was like a fog bank with a solid center. He noted its size in relation to objects it passed. It was big, over seven feet tall, and broad. Still not clear, Jerry. Can you give me any more clarity? Sorry, Jack, that's as good as it gets. The computers dismantle the original images, then reproduce them as a simulated best guess, building them up pixel by pixel. Takes a hell of a lot of processing power to make it real time. You're seeing it without really seeing it. Also, the thing is literally giving off that gas that surrounds it. There was a pause. Let me try something. The screen darkened, then flared, as Harris swapped between infrared and thermal. In thermal view, there was nothing but a cold outline. Giving off very little heat, he said. Hammerson grunted. Like a reptile. He narrowed his eyes as the images changed again. Harris moved to light enhancement, shadow management, and then contrast adjustment without any improvement. He went back to the original image. Nope, that's it, I'm afraid. Okay, Jerry, good work. At least we can see the bitch now. I want this program sent down to Walter Gray in R&D. We need to fit it into something mobile for the field team so they don't have to fight blind. The creature stopped at the tip of the peninsula of a fishing village called Chesme which had been there since before the time of the Trojans. A cloud swirled around the dark figure, but its central core never wavered as it stood at the water's edge. Around it, plants wilted, moths fell from the air, and small lizards shuddered, froze, and then turned milky white. In its mind it saw a land that had ceased to exist many millennia before. Gone were the songs of the priests, the race of bull jumpers, the souls of a hundred other races down the centuries. They were all gone, washed away by wind and rain and sand a hundred thousand times over. Its loneliness was like a disease eating it up inside. It longed to be among its own kind or back in its home so far away. Chronological time meant nothing to a creature that measured its life in many thousands of years, but emotions could last an eternity. The dominant beings here had barely advanced. It had seen inside their minds they were still primal, aggressive, and weak. But there had been one in the desert that was different, that was unique and alone, like it was, The brief meld with this mind, or two minds, one rational, the other primitive, had made it long for its own kind again. Sadness almost doubled it over, and then the pain racked it again. Pain and hunger. It needed more energy, needed to consume more of the smaller beings. Its job here was not done. Its people also needed to be fed. It must return. It sensed the rays of the sun before the yellow orb appeared at the horizon. It would rest soon. Like the small beings that lived here, it was made of billions of living cells. But unlike them, each cell was an individual entity, which cooperated and worked together with the others. The sunlight broke the cohesive bonds between its cells, allowing them to flow free. The dawn's light bathed it, and almost immediately it seemed to fragment and then collapse, its elements drifting away, like dust, or a swarm.
At sunup, the curfew ended, and the residents of Izmir emerged. Delivery vans started their rounds. Cars, trucks, and bikes clogged the roads. And boats were rigged and the crews threw off lines and headed out in pursuit of the day's catch. In another hour, no one would remember what the fuss was about. Mustafa Kamalak edged open his front door and peeked out. The radio had said the threat was gone. The dark sense of foreboding Mustafa had felt the night before was just a memory. It was as though a storm had blown up but passed over without doing any damage. He stepped fully outside and sucked in the morning air. He grinned and turned to shout for his two sons. In no time, he was gripping the boat's wooden wheel, one eye closed against the stinging smoke from the thick cigarette of reeking tobacco in his mouth. His face showed a thousand lines, each one carved by wind, weather, and adversity. Fishing was hard, and even harder now that the large net boats trolled the open waters. Today he would go far out, past the islands of Mykonos and Eos. If the big Greek boats wanted to scoop up all the fish from his home waters, then he would travel to theirs. Kamalak grinned and shook his head. His two sons were below deck, playing music so loud it hurt his ears. Though he scolded them daily, they were his pride and joy. Their laziness, girl-chasing, and bad language reminded him of himself when he was a boy and made him love them all the more. He peered through the greasy window to look up at the sky. A few heavy clouds, dark and thick, maybe rain later. He caught sight of the mast and frowned. There was a large mass clumped on the pole about ten feet up, like a swarm of bees. He cursed. He'd heard that bee swarms and even wasp colonies could take up residence in boats for years. People had been stung to death. He tied a rope over the wheel to keep it steady and left the cabin, walking with the wide-legged gait of all men moving about on a small boat at sea. He approached the mast, keeping his eyes fixed on the dark clump, then bent to lift a boat hook that was lashed to the rail. The mast wasn't moving like bees. It looked solid but jelly-like. It was certainly something strange. He spat his cigarette over the side and concentrated. He couldn't hear buzzing, but there was definitely a sound, soft like sobbing. A knot of foreboding bowled in his gut. He lifted the boat hook and got on his toes, drew his arm back. It was hard to concentrate on the mass as it seemed to move and shift, staying where it was but never remaining still. He grunted as he plunged the brass hook into its center. The tip sank in easily, as if the strange blob was something glutinous. He went to draw the boat hook out, but it stuck. The pole vibrated in his hands, and he gripped it harder, bracing himself to give it a good yank. The sky darkened as a huge cloud covered the sun. Almost immediately, the mass flowed down the pole like a torrent of sparkling ants. Before Mustafa could take his hands away, his arms were covered to the elbows. The mass surrounded him, light like dust, but prickling as it seemed to work its way into his very pores. His hands were now welded to the pole. As the stinging substance grew up over his face, he saw it flowing toward the hold toward his boys. A seagull squawked its outrage as Mustafa Kamalak's boat crashed into the shore west of Heraklion and just a few miles short of Panormos. The coastline was rugged, and even though the sea was calm, the vessel struck hard, partly beaching itself. The sharp rocks and the motion of the waves, even though they were small, would soon ensure the old wooden boat was broken down completely. The bird kept a beady eye on the craft, 
always on the lookout for a meal. The mast, with its strange growth, floated for a while, before wedging itself among the oyster-covered rocks. The tide would soon expose it. Of Kamalak and his sons there was no trace, no sign that anyone had been on board. The life jackets and buoyant rings were some of the first items to wash ashore, all unused. Above the hiss of the waves and the creak of timbers, there was another noise, sobbing. Unsettled by the strange sound, the seagull took off, circling the boat once and then leaving it far behind. Some instinct told it to be far away when the sun went down, in just a few hours' time. Chapter 27 Matt, Rebecca, and Reese Thompson sat on a bench outside the car hire company's office in Heraklion, waiting for their vehicle to be brought around. Rebecca groaned and massaged an ankle. My feet and legs are killing me. Pilot got us as close as he could without being spotted, Thompson said. We're not exactly clearing customs, are we? It was only a couple of miles. Come on, toughen up. Rebecca blew a raspberry at him and continued to rub. Got it. Matt had his computer open on his lap. He turned it around to show them the screen. Thompson winced. Good Christ, it's fucking huge. How are we able to see it when it nearly killed that technician? Major Jerry Harris, Hammerson's go-to guy for technology, put an application together for us, Matt said. And in answer to your question, we're not seeing it. The computer is. The program washes down the images, deconstructs them, then rebuilds them pixel by pixel as a mirror image of the real thing. Matt moved the volume bar up its scale. One more thing. Listen. Both Thompson and Rebecca concentrated. That's sobbing, Rebecca said. Turn it up. Matt upped the volume to maximum and Rebecca leaned in a little more. After a second or two, she nodded. Now that is weird. Is it in pain? Thompson asked, then shrugged. Could be his language for all we know, or even how the big bastard shows enjoyment. Language? Matt raised an eyebrow. He swiveled the computer on his lap and started to type furiously. Thompson looked at his watch and folded his arms. What I don't get is why it's turning people to stone. Is that how it gets its jollies? We don't know yet if it's even aware it's doing that to us, Rebecca said. Thompson snorted. That's not what Hunter's report says. He reckoned it was well aware of him. Energy, Matt said, without lifting his eyes from his screen. Rebecca nodded. Not a bad theory. After all, there are many organisms that absorb energy. Plants, algae, bacteria. They convert light energy, normally from the sun, into chemical energy that's later released to fuel their activities. The energy is held inside certain organelles, or in bacteria it's embedded in the plasma membrane. It's quite a normal process in nature. She looked up at the sky. Right here... On our Earth, the first photosynthetic organisms probably evolved. But what about something very different from us, or from anything that we know, something that evolved differently? We feed by ingesting sugars and proteins and converting them into energy, Matt said. Our guts have evolved a specialized digestion process to allow it. But that doesn't mean there aren't other ways to obtain energy. Thompson grimaced. You think the turning to stone thing might be how Magira feeds? Fuck me, that's disgusting. Matt shrugged. Who knows, ingesting flesh like we do might seem pretty sickening to this thing. But yeah, that's how it could be getting its energy. Check this out. He pressed a key, and discordant musical notes played. Well, that's annoying, Thompson said. Matt smiled. 
That's Magira. I ran it through Musify. It's an app that turns anything into a song. Rebecca grinned. The priest's song? I doubt it, but I'll play around with it a bit more. See if I get anything interesting. Matt closed his computer. Heads up! A dented black Land Rover squealed to a halt in front of them, in a cloud of black exhaust. Wow! Thompson got to his feet. Rebecca groaned and Matt guffawed. The driver handed the keys to Thompson, who opened the door for Rebecca. Beats walking. Just. Jack Hammerson watched Walter Gray as he circled the silver skeleton, looking it up and down with his expert eye. This version of the mech suit was more an exoskeleton, as its armor plating, ribs, and hydraulic pistons fitted close, and needle-like electrodes pierced the wearer's skin, giving the combat armor immediate response activity. It was a mechanized way to turn a soldier into a super-soldier. Gray had designed and built the mech suit himself, and Hammerson knew he loved his work. The scientist hit some buttons on a keypad he was holding, and the suit's arm lifted and its hand opened. He drew a foot-long steel baton from his pocket and placed it within the skeletal fingers. The hand closed around the baton. Gray typed some more, and the hand squeezed the toughened steel like it was dough. That's my bad boy, Gray said, and typed again. Now please let it go. The hand remained closed. He tried some different instructions with no result. He tried again and again, and eventually the hand opened and the crushed bar fell to the ground. Shit, shit, shit! Gray scowled at the immobile suit. You're supposed to hand it to me. Good work anyway, Gray said Hammerson. Can't wait to get it into the field. I've been wanting to talk to you about the field test, Colonel, Gray said. How did... Jack Hammerson waved him to silence. Walter, I need Jerry Harris's software uploaded into full-face shielding units for my field team. And I need them fast, all on a jet in an hour. Gray half saluted. Yes, sir, I can do that. And about the field test... There's still a few bugs we're working on, but I've been waiting to get your feedback. Any problems so far? Hammerson had no idea what he was talking about. Say that again? The mech suit. Are you having any problems in the field? Hammerson felt his temples throb as alarm bells went off in his head. Walter, be absolutely clear now. What the hell are you talking about? Gray looked puzzled. You wanted to field test the suit, so we dispatched one. Hammerson grabbed the man's shoulder. I am not field testing any goddamn suit! He couldn't help yelling the words. But, but you are! Confusion creased Gray's forehead. You and General Chilton recently requested a field test on the mech's upper body system. It's already been delivered. Hammerson lowered his head, closed his eyes, and ground his teeth. He drew in a breath and opened his eyes, his calm restored. Walter, please tell me where that combat armor was delivered. To the airfield this morning. And then where? Hammerson kept his smile warm. Crete, I have both your and General Chilton's digital signatures on the order. Fucking Crete. Hammerson closed his eyes again and nodded, working to calm his breathing. Security was only ever as good as the weakest link. He exhaled slowly, knowing they'd been compromised. There were only two countries in the world that could have achieved this sort of penetration, Russia and China. China was expert at industrial espionage, but Russia had the stronger motive, and they had Borshov. Is everything okay? Hammerson barely heard Gray's words as his mind worked furiously. Borshov in the field in Crete, with a mech suit. He'd be like a psychopathic tank. 
Hammerson had total confidence in the Arcadian and his team, but they were only flesh and blood, and Borshov would be wrapped in steel. And he still had a couple Spetsnaz. Plus, Matt Kearns and Rebecca Watchorn were running around over there, too. And Magira was potentially in the vicinity. The odds were rapidly shifting away from the Hawks. I need another Alex Hunter, he whispered. What's that, sir? Hammerson spun around to Gray. Lieutenant Sam Reed is already using a lower half mech suit. I want an upper body unit sent to him immediately. Gray shook his head. But the entire suit will be extremely heavy. We've mitigated some of the weight ratios with the technology's own power assist, but if it were to lose power for any reason, no normal man would be able to move in it. Sam Reed's a big man, but... I understand the risk, Hammerson said. Upload Jerry's software into the suit as well, and prepare the package for immediate delivery. We've got to drop it in before Greece closes its borders. Gray opened his mouth. That's an order, Hammerson barked. Gray flew into action, and Hammerson headed for the elevator. He needed to let Alex and his hawks know that Borshov had just scaled up his offensive capabilities, all courtesy of their own weapons lab. Alex tossed the rolled-up parachute to Sam, who squeezed it into a tiny bowl and buried it, dropping a flat stone over the top. Alex edged down into the ditch and dragged a coffin-sized crate out of the scrub, then used his fingers to pry the nailed lid open. Inside was what looked like half a metal skeleton with a molded helmet. Compliments of the hammer, Alex said, and dug deeper. In smaller compartments there were additional helmets, each named and undoubtedly tailored to size. Alex lifted his head and looked over the countryside. Sam, take over. He walked a few paces, stopped, and looked back along the shoreline. A sensation of foreboding reached up the back of his neck. He concentrated, staring for miles along the rocky coast, then slowly scanning the scrub of olive trees and the roadway in both directions. There was nothing in sight, but Alex knew there soon would be. The same desolation and loneliness he'd felt out in the Turkish desert had returned. He recognized the emotions because they mirrored his own, but magnified a thousandfold. Alex stood frozen as his mind turned inward. He saw Amy holding the boy, Joshua, the kid turning in her arms to smile and wave at him, the pair of them getting smaller and smaller as they walked into the distance. Boss? Sam tossed him a helmet, and Alex spun to catch it. Sam handed out the rest of the kit. Franks, Rogers. He smiled. Even a gift for my big English friend. He tossed Jackson a helmet. My lucky day, Jackson said, turning the full-faced gear over in his hands. It'll never go over that big ugly melon, Sam said with a grin, and Jackson gave him the finger. Alex examined the helmet, then walked back over to look inside the crate. All that was left was the skeleton, labeled for Sam. Hammerson had told Alex why he'd sent it. To even the playing field, he'd said. Uncle, you get first prize, Alex said. The rest is all yours. Sam grunted as he tried to lift out the suit, even though he was a huge man and one of the strongest hawks ever. The machine-tooled super-alloy frame weighed in at over two hundred pounds. Need a hand? Alex asked. I got this, boss. Sam wheezed, his face beat red. Damn, it's stuck. Probably lashed down. Turn around, I'll put it on you. Sam turned, and Alex pulled one side of the crate away. The suit looked like a large backpack, with a network of rods, pipes, and tubes, running over and around the shoulders and chest, giving it the look of metallic footballer's body armor. 
Alex picked it up, barely straining. Guess it's going to work in tandem with the technology you're already wearing. Sam nodded. That's the plan. He took off his shirt to reveal huge, bull-like muscles bunched beneath scarred and tattooed flesh. He planted his legs and braced himself as Alex placed the suit over his shoulders, then worked his arms into the metal framework sleeves and his fingers into the metallic gloves. He attached it to the lower suit and powered it up. The skeletal framework gripped and tightened along his torso and arms. Sam rolled his shoulders. Still experimental. I guess I'm its first real field test. He looked over his shoulder at Alex. If it explodes, make sure you pass on my less than positive feedback to Walter Gray. You got it, Alex said. But I'll give him one star for at least making it look cool. Sam snorted and began to insert the electrode needles into the muscle fibers along his lower spine and arms. They'd tap into the nerves, making the assisting mechanics part of his body's nervous system and immediately responsive. Once the suit was fully in place, it was self-supporting, using its own biometric-assisted power used to sustain the weight of the super-alloy frame. It was still heavy, though. Sam could barely move. He looked like a cross between an old-style gladiator and an android. He sucked in a deep breath. Boss, you'll have to give me a hand with this last bit. He motioned to a small plate dangling at his neck, with eight one-inch pins sticking out from what looked like a microprocessor chip the size of a matchbook. Into the skull at the base of the medulla oblongata, Alex said. You got it. Alex raised his eyebrows. Need something to bite down on? Borshov's throat? Sam guffawed and then shook his head, staring straight forward. Do it. Alex didn't hesitate, knowing the big man wouldn't even blink as he pushed the pins into the skin at the base of his skull. There was a second of resistance, and then Sam exhaled. That's got it? He grinned and nodded. Ha! Light as a feather now. He lifted his arms, now wrapped in a bodywork of armor plating and tubes. The movement was smooth and fast. He turned his hands over, then made fists. Looking good, Alex said, walking around him. Casey Franks grinned. Man, do I want one of those. Alex bent, picked up a fist-sized rock, and tossed it to Sam, who spun and caught it with lightning-quick reflexes. He held the rock up, and with a faint whine of electronics, closed his fist tight. The rock pulverized. Sam winked. Look out, Arcadian, you got competition. About time, big guy. Alex looked at his watch. Let's move. We need to get to Heraklion ASAP, and that's about a hundred miles. Sam put his biological suit top back on over the mech framework. The material stretched to fit, but looked lumpy in places. Jackson held up the helmet he'd been given. What do we do with these? They're fucking blacked out. Alex placed his over his head. It covered everything except his mouth. The visor slid down, and he pressed a button to darken it, turning it into a solid mass. He held his hand up in front of it and saw an outline appear, then his entire hand, but a little less detailed than the real thing. Jerry Harris's software was using microprocessors to capture, analyze, and digitally rework the image, then instantly deliver a reproduction. Alex switched off the screen and pushed the visor up. This, my friends, is how we see without actually looking. Thank God for nerds. Now we got something we can use to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Magira. Yeah, if we want to get torn in half, Jackson said. The Turkish guys said it made mincemeat out of anyone who got close to it. Sam rolled his shoulders. But they weren't hawks. Got that right, uncle? Franks bumped knuckles with Rogers, 
her scarred face pulled up in a half-grin. Alex checked a small GPS and then pointed. All right, let's see what our scientists have been up to. Double time. They started to jog toward the Lasithi Plateau and the caves of Psychro. Matt, Rebecca, and Reese Thompson sat in a small outside cafe, overlooking a sparkling expanse of water that shimmered with a thousand diamond reflections. Matt watched Thompson's eyes narrow as he read down a page of notes. The SAS soldier shook his head. The scuba equipment's easy. We can get that anywhere. Same for night diving rigs. But the demolition charges are harder. Hunter and his hawks won't have the explosives we need. They'll be carrying anti-personnel, and we need dynamite, or better still, C4. For that, we have three options. Buy it legitimately, buy it on the black market, or steal it. We start buying explosives and we'll raise some eyebrows. Got to get them on the quiet, Matt said. He sipped from a tiny cup and winced. This coffee'd strip painted so freaking strong. He pushed another small sweet cake into his mouth. That's better. The baklava are great. Rebecca scoffed. Grow a pair, Kearns. This is real man territory. Home to Jason, Achilles, and Hercules. Matt rolled his eyes and turned back to Thompson. We'll probably need to steal the explosives. Don't know where we'd buy them anyway. I do, Thompson said. I've worked out here before. You just have to decide whether you want to deal with the devil. The devil, not terrorists, Rebecca said quickly. Agreed, said Matt, and looked at the SAS man. How and who? Thompson shrugged. Well, I could steal it from a construction site, but that'd be hit and miss. Better if we find someone to help us navigate the black market. Means we can tailor our order. Okay, how long will it take? Matt asked. Quantities, quality, and delivery time all depend on how much you're willing to pay. Rebecca snorted. Supply and demand got to love the capitalist system. Thompson stood up. Give me a minute. He walked away from the table, phone to his ear. He only seemed to speak a few words before he returned and sat down. And now we wait. For what? Rebecca asked. For a call telling me we have a meeting. Until then, we wait. He grinned at Matt. Get your credit card ready. Rebecca sighed, sat back and tilted her head toward the sun. There are worse things, I suppose. She slid the empty plate back to Matt. Order some more cakes, seeing you're about to be so liberal with the taxpayer's money. Matt looked at his watch. Just a few more. We've got work we can do while we wait. The museum opens in thirty minutes. We can check out what they recovered from those deep caves a few hundred years ago. Hopefully, it'll give us an idea which level we need to enter first. A small bee had landed on the empty cake plate, perhaps attracted by the syrupy sugar streaking its surface. Rebecca leaned forward, examining it closely. You know, if a hive is destroyed by fire or predators, and a few bees return home to find it that way, then they've been known to commit suicide. She sat back her eyes on the busy insect. They just stop moving and die. Basically, they can't exist by themselves, or don't want to. The hive group is the body, and the bees are like cells, really. She narrowed her eyes. An individual, just like a cell. In the granite forecourt of the museum, was a huge list of its rooms, galleries, and collections. While Matt and Rebecca worked out where they needed to go, Thompson stood surrounded by a group of Greek women who'd obviously taken a shine to his physique. The SAS man's face became serious and he turned away, placing a hand over one ear. Go ahead, Jackson. He grunted several times. 
Got it. Keep me informed of progress. Out. What is it? Matt asked. The Hawks are here. We can also expect a nationwide martial law order any time soon, which is going to make it difficult to move around if you're not a local. His expression became wry. Only upside to any of this is Magira seems to have finally got the Turks and Greeks working together. Matt nodded. A catastrophe will do that. Let's just hope we'll be finished and gone by morning. When will the Hawks get to us? Tonight. Good, Rebecca said. No offense, Reese, but I'll feel a lot better when we've got a few more good guys with us. Thompson winked. Hey, none taken. So will I. Now, are we going to get some work done? As they walked away, Thompson turned to the group of Greek women and waved. They waved back, and he grinned and managed to inflate his chest another half inch, much to their obvious delight. You know, I could live here, he said. Come on, Adonis, Rebecca said, and led them inside. Beautiful frescoes decorated the walls, showing cavorting dolphins, women with long curling hair and red lips pouring wine, alabaster lions and tigers leaping and snarling, and everywhere the glimmer of gold, from tiny deformed coins through to impressive crowns. Rebecca pointed to a sign for the Minoan Hall and picked up speed. In the center of the hall stood a life-sized granite bull. It was degraded now by the passage of thousands of years, but once it would have been hard to distinguish it from the real thing. Descending a set of stairs, they came upon a massive hangar-like space, with an entire section set aside for artifacts recovered from the caves of Crete. There are... Over three thousand known caves here, and less than a quarter have been fully explored, Rebecca said. Many cultures, not just Minoan, believe the caves were home to gods, demons, and other creatures and sub-deities. Over here. Matt waved them over to the sculpture gallery, where statues, some tiny like dolls, some larger than life, were arranged by period. Many were marble, granite, or dark basalt, but there were a few of calcium carbonate. Rebecca pointed out one in particular, a little less than five feet tall, wrapped in a small, kilt-like skirt with a bare torso. The leg was broken off, and at the center of the break was something unmistakable to the trio, a shard of bone. Reese Thompson bent lower. You gotta be shitting me. It's as if the sculptor had actually seen battlefield injuries. Rebecca read from the brass plate at the statue's base. As we thought, recovered from the Cycro Caves, in the cave of Zeus, it says Minoan youth. Look at his face. The features were contorted with terror. Frozen for all time. And this. Matt pointed to a stone tablet depicting several kneeling figures. It was heavily eroded, but all had the Minoan long curl of hair down beside their ears and the fluted dress with wrapped tunic. They were praying before a huge figure, their eyes bound with cloth. The faint scratches underneath the image could easily have been mistaken for chisel marks, but to Matt and Rebecca they were another clue. Minoan writing. Matt turned to Rebecca. I'll do my best, but Margaret would be helpful right about now. He leaned in close. The goddess of night and darkness. Something, something, will always protect us. Let Hades hide her palace. The symbols for two hundred. Calamos beneath our feet. Matt frowned. A calamos was a very ancient unit of measure, equivalent to about ten feet, 
I think it might be telling us the depth of where the goddess was living. Two thousand feet, Rebecca said thoughtfully. There are no caves that deep here. The Sycro Caves only about four hundred feet deep. Even the pool soundings that were taken are less than that. No caves that we know of, Matt said. You said yourself that rockfalls and flooding could have sealed off some areas. That cave dive's looking more likely all the time, Thompson said quietly. Matt shook his head. I hate caves. I'll be on the surface eating baklava and keeping a lookout. Rebecca put her arm around his. No way. We need your minot and expertise. Anything else written there? Matt grimaced and leaned in toward the glass. Yeah, there's more. It says something like beware or be in fear of the guardians. He groaned. Great. I only know of one guardian of the underworld, Rebecca said. Cerberus. The big angry dog? Nice. This is turning out to be a real holiday adventure, isn't it? Thompson said and grinned. These mythological tales are usually allegorical, Rebecca said. They're designed to teach us about the dangers of greed, lust, violence, and the like. And a big dog does that how? Thompson asked. Matt shrugged. I wish it was only a big dog. Cerberus was actually the offspring of a half-woman, half-serpent. You see? The serpent crops up in ancient Greek and Minoan mythology time and time again. Rebecca nodded. Cerberus was commonly represented in Greek mythology as having either two or three heads, each with an appetite for live meat. His sole job was to guard the gates to the underworld, hell. Thompson shook his head. Jesus, did these guys have any nice gods? Matt grinned. Sure, but fear always works best. Anyway, a guard is a good sign. After all, you don't guard something unless it's valuable, right? So at least this narrows our search. Seems to me the Psycho Cave is where we need to start. If it's been sealed off by rockfalls and a million gallons of water for several thousand years, it means whatever was down there is probably still down there. Like a giant, many-headed dog. Thompson raised his eyebrows. Rebecca laughed. After about five thousand years, anything that was alive or trapped down there will be bones. Yeah, just like Magira. Thompson's face became serious. He looked from Matt to Rebecca. So, now what? Now... We wait for your devil to meet with us, Matt said. Thompson nodded. We wait. Chapter 28 Uli Borshov stepped out into the road, raised a hand and waved the battered truck to a stop. The driver leaned out of the window, puffing on a cigarette. Blackbird? Borshov nodded, grinning. The truck driver looked him up and down for a moment, then shrugged, pushed open the door, and stepped down. He flicked his smoke to the dirt, walked to the back of the truck, dropped the backboard, and stood back. He pointed to a large crate. Is heavy. I hurt my back. Borshov clicked his fingers and his spetsnaz came out from the scrub. The driver became wary and stuck his hands in his pockets, seeming to feel around for something. Borshov's men hauled the crate out, then one went to stand by the truck's open door. The driver's eyes flicked to the man, then back to Borshov. He licked his lips. My job finished now. 
Pay me five hundred USA dollars and I go home. Borshov held up one large finger. First we check contents, okay. Maybe you damage. He grinned again. The driver shook his head. Only damage is to my back. The Spetsnaz prized open the lid. Borshov bent to look inside, examining the half exoskeleton. Satisfied everything was there, he took off his shirt and began to drag it out of the crate. He grunted from the weight, but managed to lift it free and hoist it onto his back, his hugely muscled legs planted wide like a pair of hair-covered columns. He switched the suit on, and it clamped onto his body, the smaller electrodes penetrating the dark curling hair covering his torso, and then his flesh. He winced and then cursed, feeling the small plate dangling behind his neck. He knew there was one more painful step to go. He motioned to his Spetsnaz. Grigor, there is small plate with needles. Push it into the base of my skull. Grigor briefly examined the long needle-like electrodes, then roughly jammed them into Borshov's flesh. Borshov gritted his teeth and made a hissing noise. Grigor grinned. The truck driver grimaced and edged toward his open door. The Spetsnaz, standing there, blocked him. Borshov exhaled and began swinging his arms, faster and increasingly fluidly, as the mech suit bonded with his body and nervous system. He threw fake punches, his speed increasing even more. He flicked one huge armor-plated fist into the truck's steel side. It impacted with a clang, leaving a huge dent. Good, he said. The truck driver stared at the ding in his vehicle. Okay, all works. Pay me and I go. His brow was wet with perspiration. How much, you say? Borshov asked. Five hundred dollars, USA. Borshov nodded. He stepped toward the man, moving lightly, even though he carried an extra few hundred pounds of hydraulics and armor plating. When he was within three feet of the driver, one of his arms shot out and grabbed the man's arm, dragging him closer. The driver ripped a long machete blade from the leg of his trousers and swung it at Borshov, but the big Russian caught the hand and ripped the weapon free. The man frantically pummeled at Borshov's arm, but all he did was split his own knuckles on the metal frame. The driver was a big man, weighing in excess of 220 pounds, but Borshov lifted him over his head and then smoothly brought his hands together. The driver screamed, and there was a sickening crunch as his body was folded in half. Borshov threw the corpse into the dry scrub. His men laughed, and one clapped. Borshov looked at his hands. Good. Very good. He looked at his men, grinning. I just saved us five hundred dollars, and we also have a truck. One of the Spetsnaz touched a stud at his ear, listening. The local Ikoyenia have some information about Kearns, the American professor, to sell. Borshov nodded, looking at his hands again. Sell? Maybe I will save us some more money instead. He flexed the armor-plated fingers. Now we will see what happens to you in these hands, Arcadian. We're on. Reese Thompson disconnected the call and set the phone down on the cafe table. You got the meeting, Matt said. Excellent. Sure, and I can fill our order, Thompson said. They'll want to know why we want it, though. But we're not telling them, right? Rebecca said. It's not negotiable, Matt added. 
his expression deadpan. Thompson shrugged. Then we might have to get it ourselves, but we're dealing with the Ikoyenia, the local mafia. Now they know about our request, they'll make sure we don't get it from anyone else if we cancel. Bottom line is, if they think we're planning a robbery, they know the heat will also come down on them, so they'll want a cut. He smiled. A juicy one. Can we steal the dynamite? Rebecca asked. From the Ikoyenia? Thompson snorted. Then we'll end up in a war with an army of Greek and Cretan gangsters. Rebecca frowned. No, I mean from a mining company or the like. Thompson shook his head. Where do you think they're getting it? The difference is they'll probably use someone on the inside. No alarms, no violence, no mess, no time-wasting. Matt exhaled and sat back. And if we tell them? Rebecca started to object, but Matt stopped her. Like I said, they'll want a cut of the action. Thompson waved over a waiter and ordered a coffee. Matt looked across the table at Rebecca. Do we care? Do we have the time to care? He paused. If there are valuables down there, my professional self tells me to make sure they end up in a museum. But we need to look beyond that. What we seek has no value to the Mafia. So as far as I'm concerned, they're welcome to whatever else is down there. Fine with me, Thompson said. Rebecca scowled. Anything and everything down there belongs to Crete. Yeah, sure, except the stuff we might want to take, Matt said. Look, we don't have time to make a moral stand. People are dying, and more will die unless we can stop Magira. We get the C4, they get a cut. Like Reese says, no mess. Matt raised his hand. In or out? Thompson nodded and raised his hand. Rebecca scowled for a moment. Ugh! Okay. Her hand went up briefly, then whipped down again. Matt looked at Thompson. Let's make it happen. Matt, Rebecca, and Thompson sat in a room filled with polished antiques and with beautiful artwork adorning every wall. Statues and other objects from various periods were displayed in cabinets around the walls, professionally uplit. Matt's eyes watered at the sight of so many stolen artifacts, all of which would have made any museum curator in the world drool. Behind the desk... A gray-haired but robust-looking older man poured tiny cups of coffee for them all. Carlo Vangelis was the head of the local Ikoyenia family, a businessman with fingers in too many pies to mention. He looked like a kindly uncle, Matt thought, until he fixed his green, merciless gaze upon you. Vangelis finished pouring and motioned for them each to take a cup. So, you want to blow something up, he said, watching Matt over the rim of his own cup. Matt decided to be candid. Maybe. We need to get into the Psycho Caves. There might be something down there we need, and it might be buried. We'll probably need to blast the rock. A lot of rock, I think. Vangelis grinned, showing extremely white teeth. What is it? Matt didn't hesitate. Maybe some writing on a wall. Maybe an old document. We don't know yet. We'll know it when we see it. You want to blow up one of Crete's national treasures, and you don't really know if it will be worth the trouble. Not, I think, something I want to be part of. He lifted his cup to his lips again. There could be Minoan treasure, Rebecca blurted out. 
Vangelis put his cup down slowly. And now I am listening. Matt talked briefly about what might be found in the lower caves, omitting any reference to the living Magira. He described the piles of gold, rivers of oil, and encrusted jewels given as tribute over the centuries. All of it, or none of it, could be hidden in the very depths of the Psychro Caves. Vangelis sipped slowly, his eyes steady, as he watched Matt for a full minute after he'd finished. His gaze slid to Rebecca, then to Thompson. So, two scientists and one SAS soldier on a secret treasure hunt, and prepared to vandalize one of the wonders of Crete. And you want to do this for some words written on something maybe five thousand years ago? His eyebrows shot up. They must be important words. They are, but only to us, Matt said evenly. They're of historical importance. In fact, after we've examined them, you can keep them. Vangelis nodded slowly. I have been inside the Sacro Caves. They are deep, and at the bottom there is only a lake. Why do you think there is something other than more water down there? Matt felt he was being subjected to a human lie detector. It's a risk that there is only water. But our research leads us to believe the caves run deeper, into other caverns. We strongly believe it's worth investigating. And that investigation cannot involve the government... Because there is something down there that you do not wish to share with them? Vangelis asked evenly. Matt nodded. Unfortunately, yes. But we seek only the words, the knowledge. Anything else is yours. Vangelis bobbed his head from side to side. It seems like a simple and worthwhile investment. But if you are caught... Matt nodded. Then we never met. Vangelis grunted, scrutinizing Matt for another few moments. Dynamite Semtex or C4? C4, Thompson said. Better quality plasticizer, and better for shaping charges, especially in a liquid environment. We'll take three one-kilo packs plus detonators. Vangelis smiled. Very good. He lifted a phone and spoke rapidly in Greek for a few seconds. Matt followed the conversation, not letting on that he understood every word. Vangelis looked at his watch and hung up. He clasped his hands together on the desk. When will you be entering the cave? Tomorrow morning before dawn, Matt said. We need diving equipment, cave diving equipment. We plan to buy it, but... Vangelis shrugged. No problem. I assume you'll also need keys to the security gate over the cave. My men will meet you there with the dive equipment and C4 at, say, 4 a.m.? Thompson sat forward. No way. Matt grabbed his arm. The extra security will be fine, but they take orders from us once we're below ground. Vangelis's face was like stone. They take orders from me, above and below ground. The silence stretched, and his features softened. But on the descent, you are team leader. He opened his arms. You see... We all work together just fine. As the day faded, a small cloud began to form on the shoreline west of Heraklion, just a few miles shy of Panormos, lifting from the rocks shattered beams, tattered cloth, and broken mast of a fishing boat. The mist solidified at its center, then snaked along the jagged coastline, staying in the shadows. 
Like a dark tide, it surged along gullies, around rocks, and beneath trees. Insects, rodents, and small lizards scurried from its path, the slower ones shuddering, turning white, and becoming rigid. The mist flowed up into the mountains and toward the ancient caves. Chapter 29 Evening lengthened into night as the hawks jogged to the Cycro Caves. Franks ran beside Rogers, with Jackson a dozen paces behind them, and Sam and Alex the same distance out in front. A hawk was trained to run all day and all night, and still be fresh enough to enter a hand-to-hand -hand combat scenario on arrival in a conflict zone. But they were all feeling the heat. Though the biological armored suits were lightweight, and the sun had gone down, the ground still gave off residual warmth. The pace was hard, and Rogers blew air and wiped his brow. Hot! Sure is. Franks looked across at him. Looking a little flushed there, Junior. Rogers grinned. I'm the same age as you. Yeah, but I've been a hawk for four years. You've been in for one. To me, that makes you just one year old, Junior. The group pushed on, keeping in formation. They still had miles to go. The plan had been to commandeer a vehicle, but seeing they needed to keep a near-invisible profile, they had to skirt towns and stay off major roads. The back roads were overgrown, dusty, and about as inhabited as Mars. Rogers lowered his voice. What do you think about this Magira thing? The boss said he heard it weeping. Frank snorted. I'll fucking make it weep all right. Rogers laughed. I bet you will. Hey, you know that professor said it might be a living god. A god? She scoffed. Let me tell you about the time I was in the Appalachians. I went up against something the Native Americans used to refer to as the god of the mountains. Let me guess. You killed it, Rogers said wearily. Franks grinned. Nah, it threw me off a cliff. Rogers laughed. That still makes you the expert in my book. His face became serious. This thing tore the Turkish spec ops guys in half. Legs one way, guts and head the other. I read the briefing, too, she said, her eyes bright. That's a good thing. Huh? Rogers frowned. If it can do that, it has physical form. If it has physical form, we can inflict damage. And if we can damage it, we can fucking kill it. Yeah. He reached up a forearm to wipe his brow. How much further? Franks looked at a small box strapped to the inside of her wrist. Just eighteen to go. She saw that Sam and Alex in front were chatting as they ran, at a speed that was almost a sprint for her shorter stride. As far as she was concerned, the boss was back. She still thought that inside him there lurked something unspeakably violent, but she guessed there were demons running loose in all of them. He'd kept it together and under control in Italy, and he'd been ice cool ever since but she doubted that cool would be maintained if he got in front of Uli Borshov. Good, she thought. Frank smiled. She rated herself highly skilled in combat and warfare, even among the hawks. With the Arcadian back and Sam in a full mech suit, the super soldiers bolstered their team. Look out, world, she thought. Alex and Sam kicked up the pace another notch. They aren't even sweating, Rogers said. Go and complain. 
Franks winked and lifted her stride. He snorted and increased his pace. I'd rather die. Matt lay on the bed in the hotel room, arms behind his head, staring up at the ceiling. They'd given themselves a few hours off while they waited to meet up with Vangelis's men at the cave. The room was cool, the sheets clean and pressed, and fatigue dragged on his frame. But still he couldn't drift off. His mind kept whispering warnings, refusing to let him slip away. Truth was, he was dreading going into the deep caves. The thought of swimming in inky water beneath megatons of rock made him want to throw up. His mind was dredging up memories of previous encounters with things from his worst nightmares, things that really existed. He'd accompanied a team of scientists and hawks to the Antarctic, where they'd gone down into the darkness beneath the ice. Of all the fifty on that mission, only three had returned. Matt, scientist Amy Weir, and Alex Hunter. There were things down in that subterranean darkness that had torn at his sanity. He'd spent years working hard to push them into a secure part of his brain, imprisoned under a mental lock and key. He was rarely successful at keeping them there. The doorbell buzzed, and he nearly leaped a foot into the air. Matt! It was Reese Thompson. Downstairs in ten. Matt tried to calm his rapid heartbeat and swung his legs over the side of the bed. Got it, Reese. He stood and rubbed his face hard. In and out in a few hours. No problem, he told himself. No problem at all. Fifteen minutes later, he exited the elevator and crossed the empty foyer to see Thompson standing outside in the humid night air. There was an enormous moon rising. Thompson nodded, and Matt returned the gesture. Nice night for a swim. Or to blow some shit up, Thompson replied. Let's hope our friends get us the right explosives. Matt raised his eyebrows. And they're the real thing. Thompson grunted. I'll know if they're real or not. Don't worry. Rebecca pushed through the doors and stretched. Her eyes were slightly puffy. Couldn't manage a catnap. Overtired or overexcited, I guess. Tell me about it. Matt half smiled. Don't worry, this'll be fun. She looked at him like he'd just grown another head. Fun? For who? His smile fell away, and he couldn't meet her eyes. Well, if we find something that gives us a clue how to control Magira and perhaps save lives, it'll be worth it. Agreed? Rebecca bobbed her head once and turned away. Let him up, people, Thompson said. It's about an hour's drive up to the plateau. The road soon gave way to a dirt track, and the Land Rover rocked and bounced along it, heading up the mountain. Vapor rose from the ground like ghosts between the pine trees. The moonlight showed three big men standing beside a truck near the entrance to the main cave. The truck looked in worse condition than their Land Rover, Matt thought. Thompson eased the Land Rover to a stop. Welcoming committee's already here. The birthplace of Zeus, Rebecca said, and stepped down. Matt and Thompson followed, but Matt noticed the soldier kept the car door open between himself and Vangelis' men, and his hand hovered near his gun. He quickly ran his eyes over the dark rocks bordering the cave and the stands of pines rising around them before returning to the men. Only then did he step out fully. 
He nodded toward the men's truck. Where's our equipment? Matt began to translate, but one of the men waved at him to stop. We understand. That is why we are chosen to be here, to help you. He smirked. I am Antonis Papariga. Call me Tony. He pointed to the large man on his left. Petro. And then to the one at his right. Andronis. Tony walked to the truck and dropped the backboard to reveal wetsuits, air tanks, goggles, and flippers, knives, numerous lights, hammers, and spike bars like long crowbars, shovels, and even some spear guns. There was also a heavy metal box with a yellow warning symbol on the front. Tony flipped it open. This was not easy to get so quickly. Thompson walked over and peered inside. Matt could see there were six packages the size of a large block of butter, twice as many as they'd requested, each wrapped in brown paper with Greek writing and more warning symbols. Thompson lifted a block, squeezed it slightly, and held it to his nose. He nodded, replaced it, and then lifted what looked like a capped silver pen. He turned to Matt. All good. Tony grinned and held his arms wide. Mr. Vangelis hopes for a good return on his investment. He unbuttoned the front of his shirt, opening it slightly to show a wetsuit underneath. Now you pay for equipment. Ten thousand euros. There were urgent words from behind him, and Tony nodded, then turned back to Matt. For each of us. What? Matt spluttered. Rebecca crossed her arms and rolled her eyes. Why don't we see what Mr. Vangelis says about this, hmm? She held up a slim phone and started to press numbers. Tony's face went red. Then he grinned and waved his hand. No, no, do not call. I was only having big joke with you. We are ready when you are, Professor. Matt nodded. While the men unloaded the truck, he whispered to Rebecca, You don't really have his number, do you? She raised an eyebrow. Nope, but they don't know that. She leaned closer to him. Should we wait for the hawks? Matt thought for a second or two, then shook his head. The search could take hours, and they might be still miles away. He sucked in a deep breath. Let's make a start. Matt's heart was racing. The night air surrounding them was warm, humid, and pine-scented, but he felt a depressing cold radiating from the blackness of the Psychro Cave. He detected a faint movement of air and with it a whiff of rocks and moss and dampness. He shivered, even though he wore a rubberized wetsuit. Like Rebecca and Thompson, he had a backpack over his shoulders, containing excavation equipment, climbing gear, and extra flashlight batteries. Thompson got to carry the explosives. Matt looked at their three Greek minders, all wore wetsuits over their sizable frames, and two had shoulder holsters. Matt wondered what they'd do with the guns when it came time to enter the water. He pointed to Tony's holster. You know, a gun goes off down there. We could all be buried alive. Tony shrugged. Then we hope we don't need them. He nodded toward Thompson. I think these pea-shooters are not as loud as your friend's gun, huh? He winked, but Thompson ignored him. They're dangerous, Matt persisted. And the fucking explosives, are they for redecorating? Tony said with a grin. He nodded toward the dark cave opening. Do we go in or what? Rebecca narrowed her eyes. 
I've got a bad feeling about these guys, she whispered to Matt. Once we get down there and show them anything of value, we may not get out again. Yeah, well, Matt gave her a crooked smile. It's not really them I'm worried about. There are far worse things in caves than thugs with guns. Thompson gave them the go-ahead, and Matt sighed. He switched on his headlamp and aimed his big flashlight into the Stygian darkness. Behind a heavy metal gate, concrete steps with a railing led down into the dark. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here, he whispered. Rebecca finished the quote. Through me you pass into the city of woe. Through me you pass into eternal pain. Thompson groaned. Is that supposed to be motivational? Because it's not working. Matt smiled despite his fear. Dante's 700-year-old poem about Virgil's travels to hell. Thompson rolled his eyes. Like I said, motivational. Tony went first, unlocking the gate and heading down the steps into the darkness. Fifty feet in, he stopped at a small metal box fixed to the wall with a large padlock at the bottom. He inserted another key, popping the padlock open, and lifted the lid of the box to expose rows of switches. One after the other, he flipped them down. With a clanking sound and a hiss of sodium, lights began to shine overhead, behind stalagmites and stalactites, and from within smaller grottos, all illuminating a wonderland of different mineral colors. Matt snorted. You can see why earlier inhabitants thought this was a magical place. Brave little buggers, coming in here in the dark, Thompson observed as he looked around. And nothing but ghosts for company, Rebecca said. As they descended, the temperature seemed to drop a degree every dozen feet. The colored lighting gave the caverns a mystical feel, and signs on the walkway indicated the names the natural structures had been given. Hades' Grotto, Zeus's Throne, Titan's Spear. Matt pointed out a pathway worn into the stone along one of the walls, probably where Minoan feet trod thousands of years ago. After twenty minutes, they came to an enormous central pit, with a lake another hundred or so feet below. The water was so still it could have been glass. There was a hoiking sound, and then Petro let loose a goblet of spit that sailed downwards. Matt shook his head and cursed. The blob struck the surface and created ripples on a lake that had probably lain undisturbed for over a century. The big man grinned and was dragging up another gobbet when Thompson came up behind him and nudged him hard in the back. Ach! Petro pulled back from the edge, looking panicked. He glared at the Englishman. We've got to swim in there, you dumb bastard, Thompson said his eyes daring the Greek. Tony snorted and smacked Petro over the back of the head. Work first, play later. It took them another hour to reach the lowest level of the cave. At a nod from Thompson, Matt stepped over the guardrail and edged along a narrow slab of rock to the lake's edge. Lights had been placed just at its surface to illuminate the shallows. The water was so clear that unless you concentrated, it was hard to see where it started and the air stopped. He looked up and saw an alcove across the pool, with a portion of wall and a few fragments of paving tiles still embedded in the ground. Marble covered a flat rock that would have been a magnificent polished surface thousands of years before. Hercules' Table Matt said. 
This is where Professor Myers found many of the artifacts back in 1896. Axe heads, darts, and knives. Matt looked at Tony. There were also gem-encrusted daggers, a golden chariot, and beautifully carved ivory figurines, all priceless. Tony grinned and nodded. Matt adjusted the angle of his headlamp, shining it into the darker recesses of the cave. The ancient Greeks, Minoans, and even the early Neolithic tribes held festivals deep in these caves, usually heralding the change of the seasons, and when they wanted to bring fertility back to the earth. Gifts of gold, weaponry, and in many cases virgins, were thrown into cave pools and volcanoes. Dozens of skeletons of young women were pulled from the silt of this pool alone. He pointed to the deeper center of the pool. One story has it that the cave god of Crete was a mother goddess who rested upon hills of gold and gave birth each season to a son who was made of stone. Tony lit a cigarette. Hills of gold, you say? Put that out, Rebecca said. There's a chance we could open a cave filled with methane. One spark and you'll kill us all. Tony dragged hard on the cigarette, unmoved. Rebecca sighed and went and added her torch beam to Matt's. This is a good place to start, she said. This cave flooded in the early 1800s after some dynamiting on the surface. It collapsed some of the deeper caves and also allowed rainwater to pour in during ensuing rainy seasons. The artifacts that Professor Myers found were believed to have washed out from smaller caves. We need to find out which ones. So what are we looking for? Thompson was moving his light over the surface of the lake. The earth leaves us clues, Matt said. The rock formations down here grow incredibly slowly, about a third of an inch in ten years. He shone his light on an enormous column reaching from floor to ceiling. That started out as a single drip of water loaded with calcium carbonate and other minerals. A stalactite forms on the ceiling, a stalagmite on the floor. And over hundreds of thousands of years, they grow toward each other, touch, and then combine. So we're looking for new growths or scars on the rock, above and below water. Anything indicating fresh action that began in the last few hundred years. He turned to Thompson and pointed with his thumb at the lake. And that means pool time, I'm afraid. He stood with Thompson, looking down into the water. It looked about two feet deep, but the clarity was deceptive. It could have been ten. Tumbled boulders were visible below the surface, with occasional snaggletooth islands lifting calcium carbonate and mineral spires toward corresponding stalactites on the cavern roof above. As they watched, a small, sprat-type creature wriggled from one shard of stone to another. There are things living in there, Thompson said. Matt nodded. Could be blind eels, blind fish, blind shrimp, you name it. Could be all kinds of things, but all blind. Thompson stepped into the water, up to his waist. Clouds of silt billowed around his ankles. Try not to disturb the layer of slime and silt on the bottom if possible. The water will end up like soup. Thompson nodded and lifted his feet, floating in the water. It's warmer than I expected. Really? Matt frowned and placed his hand into the water. Hmm. Might be thermal vents. He straightened. Well, lucky you. Remember, you're looking for rock falls, scraped stone, tunnels below the surface, anything like that. 
Thompson pulled the mask over his face, gave Matt a thumbs up, then rolled over. The small tank he wore only carried about twenty minutes of breathing time, so he used his snorkel, and the sound of his breathing through the tube was loud in the echoing cavern. Matt went to supervise their three Greek minders, who were looking for treasure, while Rebecca edged along the waterline, bending now and then to examine small imperfections in the melted candle-like cave formations. After thirty minutes or so, the Greeks gave up their search and leaned against a metal guardrail, smoking and laughing. Reese Thompson had swum away into the darker recesses of the cave, his headlamp creating a glowing circle around him in the immaculate water. Matt and Rebecca were exploring different corners of the cave. Matt found a small grotto and poked his head inside, noticing a glint of something pressed into the far wall. He leaned in further and extended his arm, straining towards it. Could it be? He couldn't reach past some stalagmites that were like teeth in a bottom jaw, creating bars over the opening. He stared at them, trying to find an angle he could squeeze through. Rebecca came and kneeled beside him. Got something? Maybe, if I can work out how to get it. He eased in against one of the stone columns. Oh, please, Rebecca said. She grabbed the calcium carbonate pillars and tugged. One, as thick as an arm, broke off. Matt looked at her, horrified. She snorted. What? We came down here to blow a hole in these caves if need be, remember? He grimaced, knowing she was right. Thanks. He leaned in again, using his flashlight to extend his arm another foot to scrape at the object. It broke off and tumbled down the wall, rolling toward him. He grabbed it and turned it over, his excitement abating. Rebecca crowded in close. What is it? He held it out. Pretty jewel for a pretty lady? It was a crystal pressed into some glittering pyrite, perfectly formed like the end of a large diamond. She sighed. Nice, but no cigar. In another half hour they had exhausted all the obvious caves, nooks, and crannies, most had been well and truly turned over by archaeologists over the centuries. Matt rested on his haunches as he sipped from his canteen. We're not looking at this right. Rebecca glanced around. We should have expected that any new passages would be hidden. We could do with some stratigraphic sonars to penetrate the rock. Yep. He nodded slowly staring toward the dark end of the cave where Thompson had disappeared. I'm guessing it's a bit late to ask Vangelis, so let's think laterally. Imagine we're here a few thousand years ago. The only technology we have is burning torches. We've scaled down here in the darkness, using ropes and clambering along slippery walls. This place would be as scary as hell. In fact, a lot of early cultures thought these passages were a path to hell. She nodded, following his train of thought. Go on. We know there were probably other paths into the cave, which have since collapsed or been flooded. We also know the early inhabitants of the island were good fishermen and not afraid of water. If you wanted to keep something hidden or stay hidden yourself... The best place would be somewhere that's difficult to get to. Matt shone his light towards Thompson, now a hundred feet away in the enormous lake. When Reese entered the pool, he stirred up mud, and I immediately told him not to do that, to keep the water clear. What if the clues we need to find are below the mud? She shrugged. 
It's possible. It's the only thing left that makes sense. Matt waved their Greek minder over. Tony, we need to search under the mud. Anything that might indicate another cave. Tony didn't look keen. Like what? A door handle or something? He frowned in confusion. Matt shrugged. At this point, just anything that shouldn't be there naturally. We're still looking for fresh gouges or tumbled rocks, but man-made. Tony grunted in understanding and turned, whistling sharply. Petro, Andronas, in the water now. A rapid-fire conversation in Greek took place for a few moments, with Tony raising his voice at his men. Eventually, with a lot of cursing and grumbling, the two Greeks pulled goggles down over their faces and sloshed into the water. There was no need to tell them not to worry about stirring up the mud. In a second, the water was like milky coffee. Matt pointed to the lake, then half bowed to Rebecca. After you. She pulled her goggles down, put the snorkel in her mouth, switched on her headlamp, and fell forward into the water. Matt stayed standing, watching them paddle off in different directions. The once pristine pond now resembled a hotel swimming pool in summer. He chose a different direction to others, waded into the water and swam out. All he could hear now was the sound of his breathing. Silt swirled around him, and even though the shallows were only a few feet deep, he had to feel his way along the bottom by hand, stopping from time to time to bring his flashlight in close to examine a raised surface or indentation. As he went deeper, the water cleared, and he saw stalagmites rising up from the depths, like terracotta warriors standing guard in a sunken city. Matt felt a chill run up his spine. He hated caves, hated the dark, and especially hated black water. He had witnessed men and women die horribly in caves. One man had been eaten from the inside out by a tiny carnivorous worm. Matt felt his groin contract at the thought of something swimming inside his wetsuit and into an open part of his body. He reached up and tugged the neck of his wetsuit tighter at his throat. Don't think about it. Don't think about it he repeated over and over. He trod water for a few seconds, pushed the snorkel away from his mouth, and lifted the scuba tank mouthpiece to his lips. He sucked the dry and metallic-tasting air into his lungs, then floated again, sighting down into the depths for a moment, before diving ten feet. Deeper, the water felt even more ominous. His lights were the only illumination in a world of dark liquid. He could hear the faint splashing of his fellow searchers, but his breathing was louder, and there was a faint pounding in his ears, caused by his racing heartbeat. Matt allowed himself to drift lower into a depression in the lake floor. He paused to repressurize his ears, and found himself hanging weightless between a pair of stalagmites, the giant columns would have originally formed on the dry cave floor, but flooding had submerged them long ago. He swam toward a wall made of large boulders covered in mosses, with silt piled against one side. A school of tiny fish shot past him to disappear into cracks between the boulders. As he watched, he saw some strands of lichen bend as if in a breeze. Promising he thought, and drifted lower. He bent forward to sweep his hand over the silt, a layer about six inches thick. Immediately it clouded his vision. He brought his face closer, ignoring the sliminess of the particles, and ran his hand over the cave floor beneath the silt. It was smooth. 
It could be flowstone or calcium carbonate that had run like melted wax over the eons. Or it could be something more. He carefully pushed more of the sludge out of the way, wishing he had an industrial underwater vacuum cleaner that could have sucked up a ton of muck in minutes. He brought his flashlight around. A glimpse of something white. He waved his hand in the water, trying to create a current to drag the silt away from where he was working. In another few seconds he saw it again, the flash of white. Matt felt his heartbeat kick up a gear, and he waved furiously at the water now, clearing more silt away. He could see tiles, small mosaics all fitted together, each no more than an inch square. They formed a structure, a floor. Other colors started to show, too. Matt turned, grabbed onto a column, and used his flippers to create a huge torrent that billowed the debris into huge clouds. His thighs burned, but he kept at it, eventually displaying a tiled section half a dozen feet wide and long. He was wrong. It wasn't a floor, but a path. And many of the newly exposed tiles were still vivid, protected by the oxygen-poor silt at the bottom of the deep pool. A face showed at the center of the path. It didn't belong to a dark-haired Minoan beauty or a bull-jumping athlete with bronzed muscles and aquiline nose. Instead, it was something designed to strike fear, or perhaps awe, into whoever saw it. The screaming face of the Gorgon, with writhing hair and the red-slitted eyes of a snake. Got you, Matt thought, as he let himself descend to the cave bottom. He used his hands like a snowplow, following the edge of the path until it met the wall. A huge column rose from the floor, blocking his way, but he could see a light current moving around its sides. He guessed the wall had probably collapsed many years before the cave flooded, and the column had grown up over its entrance. He looked upward, following the column to where it breached the water's surface about ten feet around. Doing a quick calculation, he estimated the column to be about five thousand years old, which made the time scale right. Matt let go of the column and drifted to the surface, immediately bumping his head on stone. The roof here was low. It was no wonder this end of the cave hadn't been fully explored. He dragged his mask from his face, and spat out the mouthpiece. Rebecca! Found it! Chapter 30 Jerry Harris's team were watching footage of the entity forming up on Crete's coast. It became larger, coalescing and solidifying, before flowing away from the shoreline. The new software allowed them to see the figure at the center of the mist. One of the technicians leaned back in his chair. Major Harris, it's beginning to pick up speed. Direction? Harris came and leaned on the man's desk. The man watched for another moment. So far, heading south. Seems to be making for the Psychro Caves, as expected. Speed twenty miles an hour, but moving up and down the scale, sometimes stopping, sometimes moving at over fifty. Harris pushed away from the desk. I'd better let Hammerson know his team's about to have company. Alex waved his team into cover and walked alone to the dark cave mouth. The iron gate swung open. He slowly turned to take in the surrounding ridges, rocky outcrops, and stands of trees. He signaled to Franks and pointed to two trucks pulled in behind a stand of trees. The hawk moved fast and low to the vehicles. Alex waved the others in as he returned to the cave mouth 
and stood staring into its depths. Franks rejoined the team, and they formed up around Alex. We're not far behind, Franks said. The Land Rover smells like Rebecca's deodorant. The flatbed has some diving and excavation equipment on the back, but nothing to indicate who drove it here. One thing's for sure, it wasn't Borshov. The guy stinks like a vodka-soaked grizzly. Sam motioned to the cave entrance. Boss, anything? Alex nodded. They're already down there. Matt, Rebecca, and Thompson. Also another group of men. Large, but not special forces. He continued to stare into the cave, his eyes narrowing. He could sense hopelessness, fear, and a thousand captive souls swirling about in the Stygian darkness. He thought about the last time he'd entered a cave, the horrors he'd seen, the people who'd died. You okay? Sam asked. Ghosts, Alec said. Thousands of them, all trapped down there. Sam snorted, but his face changed when he saw Alex's expression. Seriously? Alex nodded. This is the place Magira came from. He slapped the big hawk on the shoulder, feeling the mechanical frame. But we don't believe in ghosts, right? So let's join the party. He turned to Jackson and jerked a thumb at the truck. Grab anything you think we might need. The SAS soldier and the Hawks checked their weapons and secured everything else in close to their bodies, rigging for tight quarters. Alex pointed to a lip of stone over the entrance. Rogers, give me a peep. Rogers reached into a pocket for a silver dollar-sized black disc with a single lens at its center. He twisted it and stuck it to the stone. The motion sensor lens would activate on movement and send images to Rogers' visor screen. They now had eyes on their front door. Stay tight, fast and quiet, on me, Alex said, and waved them forward into the darkness. Colonel Jack Hammerson listened to Harris's report, thanked him, and hung up. His eyes narrowed as he thought through the options. He grunted and walked to his own screen to replay the relayed data feeds and view the GPS map. Current estimates gave Alex and the team about an hour before Magira arrived. There was now a no-fly zone over all of the Mediterranean, and communications had become useless the moment the Hawks went deep below ground. There was nothing Hammerson could do except trust his team were up to the task. Storm coming your way fast, Arcadian. Good luck. Matt sat on the rocks close to the walkway railing. Mask pushed up onto his forehead. Rebecca and Reese Thompson squatted beside him as he explained what he'd found. The three Greeks stood nearby, listening in. I don't think we can get to it to plant charges, he said. We might need to blow the stalagmites in columns first. Thompson shook his head. Not a great idea to be setting off multiple charges in an area that's structurally compromised. This place has already collapsed once in the last few centuries. Rebecca nodded. It only flooded two hundred years ago. The pool was little more than a pond in Minoan times. There was also reference to a current after heavy rain. A current? Matt's eyebrows shot up. Maybe a river ran through here once, now sealed off. Tony flicked a cigarette butt into the pool. It hissed once before going out. Matt compressed his lips as he watched it bob on the surface, releasing minute amounts of ash into the pristine water. Tony shrugged. We blow it. That's what we came here for. What else we gonna do? Go home with our fucking dicks in our hands? He winked at Rebecca. 
I so want to marry a man like that one day, she said under her breath to Matt, and pretended to gag. Thompson looked out over the water. Risky. Matt nodded. I agree. We need to think about it. Tony snorted. Petro is good at demolition work. Cars, buildings, people. He saluted Petro, who returned the gesture with a small bow. Thompson got to his feet. Fine. We'll wait outside while you bury yourselves alive. Tony laughed and held up his hands, palms up. Sorry, sorry. I mean, you blow it. He grinned. Happy now, fucking Prince Charlie? Thompson squared his stance. Ain't gonna happen unless the professor says so. And if he says it's too dangerous, then we work another option. Matt saw that Andronus and Petro suddenly had guns hanging loosely in their hands. They didn't look directly at Thompson, but stood side on. Matt knew what they were doing, presenting a small target just in case things went bad. What? The professor is a demolition expert now, Tony sneered. I suggest you get down there and have a look, Mr. Soldier. You are here for one reason, to fucking blow things up. Why don't you stick with plan A until it's been proved wrong? Thompson half turned to Matt and said quietly, Get ready to jump. I can take one or two, but if they're quick, they might get lucky. Matt knew what that meant. If they got lucky, it meant Matt, Rebecca, and Thompson would get unlucky and take a hit. Matt felt light-headed at how fast things were spinning out of control. He got slowly to his feet and held up his hands, calming things down. He knew they didn't have time for a standoff. Let's just everyone take a breath? Maybe Tony's right. I'm no demolition expert. So maybe we should have another look. Tony scoffed. Maybe we just forget about this partnership. You got your C4 and you showed us where the entrance to the secret cave is. Deal's over. You are right. We will blow it ourselves and you can go home. He grinned at his comrades. Go home, go to hell, we don't care. You're dead first. Thompson's expression was dark as he stared at Tony. Then he paused as if listening and began to smile. Tony's gun barrel was suddenly pointing at Rebecca's chest. One gun against three. Not good odds for you. Put down your weapon, or the girl is dead. First. Matt wondered why Thompson was smiling, then saw that several figures had appeared high on the steps behind the three Greeks, as silent as ghosts. One shape broke away, moving so fast it seemed to disappear momentarily, then reappear right behind the three gunmen. Matt's spirit soared. There would be no standoff, after all. Put your guns down, Alex told the Greeks. Petro spun, and either reflexively or through shock brought his gun up. Alex's hand shot out, taking the weapon so quickly that Petro was left blinking at his empty hand. Andronus staggered back, his arms pinwheeling, and fell over the railing into the water. Tony cursed, went to aim, then thought better of it. Alex grabbed him, dragging him close so their faces were only a few inches apart. The Greek slowly turned his head to Matt. Tell him we are friends, okay? Friends, Matt said. You were about to shoot us. Alex lifted Tony off his feet, one-handed. He screamed, his voice bouncing around in the cave, his legs kicking uselessly in the air. 
It's okay. We'll need them, Matt said. Alex lowered him, his eyes burning into the Greeks. Tony looked away. Alex pushed him out of the way and leaped over the rail to join Matt, Thompson, and Rebecca. Making friends with the locals, I see, he said. Sam and Barkley Jackson came down to stand behind Petro, while Franks pulled Andronos out of the water. The big newcomers dwarfed the Greeks. Thompson saluted, and Alex returned the gesture, followed by a bump of the knuckles. Took your time, Thompson said with a half-smile. Heard you ran into some nasty shit in Turkey. Alex nodded. Lost a good man. And now that nasty shit is on its way to Crete. We need to stop it, pronto. He motioned to the water. Find anything? Yes, but we've got a problem, Matt said. I think we found Magira's lair, but we can't get close enough to it. And we're worried too many underwater explosions will weaken the cave structure. He looked up at the ceiling. We might be able to get away with one, but... He shrugged. Alex squatted at the water's edge, peering into its depths. He dipped a hand in and ran it up the pool's edge. This used to be shallower. Is it filling? It was probably ten feet lower two hundred years ago. Rebecca said. It's filled from rain seepage. Back in the early 1800s, they used explosives to open up some areas and cause some fissuring. Rainwater seeps in now but can't get out. Seems they also managed to block up the outflow areas. Alex stood. And where are they? What? Matt frowned. The outflow areas. Alex looked up and down the cave. Matt sucked in a breath, thinking. My guess... He looked around for a second or two, then pointed. Probably down there. It's the side where the river comes out from under the ground on the lower slopes. Alex shrugged the equipment off his back, grabbed Matt's goggles off his head, and walked into the water. I'll take a look. Give me five minutes. Alex stroked hard to the end of the cave, and then dived beneath the water. Matt turned to Rebecca, who raised her eyebrows. We have a new plan? He grinned. Maybe. In a few minutes, Alex surfaced and pushed his goggles up. He breaststroked back to the pool's edge. I think we might have something. Big boulder against the wall, like a cork. If we can move it, we might be able to restart the flow. Maybe even drain this bathtub. Empty the pool? Is there any other... Matt stopped and grimaced at the thought of what they were about to do. What they had to do. To the Psycho Cave pool. He sighed. Okay, but how? Well, if we can't use explosives... Alex looked across at Sam. We use a forklift. He stood up. Okay, Uncle, you and me are up. We got some rocks to move, and I'm dying to see what that full mech suit can do. Sam snorted and dropped his kit, then took off his shirt. Oh, my God! Matt's mouth fell open. Sam looked like something from either the future or a torture chamber. There were pipes, pistons, and tubing covering his combat-hardened physique, with spots of blood showing where the needles had penetrated his nervous system. Thompson handed Sam a breathing tank and some goggles, then looked him over. Bad. Pure bad. Sam grinned. Time to see if it's waterproof. Alex watched as Sam walked into the water, sinking lower and lower. There was no way he was going to float while carrying several hundred pounds of technology. 
Alex swam toward the dark area of the lake, where Matt had found the mosaic. He peered down into the pristine water and saw the tumbled boulders, some the size of cars, some as small as loaves of bread. All were coated in slime and fine mineral sand that sparkled in his headlamp. He heard Sam coming up behind him and swiveled to see the amazing sight of his big lieutenant walking along the bottom of the lake as if taking a Sunday stroll. Sam saluted and Alex dived down to join him. He ran his hands over one of the rocks, roughly about five feet long and four high, and easily many tons. Even though Alex had enormous strength, the boulder had been wedged in place for several centuries, and the rocks around it had bonded together. He pointed to the large rock and then to Sam, indicating he would take one end and Sam the other. The big man nodded and moved into place. They looked at each other, and Alex nodded. One, two, three. He strained and felt the blood rush in a thumping torrent throughout his system. Above the pulse in his ears, he heard the whine of Sam's suit and his grunt as he used the mech technology and his own muscles together. Despite their combined efforts, nothing happened. There wasn't enough room to get a good purchase on the huge stone. Alex held up five fingers to Sam, then swam back to the surface. He quick-stroked to the edge of the pool and stood, waist-deep in the water. He pointed to the pile of equipment. Franks, toss me the spike. Franks lifted the inch-thick, six-foot metal rod with a single sharpened end. It looked like a brutal javelin. She hefted it to her shoulder, nodding appreciatively. Heads up! She threw it like a spear, and Alex caught it out of the air, instantly feeling its weight. Perfect, he thought, and sank once more below the surface. He smiled around his breathing tube as he saw Sam sitting casually on the huge rock ten feet down. Sam gave Alex the thumbs up and once again took his position on one side of the boulder. He dug his fingers deep into the crack between the boulders, and Alex lifted the spike, and with all his strength stabbed down, wedging the sharpened end between the stones. He looked to Sam and counted down once more. There was a grinding sound, and rock fragments swirled in the water, but even with their boosted power the stone refused to budge. Alex motioned Sam closer, and together they worked on just one end. Alex withdrew the spike and jammed it back in at a different spot. This time it slid in deep between the stones. The sparkling mineral sand swirled, and sludge lifted from the bottom of the pool to mix with it around their legs. A basketball-sized rock tumbled down from higher up the wall. Alex paused and looked to Sam. He nodded the countdown from three again, and together they gave an almighty heave. There was the whine of the metal bar bending, then a huge cracking sound as the rocks, joined for centuries, moved. The pair heaved even harder, and the massive rock slid forward, then rolled. Above it, smaller rocks started to tumble, but falling inward instead of down. A dark hole was revealed, and what started as a gentle current flowing into it soon became a torrent. Alex guessed the water was racing toward another underground cavern, or would spout out of the mountain to become a river flowing down its sides. He felt himself lifted and sucked toward the hole. One of Sam's hands shot out, and grabbed him by the wrist. With the other, Sam had anchored himself to another large stone, the weight of the mech suit allowing him to resist the powerful drag of the water. Alex felt like a flag in a strong wind as he held onto Sam, his legs inside the hole. 
the torrent rushing past him on its way to the valley, miles below. It took twenty minutes before the pool had drained to waste level, and Alex could pull himself out of the mouth of the tunnel and crawl up onto the stones above the lake. Sam joined him. They pushed their masks up and bumped fists. Sam nudged him. I figured you didn't really want to see where that water was going. Alex laughed softly and looked toward the hole. The rush of water was a monstrous growl, falling away into the dark. He recalled another mission when he'd been trapped underwater in the dark, and his stomach lurched. When he stood again, the water was only at his calves and still draining into the hole. Sam used the spike to move more stones out of the way, allowing the pool to empty more quickly. Matt and Rebecca were quick to join them, sloshing through what remained of the water. Matt peered into the hole, then stood back. Well, I guess if they want to refill the pool, they only need to seal this back up. No real damage done. Rebecca chortled. Let's just be long gone before the guides get here in the morning. Works for me, Alex said. Now, Professor, show us what you found. Chapter 31 Carlo Vangelis blinked in the dark and sat up. His huge bed was unruffled by his night's sleep. He never tossed and turned, was never troubled by ticks, twitches, or dreams. But he was a light sleeper a habit developed during his early life on the streets of Crete. If you didn't want to die while sleeping rough or in a doss house, you had to remain on guard. He looked around the room at the heavy antique furniture, a wardrobe, dressing table, desk, and the huge four-poster bed he slept in. French, four hundred years old and weighing as much as a small car. He frowned, wondering what had woken him. Lingering underneath the familiar smell of sandalwood and expensive aftershave, he detected another odor. Unpleasant. He'd get the cleaners to have a look later in the day. He glanced across at the clock. It was still too early to rise. He lay back down, and almost immediately a huge hand clamped over his mouth. The intruder had been behind him the entire time. He was pulled from the bed as if he weighed nothing, punched in the stomach, and thrown to the ground. He lay there, the wind knocked out of him. A rival gang? he wondered. Where were his men? He got on all fours, straining to drag in a breath. A hand grabbed his thick white hair and pulled him up, and up. A massive ogre was holding him like a marionette doll. The giant had one eye, a dark beard, and a face that spoke of a psychopathic attraction to pain. Vangelis knew that look. There would be no mercy from this man. He could only hope his men would hear his screams. The voice was deep and Russian. Your guards are all gone. I cut their throats. Vangelis felt his stomach drop. His survival instincts took over. I have a safe with a lot of money in it. There was also a gun hidden behind the cash. The giant shook him by the hair, causing him to cry out. Keep your money, little mafia man. I only want one thing. Where did you take American professor? A wicked-looking black blade appeared beside Vangelis's face. I only ask once. The knife tip dug into his cheek. Matt led the others to the huge column rising from the floor of the cave to the ceiling twenty feet above it. It and its smaller siblings each side formed a massive barrier across the mosaic path. 
He got down on his knees and used his hand to wipe away the remaining silt, exposing more of the tiles. The face appeared in all its horror. The screaming gorgon with writhing hair and red snake eyes. Pretty, isn't she? Frank said, as she looked at the vicious face. Not even I'd go that. Gorgon, Matt said softly. The word means dreadful in ancient Greek. Alex stared, transfixed. He knew this was the thing he'd encountered in the desert, but if he had seen it, he'd now be nothing but a crumbling block of stone among the sand. At the time, he had felt the anger and loneliness of something that didn't fit in or even belong among us. Perhaps he knew a little of what that was like. Rebecca stared. I still can't believe it's real. Well, we're here to see what we can do to put it back to sleep, Alex said. He examined the huge column, then looked up. He shook his head. If we knock this down, it could pull the whole roof down on top of us. He backed up. Maybe if we knock out a few of the smaller ones, we might be able to squeeze through. It'll be a tight fit, but we can do it. Sam rubbed his head. Just how tight a fit? Alex looked at him and grinned. Suck it in, big guy. It took only twenty minutes to dig out one of the small stalagmites and chip away some of the central column to create a three-foot-wide hole. Matt and Rebecca were first through, followed by Casey Franks, then the two SAS soldiers. Alex, Sam, Ben Rogers, and the three Greeks remained on the other side. Tony saluted, still grinning, but nervously. No hard feelings, he edged back to the guard rail. Alex grabbed him and pushed him toward the hole. You're coming too. Your men can stay here on guard duty. Alex glared at them. Got it? They refused to look at him, so he lifted Tony with one hand and shook him. Got it? His voice boomed around the cave. Both nodded vigorously. Sam growled, Be here when we come back, or else. They nodded again. Alex pushed Tony toward the hole, and he clambered through, cursing softly. Alex turned to Ben Rogers. We need the back door kept open. Don't want these two thinking they can try out some dopey ambush when we come back. He looked back toward the surface, many hundred feet overhead, then added, lowering his voice, And keep an eye on the peep. We're still expecting company. Rogers smiled. I'll keep our friends out of trouble and watch the surface. Door will be open when you get back, boss. Good luck. Sam pulled his huge body and the mech suit's steel framework through the hole, scraping away a lot more of the stone. Alex turned to give Rogers a thumbs up and followed Sam through. At the cave entrance, Borshov's Spetsnaz took up positions either side of the gate, staying well back. Borshov crouched, a single lens to his eye. Camera, on top of cave, he said. One of his men lifted his AK-12 to his eye. The black assault rifle was a significantly enhanced Kalashnikov series weapon, and in the agent's hands deadly accurate. The rifle spat once, and the small camera exploded into shards. Quick now, Borshov ordered. He knew the speed with which the device had been destroyed would make the operator think it had malfunctioned. But if he came to check, they needed to make first contact. Borshov and his men sprinted into the cave, Borshov's feet pounding heavily under the extra weight of the mech suit.
Matt was first to the wall, laying his hands against it. This section of the tunnel was roughly fifteen feet wide and just as long, stopping at the perfectly smooth wall of flowstone. It glistened, and when Matt held his light up to it, he could just make out more depth beyond the natural barrier. There was something behind it. Probably created long before the water filled the pool, Rebecca said. It's a flowing shelf of limestone that's dripped down over the entrance and literally sealed it closed. She walked backward, looking along its top and sides. Might be a foot thick, but that's not too bad as calcium carbonate is fairly soft. She turned to Alex and raised her eyebrows. Can you dig through it? Hey! Casey Franks moved her boots sideways along the floor. More of those picture tiles on the ground here. The team crowded around her, shining their torches on the small tiled pathway. As they brushed aside the silt, more images were revealed. Flames, huge urns filled with coins, other unidentifiable objects. Matt frowned, wishing he'd brought a camera. When he saw a huge beast the size of an ox, with three horned heads, holding the body of a man in one of its slavering jaws, he recognized it immediately. Cerberus, he said. Sam whistled. That is one damned mother of a dog. Damned is right, Matt said. Cerberus was the protector of Hades. He pushed away more of the silt, showing the creature's monstrous, muscled body, covered with what looked like scales, multiple legs, and a reptilian tail. "'Wasn't real, was it?' Franks asked, splashing water from her canteen over its head, clarifying the face and jaws. "'No, but neither is Magira, right?' Matt said slowly. He pointed. Look at the horns. What other horned beast do we know of that was supposed to live in a cave? The Minotaur, Sam said. This is going to be fun. If it ever did exist, it'll be dust now, Jackson said. Alex was examining the wall that blocked their path. Magira somehow reformed when it was released from its prison after eons, and survived thermobaric grenades and hundreds of armor-piercing rounds. He half-turned. Franks, get me the spike we left outside. On it. Franks disappeared back through the hole. Rebecca kneeled and laid her hand on one of the snarling faces. I've been thinking about what you said about Magira melting away in the sunlight, she told Alex. This thing, it doesn't seem to be made the same way we are, out of trillions of cells, each with its own function and purpose. Franks returned and handed Alex the long spike. He nodded to her, but leaned on the spike, listening to the scientist. Rebecca stood, wiping her hands on her thighs, New research has shown that some insects follow the same biological rules as individual creatures, which makes their colonies more like a super-organism. Ants, bees, termites, wasps. Their controlled interactions are like cells working together in a single body. She folded her arms, her eyes focused inward as she thought through what she was saying. So, imagine... This Magira thing is made up of cells, just like us. But each cell is more than just a self-functioning amino acid factory, and more like this super-organism entity. What if Magira's cells are capable of taking care of themselves individually, but work together as a whole when it suits? Alex shook his head. I got the impression of a single entity. And it was solid, powerful. Rebecca nodded. Maybe the single entity shape is its usual formation. 
Each of our cells contains all the information needed to create another one of us. But Magira's cells might go a step further, in that they're a multi-celled organism acting as a collective. Sam exhaled loudly. So is it one creature or an army of millions? Rebecca shrugged. I'm just guessing here, but we might know soon if we can get through there. She pointed to the wall. Alex grunted. Right about now everything helps, even good guesses. He lifted the spike. Make room, people. Time to see where Magira came from. He jammed the spike into the wall, once, twice, and then again, before punching through. Gas escaped through the hole, making everyone back away. Rebecca gagged. Don't breathe it in, Matt said behind his hand. It was airtight. He put his entire arm across his face and backed up further, pulling the still coughing Rebecca with him. Alex held his breath and stepped in close, shining a light into the three-inch hole he had made. Clear, he said, turning his head away and sucking in a deep breath. The stone must have flowed over it completely, like a wax seal on a bottle. Upside is it'll be dry inside, and anything in there should be preserved. That's an upside, Sam said and snorted. Alex turned back and sniffed. It's stale, not toxic. Can't detect any explosive gases. But it smells... strange. He sniffed some more. Kind of... primordial. Tony's nose wrinkled. Smells like a freaking zoo. He shone his flashlight into the small hole. Nobody home, that's a good thing. Let's go take a look, Alex said. He motioned Tony away, then jammed the spike into the hole again and again, working it in a circle to make it man-sized. He turned to Matt. After you. Matt lifted his flashlight to the hole. His hand shook slightly, making the beam wobble. Part of him, the curious, adventurous, and scientific part, wanted to dive through and hurtle like a bloodhound into the mysterious cave, seeking answers to age-old questions of myth, religion, and strange creatures. But the other part, the experienced part, wanted to flee back to the surface, back to the safety of sunlight and fresh air. That was the part that had been in caves before, and that was the part that had seen what can exist below the earth's fragile outer skin. He sucked in a deep breath. The farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see. Thanks, Winston, he thought, as he steadied himself. Matt stepped through. Chapter 32 Hawk Lieutenant Ben Rogers stood with arms folded, cradling his rifle. The smell of drying slime from the drained lake thickened the air. Soon it would become so dominating that he knew it would overpower his sense of smell, making it useless. As a hawk, he relied on every sense, every limb, every angle and sharp edge of his body, in both defense and attack. Nothing was ever left idle. His life depended on it. He turned to the two Greeks. Both were looking at him, but turned away sullenly when he caught them. They spoke softly to each other, obviously still pissed about getting a job that left them standing at the bottom of a stinking cave. And smoking. Always smoking. Rogers looked up at the steel walkways and steps leading back to the cave entrance. He guessed he must be about ten stories down. The lighting had been strategically placed to give a theatrical effect, 
and highlight the more impressive structures. For tourists, the lighting would be an excellent feature. For a special forces soldier, it created too many shadows. He walked a few paces into the center of the dry pool, between where the Greeks loitered and where Alex and the team had disappeared into the wall. He looked again at the two men. Both seemed tough and capable, but they were amateurs. They'd be fine against other amateurs, but against professionals, he doubted they'd last twenty seconds. He sucked in a deep breath and turned away again. There came a sound from high overhead, and he froze. The Greeks didn't notice, continuing to laugh and talk loudly, as if they were in a local bar. Shut up, Rogers ordered, and backed up a step. Both men looked from him to each other and hiked their shoulders, comically mouthing, What? Rogers held up a finger close to his lips. The Greeks, sensing his unease, drew weapons. The sound came again, still high overhead, and then one of the lights went out. In quick succession, the sound came again and again, and more lights winked out, the darkness marching down toward them. Rogers put a finger to the small comm stud in his ear. Boss, we got company. He got nothing but a hiss of static, too much rock between them. Gun up, he slowly moved one hand to his helmet, pulled down the visor, and switched on the image reproduction technology. As a hawk, he had faced death dozens of times, and he was still standing. He liked to think he didn't know fear anymore. But now, as he waited to see if Magira's image came up on his visor screen, something cold and dreadful crept up his spine. He sucked in a breath, calming himself. The final lights went out. The Greeks started to whisper. One lit a cigarette and kept the lighter on, holding up the flame. The other cursed, slapped at it, and turned on a flashlight instead. Roger's visor remained black. He willed the image to appear so he had a target. He heard Andronus grunt, and, out the corner of his eye, saw him disappear. He turned in time to see Petro's head explode in a mass of red and white bone fragments. Rogers quickly pushed up the visor and brought down his night vision scope, but it was too late. Borshov put his foot on the hawk's chest and ripped off his helmet. The man's eyes were open and his face was calm. Both his shoulders and legs had taken bullets, full incapacitation. The American's expression of resignation told Borshov he already knew he was finished. The big Russian shook his head. Don't worry, I won't torture you. He grinned. Only because I don't have time. He grabbed the hawk on each side of the head, his fingers digging into the flesh, and dragged him up so he could stare into his face. This is for my men in Turgotlu. Rogers smiled. You're already dead, asshole. You just don't know it. Borshov snorted. But not before you, I think. He pressed. There was a soft whine as the electronics and hydraulics of the mech suit came into play. Roger's teeth ground together, and his eyes showed determination for a second or two, before they bulged with excruciating pain. Borshov pushed harder, the super-alloy pistons responding to his brain's commands immediately. There was a crack, then a wet crushing sound that echoed around the cave. Roger's head collapsed in the big Russian's hands. Ha! Borshov let go 
and flicked his hands to remove blood and brain matter, then wiped his fingers on the American's armor suit. One by one, all little hawks fly back to hell. He motioned to his men. Like wraiths, the black-clad Spetsnaz moved lightly across the drained pool toward the newly opened cave. Ghosts on their way down to Hades. This smells like crap, Frank said. She'd taken the lead, and Alex could see she was trying to breathe through her mouth. I smell oil, he said. Perhaps some methane mixed in. We're suddenly deep enough. He stopped to wait for Matt and Rebecca. They were still fifty paces back, studying the mosaic frescoes that covered the walls of the cave. The tiles were perfectly preserved and vividly colored, and probably looked the same as they had over five thousand years ago. Matt and Rebecca were like children let loose in a toy store. Sam caught up to Alex. Might be methane, might not. It's getting too hot for explosive gases. Well, we'll know soon enough, Alex said. Keep an eye on our Greek friend. We don't want him slipping away if anything unexpected happens. You got it, boss. Alex whistled and waved Matt and Rebecca forward. Matt waved back, and they both picked up their pace, but their eyes still darted around, trying to take in everything around them. Occasionally, Rebecca ran her hand along the walls, as if feeling the texture of the stone. The mosaics were amazingly detailed and painstakingly put together. Some of the chips were so tiny they were little more than grains, giving the characters a lifelike effect. In the fresco next to Alex, men and women, their hair in the long, thick, curling Minoan style, kneeled in front of four huge beings, holding up urns, cloth, and jewelry. The figures were clothed, but not in the same style as the Minoans, and their hair was alive with movement. Behind them was a gigantic white ball, possibly a representation of the moon or sun, Alex thought. Matt and Rebecca caught up and turned their lights onto the image. Matt leaned in closer to examine the figures. There were three gorgons of legend, Stheno, Uriale, and the most famous Medusa. There have been stories of gorgon-like creatures dating back thousands of years, though. From right here, onto Russia, Japan, and across Europe. Other than Medusa, who was killed by Perseus, all of them simply vanished from history. He moved his light to a different angle. There was never any reference to a fourth gorgon. Seems Magira is an anomaly, a myth within a myth. A myth that's still alive, Alex said. Matt stepped back. We don't know that, or not alive as we know it anyway. We don't even know if it's the only one, Alex said, and shook his head. I don't even want to think about that possibility. There's so much about the Minoans that's a mystery, Matt said. They were technological leaders of the world, so why did they disappear? He looked again at the white sphere. And what's that? They supposedly lived down here, in the underworld. No astral bodies down here. Maybe that's not what it is. Rebecca fished in her pocket and pulled out a small flashlight with a thick blue end. Let me try something. Turn off your lights, people. Matt looked at Alex and shrugged. Everyone switched off their torches, plunging the cave into total darkness. Rebecca switched on her new flashlight, and the wall glowed blue. Wow. UV, right? Matt asked. Yep. Rebecca moved the beam around. The entire area shone like a neon light. Is this a common effect? 
Alex asked. Rebecca shook her head, her face glowing blue in the reflected light. Not usually. Fluorescence in rocks occurs when there are a number of activators present, impurities within the mineral, crystal structural defects, organic impurities, or what I suspect, the result of significant gamma radiation. Gamma? Alex asked. Down here? She nodded. Occurs all around us, but at insignificant quantities. Of course, there's much more outside the Earth's atmospheric shell. Natural sources of gamma rays on Earth include gamma decay from naturally occurring radioisotopes, radium and so on, and secondary radiation from atmospheric interactions with cosmic ray particles. She turned to them. Or residue after a nuclear explosion, significant impact from space, or leakage from some sort of reactor. Impact from space? Reactor? Matt's eyebrows went up. So my space helmet theory wasn't so crazy, huh? She shrugged. Not necessarily. You've got to admit it's weird. So far, everything down here is weird, Matt said, and flicked his light back on. Well, I'm now moving my theory to the definite maybe list. He wiped his brow. Phew, it's got to be over a hundred degrees down here. We must be near some sort of volcanic activity. Boss! It was Frank's. She was out of sight, several hundred feet ahead, scouting. Check this out. Alex turned to Matt and Rebecca. Stay close. No lagging behind now. He jogged to meet Franks, rounding the bend. Whoa! He eased back. The cave ended at a sheer drop-off. To their left, stairs were cut into the stone, leading down to the floor about two hundred feet below. Frank stood out to the side, looking over the edge. She pointed. Now we know where the heat's coming from. There were pools of black oil, some burning, obviously pure enough to ignite from the deeper volcanic vents from the heart of the earth. The roof of the cavern was way out of sight, probably the reason they hadn't been overwhelmed by the build-up of gases. Sam appeared behind them, and Alex held him back. Not too close, big guy. Your weight could cause the edge to crumble. They all fanned out, staying back from the drop-off. Wow and wow! Matt shook his head, his mouth hanging open. You do know what this is, don't you? Hades, Rebecca said slowly. He chuckled. Hey, thanks for spoiling my dramatic finish. He stepped forward to peer over the edge. Could this be any more perfect? An underground space of fire, heat, and... a village. The single broad street of paved tiles, their rich red patina perfectly preserved was lined with small, flat-topped, single-story houses, each about ten feet square. On the other side of the village, the ground fell away into an even deeper chasm of darkness. On the surface of the street, scattered in between the buildings, something glittered. Alex concentrated his vision. Gold. Gold coins. Huh? Tony reached for Frank's scope. Piss off, she said, nudging him away, and he teetered near the edge for a moment. Sam pointed across the pit. What the hell is that? Sure ain't been knowing. On the far side, embedded in the cliff wall, was an enormous bowl-like structure. Steps led up to it, and a platform, or perhaps an altar, had been constructed at its edge. Just like in the mosaic, Rebecca whispered. Matt held his arms wide. 
and the stars shall fall, and the gods will ride them to earth. Rebecca's grin nearly split her face. I agree. Aristotle wrote that over 2,300 years ago. He was said to have had insights into the future, and now I see why. She started for the steps. We need to get over there to examine it. Alex pulled her back. Not yet. Looks like there might be some of Magira's handiwork down there. Behind the village was a forest of stalagmites, rising up in rows, and between them, in their hundreds, were magnificently detailed statues. Alex knew now that there were people. Everything down in the village, the figures, the walls of the houses, and the stalagmites, were covered in strange growths that looked like bulbous coral. He looked at the steps, then tried a couple with his own weight. They seem solid, but watch your step, he told Rebecca. The light is poor, and it'll make the shadows deceptive. He waved his hawks over. Take us down, Franks. Greek, you're next. Then you, Thompson. Then me, Rebecca, Matt, and Jackson. You bring up the rear, Sam. Alex pushed his rifle up over his shoulder. Okay, let's... He froze, staring down into the village. Something had moved down there, fast. He replayed the split-second glimpse of the thing over in his mind. He had an impression of a long body, multiple legs, and a coat that seemed to shimmer, not fur or hair, maybe some kind of bony plating. The hawks and two SAS men shouldered their guns, training them around the interior of the cavern. Jackson nudged Thompson. What the fuck's going on? Thompson shrugged. Hunter probably hears something we can't, so we pay attention. Jackson snorted. Freak. Sam edged closer to Alex, who still stood frozen, like he'd become part of the stone around them. What you got, boss? Movement. End of the street. Fast. I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. Silence hung as the seconds stretched. No one moved or even seemed to breathe. My legs hurt, Tony whispered, but it was loud enough to create an echo. Alex shook his head. Nothing now. His senses still screamed at him. Something was there, but what? We'll know soon enough, he thought. We're at alert level one, people. He pointed to Casey Franks. Take us down to hell, Lieutenant. Borshov's two remaining Spetsnaz slid through the hole Alex had broken in the flowstone wall. They scouted the area, then quickly formed up as Borshov followed them. The giant Russian stood with his head turned slightly, his one good eye moving quickly over the adorned walls and mosaic floor tiles. He didn't bother appreciating the aesthetics of the artisan's work, instead focusing on the footprints, their direction and probable speed. One of his Spetsnaz kneeled to examine the tracks. How many? Borshov asked quietly. The man stood. Eight. He pointed to some large, deep prints. One big, very big, must be carrying something heavy. Borshov grunted. Like me. He circled his finger, and the three moved silently down the tunnel. Chapter 33 the stocky female hawk started quickly down the steep steps. The rest followed, but their descent was slow. Sam took the longest, not from any lack of agility, 
but because his foot placement was critical, given his size and the dead weight of the mech suit. He found out very early that a misstep crumbled the ancient carved stonework from right underneath him. At the bottom, Alex half-turned to Matt and Rebecca. Get in behind us. He pointed two fingers at Sam and Franks, then left and right. The two hawks spread out, keeping low, and took up positions in the paved street. Alex walked a dozen feet into the center of the street, his gun up. Tony bent to scoop up coins, loading his pockets. Matt picked up a few coins, too, and turned them over to show Rebecca. Silver, gold, very old, not perfect, hand-cut. Rebecca took one from him. I've seen these in museums, but never of this quality. They've probably lain here untouched for thousands of years. She frowned at the various images on the coins, the gorgon's terrifying face, a horned bull, a snarling dog. Looks like these were specially made, as offerings, perhaps. Matt nodded. Tribute to the gods, or the gorgons. Something swooped low over their heads, ruffling Matt's hair. Jesus Christ! He dropped to the ground, pulling Rebecca with him. Alex turned and fired in one motion. The thing dropped to the tiled street. Casey Franks was first over it, nudging it with her toe. Looks like a giant freaking bat. Was this what you saw before? Sam asked Alex. He shook his head. I think the thing I saw was bigger, much bigger. He used the barrel of his gun to turn the creature's head towards him. But just as ugly. The thing did look like a bat, with a snub nose, long ribbed ears, and needle-sharp teeth. But instead of a bat's elongated forearms with membranes stretched underneath, it had proper legs. On top of its head were six eyes, making it look more like a spider than a mammal. Rebecca dropped to her knees beside it and pulled out a small knife to prod at the carcass. This thing has lived down here a long time, probably hundreds of thousands of years. It's undergone some kind of evolutionary deformation. She levered open its mouth, showing another row of sharp teeth inside the first. Franks leaned closer. Look at those teeth. Two sets. That thing bites you, you'd never get it off. I'm not sure it's a bat, Rebecca said. I think it might have been some sort of rodent once. Looking at the teeth, I'd say it's definitely a carnivore. Carnivorous flying rats. Nice. Frank snorted. What the hell does it eat down here? Rebecca stood and looked around, then pointed to one of the columns coated in the greenish sponge Alex had noticed earlier. Not sure. But those growths, plants or fungi, might be the basis for a food chain. There might be something in it that caused the deformity, too. Alex turned slowly. There was near silence in the huge cavern, and also just beyond the red gloom of the fires, there was nothing but darkness. But he was nearly overwhelmed by the sensation of life, of scrutiny, and of danger. Alex waved Sam, Franks, and the two SAS soldiers in close. Stay with our guests. I'm going to scout ahead, check out the sphere. Stay sharp. He looked down at the dead creature. That thing leads me to believe there could be even larger predators down here. Alex turned to Matt. Find those words or weapons or whatever we need to stop Magira. I don't want to be down here any longer than we need to be. Matt waved without looking up, his focus back on the coins. 
Matt! Alex's voice caused Matt's head to jerk up fast. Huh, sorry. Oh, sure, we'll split up. I'll take the left side of the street. I'll go with you, Prof, Frank said and winked at him. Sam nodded to Rebecca. Looks like it's you and me, kid. He turned to Reese Thompson. Give us some eyes on the street. See you in ten. Thompson nodded, and he and Jackson eased into the shadow of one of the buildings. Sam turned to Tony. And you, stay where I can see you. Matt waited while Casey Franks peered into the gloom of the small house's interior. She'd pulled down her night vision after changing out of thermal scope, as the heat of the cavern floor exceeded 100 degrees, making everything in the environment a hellish red. She nodded, lowering her weapon only slightly. Clear, but stay close, pretty boy. Matt stepped inside and tilted his headlamp to look around the room. The terracotta color of the walls was still vivid, as were the frescoes of boxing and running youths. On a stone table sat urns and platters, some still with food on them. When Matt touched the food, it collapsed into dust. I think that was an apple, about five thousand years ago. Franks snorted. I still can't get my head around the thought of people actually living down here. I mean, why the fuck would you? As she spoke, she kept moving, her eyes on every corner of the room. Not sure, Matt said. Maybe there were priests living out their lives in solitude or in the service of their living God. He picked up a goblet, which immediately broke in half, the cup part falling to the floor with a clatter. Frank swung around and was down on one knee, the muzzle of her rifle pointed at Matt. Her eyes blazed. Jesus Christ, Kearns! You trying to get yourself shot? Matt grimaced, hands up. Sorry, sorry. He bent and picked up the broken goblet. This is lead, so probably didn't belong to a priest or official. He looked at the wall below the table and frowned. Something here. When he got close, he could see rows of words scratched into the wall, hundreds of them, but only one or two words per line. Looks like names. So many of them. He traced symbols next to the words. Also, Aegean numbers, some in the tens, some in the hundreds. Was that the number of days they were down here? What else could they be counting? You know who does that? Frank said. Prisoners on death row. They carve their name and sentence in their cell. Bit of a I was here type thing. Prisoners? Matt stood, frowning. Maybe. But the names, there are so many. Why would they be down here for so long? According to the numbers, this house was occupied for centuries, and by hundreds of people, men and women. Then they all just up and left, huh? Franks asked. They went somewhere. Matt looked out one of the small windows. The gloom was just lit by the hellish red glow from the burning oil. Dante's Inferno ever needs a location shoot, it's right here, Matt thought. If you're going through hell, keep going, he whispered. Churchill, Frank said over her shoulder. She turned briefly to wink. Yeah, we hawks have read a few books, at least about great military leaders. Maybe they didn't leave. Maybe it was Magira and the Gorgons that left, and the people had no reason to be here anymore. Franks grunted. Yeah, and maybe the freaking Gorgons just ran out of food. You think about that? Matt exhaled slowly. Yeah, I did think about that. 
Let's get out of here. This place gives me the creeps. They moved on to the next house. It was identical, as was the next one, again with evidence of many people over spans of years, like they were halfway houses. There was a larger building near the center of the row of houses. Once again, Franks was first in. After a few moments, she whistled for Matt to follow. She stood back, grinning. I'm no archaeologist, but even I can see this was the garrison. She gestured to the remains of sleeping bunks. Looks to have been about twenty of them stationed here. Matt nodded, his hands on his hips. You're right. I'll make a scientist of you yet. He paced around the room. It's also an armory. A rack of spears lined a wall. Shields, too, with the face of the Gorgon in relief. There were a few swords, many little more than hilts now, but a few had been heavily greased, retaining their polish and edge. Franks lifted one and slashed it through the air. Nice balance, but heavy, like a thick machete. Would have loved to see one of these babies in action. She stuck it in her belt. I'm taking it. Matt frowned. I don't get it. Judging by what we've seen so far, and the number of houses overall, there can't have been more than a hundred people living here at any one time. Not exactly the sort of crowd you need twenty guards for. Like I said, prisoners. Maybe these guys weren't just keeping the peace. They were keeping these poor saps down here. Matt sniffed the sulfurous air. You might be right. Not exactly a seaside resort, is it? Franks moved to the rear of the room and used the barrel of her gun to lift the lid of a coffin-shaped box. The lid and sides collapsed outwards, spewing forth a cascade of gold coins. Holy shit! King Midas, eat your heart out. Matt scooped some up. All brand new, uncirculated. Why'd they need their own currency down here? Franks asked. To buy what? Nothing makes sense. Matt shook his head. Nothing makes sense yet. Come on, let's try the next house. Alex jogged to the end of the ancient street. Except for sounds of his team searching the houses, all was silent. To him the village felt alive and dead at the same time. He expected to peek in a window and see a family sitting down and eating a meal. It reminded him of pictures he'd seen of Pompeii after it had been excavated and restored. The place had looked alive, vibrant, just abandoned. He'd seen more of the strange bat-like creatures swooping in and out of holes in the steep cave walls, and from time to time something that looked like a lizard scurrying away into the darkness. This wasn't a dead cave, it was a thriving habitat. And he knew what kinds of things could live in places like this. His senses were screaming warnings. He knew they weren't alone, hadn't been since they got here. They were being watched. He came to an open space like a broad balcony, red-tiled and ending at the chasm drop-off. Gold coins were scattered everywhere. He ignored them and peered down into the black canyon that stretched the entire length of the street behind the dwellings. It was hundreds of feet across and about fifty deep. There were the remains of pillars fixed into the ground nearby, and he could see corresponding pillars on the opposite side. There had been some sort of bridge here once. The sphere was on the other side of the chasm. He looked down into the blackness again, estimating, judging. His instincts told him the white orb held the answers to Magira. His jaws clenched in disgust as his vision adjusted to the dark 
and he was able to pick out details at the bottom of the chasm. Twisted limbs and shattered skulls. Most were stone, the results of meeting Magira, he guessed, but there were broken human bones down there, too. It looked as if something had fed on the flesh, then splintered the bones to suck at the marrow. Alex thought again of the large shape he'd seen darting through the shadows. He turned away from the canyon and noticed a dark alcove near the balcony. He crossed to it and kneeled. There were the remains of about twenty people, judging by the cracked skulls strewn about, and the leather tunics, metal swords, and helmets, all broken and dented. Some of the swords were bent, as if they were tinfoil against whatever they'd struck. The alcove was a dead end, a trap. A last stand, he thought. He picked up one of the larger leg bones and saw deep scratches in its surface. And not against Magira. What the hell happened here? He dropped the bone and lifted one of the skulls. He calmed his breathing and closed his eyes, trying to draw out some image of the brutality that had taken place here. Alex! He opened his eyes and turned. Matt was jogging toward him, waving. He stopped at the scattered bones and frowned. What the hell? Alex stood. Something ripped them to pieces before they could get turned to stone. He nodded toward the chasm. There are more down there. These aren't Minoans, Matt said, lifting one of the swords. His eyes went wide. This is Roman. Constantine, he must have sent an expedition here to find out more about Magira. Alex nodded. Makes sense, but looks like they found more than they expected. But what? Magira was long gone by then. Matt crouched, using the sword to push at the remains. This is amazing. What would these men have made of this place? It would have been the stuff of legends to them. And they came down here, with just these swords and some burning torches. He went back into the open square and called to Rebecca. Casey Franks came jogging up, scowling at Matt. Son of a bitch, Kearns! Alex gave her a hard look for letting her charge get away from her. Sorry, boss. He said he was going to take a leak. Jackson came up beside them and leaned out over the edge of the chasm. That's fucking deep. Alex felt the skin on his neck prickle. That sensation of being watched again. No. Stalked. He closed his eyes and pushed out his senses, trying to grasp whatever was out there. He felt a presence, but it was primitive, and hidden behind something harder than stone. We've got to get over there, Matt said. Alex opened his eyes and saw that Matt had walked closer to the chasm edge and was staring at the orb. As he watched, everything around him seemed to slow. He felt his muscles automatically begin to bunch. Danger. Lethal. And coming at them fast. Incoming! he yelled. He moved to grab Matt in the same instant that something struck the professor, lifted him off his feet, and swept him over the edge into the chasm. Another of the huge objects struck Jackson, and he grunted and disappeared into the darkness. Franks fired several rounds after the attackers, whatever they were, but they were gone before she got a clear hit. They moved faster than anything Alex had ever seen, but a fleeting glimpse had given him an impression of a large, powerful beast with six legs and armor plating. He reacted immediately, his body exploding into action and diving into the canyon without a second thought. He landed forty feet down on a flat boulder. He could just make out a shape bounding away into the dark, 
Jackson's body hanging loose and lifeless in the enormous jaws. The other creature was dragging Matt along in its mouth. It was dark in the chasm, but Alex saw the thing as clearly as he knew it saw him. Matt beat uselessly on the monstrous snout, blood running down the side of his face and streaking his shirt. The beast obviously had one goal, finding somewhere quiet to consume its prey. Not today, Alex said. He pulled the K-bolt handgun and fired a round. The supercondensed pulse of light struck one side of the armored body and just bounced away. The beast turned to face Alex. Seemed the laser burst had got its attention at least. It placed Matt carefully behind it and rested one clawed foot on his body, protecting its prey. It snarled, showing teeth longer than Alex's fingers. Alex edged closer. The creature looked like a cross between an armadillo and a giant dog, and was easily the size of a bull. Huge claws on its six powerful legs gouged into the rock they gripped, but the most monstrous thing about it was its two heads, both constantly moving. One was large, while the other one was smaller and less formed. Alex thought it might be blind, as there was little coordination in its movement. The larger head watched Alex and gave a deep growl that ended in a reptilian hiss. Its tongue flickered out, purple and forked at the end. What the fuck are you? Alex said, and fired again, this time at the larger head. The thing lowered its brow, and the armor plating came together like a shield, impenetrable to the condensed energy burst. Shit! Alex holstered the gun. Okay, we do it the hard way. He pulled his K-bar blade and leaped from one rock to the next, closing in on the thing. The beast looked down at Matt, who groaned softly. It lowered its head and its tongue slid out to lick at the blood trickling from a wound on his forehead. It hissed again, then bunched itself to leap. Alex did the same and met it midair. The creature was fast, but hampered by its large, armor-plated body in an arena of boulders and broken rocks. Alex spun and brought an armor-plated fist down on the thing's forehead with all the force he could manage. There was a crack, and some of the armored scales chipped away. The creature shook its head and blinked in confusion. Alex grinned without humor. Hurts, huh? He moved his blade from one hand to the other as more shadows materialized from the dark canyon. Two of the creatures approached, slinking like large cats over the tumbled rocks and human body parts, moving into an attack formation. Like a true pack, the creatures encircled Alex, concentrating on their major threat. Sam and Franks rained laser pulses and bullets down on them from above, but they bounced off their armor plating. Jesus! Alex ducked as a bullet ricocheted toward him. The fire from above immediately stopped. One of the creatures leaped at him, but before it had covered the twenty feet between them, something huge crashed it to the ground. Sam rolled away from it, coming to his feet, close to Alex. Mind if I join the party? he said, grinning. Alex returned the smile. About time. But watch it, they have a hide like iron. So do I. Sam rolled his shoulders, the mech suit mimicking his movements. He turned to deal with the beast that had gotten to its feet and was now circling him. For a large creature, it flowed smoothly over the broken stones. Alex turned to two others, moving into an attack position in front of him. He grabbed a fist-sized chunk of stone and threw it at the closest. The ten-pound rock traveled fast and exploded against the beast's skull before it had time to evade it. It staggered momentarily. Yes, you can be hurt, Alex said. 
He grabbed another stone and threw it at the second beast, but his aim wasn't as good, and the creature caught the missile in its jaws and pulverized it. These things had cunning and intelligence, he realized. It had destroyed the rock deliberately to display the power of its jaws. They needed to be careful. Even with Sam's suit and Alex's amazing strength and regenerative powers, these things could grind them to dust if they got the chance. As if working to a signal, three beasts charged at Sam and Alex in unison. Sam met one of them head-on as it lunged, bracing his legs and trusting the combined weight of his body and suit to hold his ground. He grabbed each side of the larger head and hung on, using the hydraulics to try and crush its skull. The other two came at Alex. He knew he couldn't beat them with strength alone, so he leaped a dozen feet into the air, leaving them snapping at his heels. He twisted in the air and landed lightly, bouncing away immediately to avoid another of the ferocious beasts. He leaped again while they formed themselves into another attacking formation, landing beside Matt and quickly feeling his neck for a pulse. He was alive and opened his eyes weakly at Alex's touch. Cerberus, it's real. Matt, quickly, how do I fight them? Alex asked, keeping his eyes on the approaching creatures. Matt raised his head. Hercules blinded Cerberus. The eyes. It's the only area without scales. Alex pushed him back down. Play dead, he told him, or you soon will be. He leaped away, yelling as he went to draw the beast's attention away from Matt. They turned to follow him, but he knew he couldn't keep bouncing around like this. Eventually, they'd either anticipate his landing point or simply grow bored and return to Matt. He landed and spun just in time to avoid one of the beasts crashing into him. Alex ran, jumping from rock to rock, until he came to the cavern wall. He could hear the creature speeding after him, a sound like rock pounding rock. It was obviously used to navigating the hard surfaces and fissures of its subterranean domain. Alex leaped at the wall, but as he struck it, he coiled his legs to bounce back hard, flying at the creature so fast he was on it before it had a chance to react. He landed on its neck and punched down with his blade, digging deep into an eye on the larger head. The reptilian hiss became a roar that shook the air, and Alex was thrown free, his blade trailing a string of jellied optic fluid. The beast raked at its head, then searched again for its attacker. But Alex hadn't gone far. He was already leaping, knowing the creature's depth perception would be shot now when I was gone. He landed on its scaly shoulders and stabbed his blade into its other eye. It reared up and fell over backward, writhing and screeching on the ground. No more humans for dinner tonight, Alex told it. He saw that Sam was struggling with another of the monsters. He had it by the neck, managing to hold it at bay so it couldn't get its jaws around him. The eyes, Sam, Alex yelled. The only weak spot. Sam half turned, his face red and streaming with sweat. He sucked in a huge breath, released the creature's neck, then brought his power-assisted fists together over each eye. Shards of the stone-like armor broke away, but the thing was hurt, not beaten. It raked a claw down Sam's body, ripping away the hyper-alloy tubing, plates, and pins embedded in his flesh. Sam's movements slowed, hampered by the damage to the suit. He was a huge man and fit, but he was fatigued and the suit was heavy. He rolled side on, but the beast released him instead of attacking and wheeled away. Alex saw they were all now focusing their attention on an easier prey, the beast he'd blinded. One grasped it by the neck. 
The armor-plated skin was no match for the crushing power of the huge jaws, and with a noise like breaking plates, the prey's neck collapsed. The huge beasts leaped away into the dark, the corpse of their fallen brother bouncing on the stones between them. Alex fell to his knees, breathing hard. He looked at his hands resting on the dark rocks. The biological armor plating was shattered and ripped. He bet his body probably looked the same, and knew it couldn't sustain much more punishment. But he had a feeling their trials had only just begun. He kneeled and wiped some blood and sweat from his eyes. I did it, he whispered. He had retained control. Even under attack, his body and mind had continued to belong to him. He flicked away more blood, smiled, and got to his feet. Chapter 34 Matt put his hand to his neck. It was hot and sticky. His mouth was dry, and he knew he was losing a lot of blood. Sam and Alex appeared over him. They crouched down, pulled his collar back, and started to probe the wounds. Deep but clean, Sam said. No way of knowing if the teeth carried infection or even venom, Alex said. Going to have to give him a universal. Matt groaned as Alex helped him to sit up. Wait till I tell people I got attacked by Cerberus. Alex snorted. Sure, Prof. He stuck a field patch over the wound. This has got steroids, antibiotics, and painkillers, all in one nice little cocktail. Should keep you together until we can get you home. He pulled the material back over the wound, and Sam slapped Matt's good shoulder. Good as new. And by the way, did we mention how the hammer feels about people talking about what we do? He grinned. Oh, yeah, right. Matt coughed as Alex pulled him to his feet. He rolled his shoulder, feeling the grating pain recede as the painkillers kicked in. Sam made him sip some water from his canteen. You just lost the equivalent of the marathon runner's fluids in a few minutes the big hawk said. Matt looked properly around the chasm floor for the first time and saw the carnage left behind by the Cerberus creatures over the years. There were bones and broken stone body parts in a thick layer on the ground, and coins too. There's thousands of them, he said, and a fortune in gold and silver. They probably offered the coins in tribute to the Gorgons, not realizing Magira and her sisters didn't want them. They wanted the Minoans themselves. All the people that lived in those houses. They must have been brought down here by the priests. He frowned. Was it just to feed to these creatures? Sam kicked at a long bone. Somehow the Gorgons escaped or were forced out. If not... Who knows how many more people would have ended up like this? Well, our job's to ensure no one else ends up like this, Alex said. Casey Franks leaned over the edge of the chasm above, looking down at them. Beside her, Reese Thompson had a scope to his eye. What you want to do, boss? Franks called down. Thompson yelled over the top of her, We need to find Barkley! Matt saw Alex's jaw set as he turned briefly in the direction the huge animal had taken the SAS man. Jackson's helmet was lying among the rocks, covered in blood. Alex retrieved it and rubbed away some of the gore. He's dead, he told Thompson. We don't know that. He could be Sergeant Thompson. Alex's voice boomed around the chasm. The SAS man fell silent, but glared at the hawk. Alex met his gaze. If he was alive, I'd know it. The SAS man shook his head. Fuck! 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 He shouldered his rifle and moved away from the edge. 
Hey! Alex yelled. Thompson turned back, and Alex tossed the helmet up to him. Be prepared to use it! Thompson's jaw clenched as he stared at the helmet. Then he lowered it and walked away. Alex pointed to the large orb on the other side of the chasm. You wanted to check that out, he said to Matt. You up to it? Matt looked up at the wall. The chasm seemed much deeper from down here than it had from up there. He nodded, not trusting his voice to mask his doubt. Alex went over to Sam and looked over the damaged mech suit. Some of the tubes were crushed and the wiring on one side hung loose, all impossible to repair in the caves. Not going to be easy getting you up there, Alex said, but you can't stay down here. Our friendly pups might return. Sam blew air between his lips. They'll think twice before trying to make dog chow out of either of us again. Rebecca's head was just visible at the edge of the chasm. She looked like she was lying on her belly. Matt, you okay? Her face was creased with concern. Matt grinned and waved. Sure, just a scratch. Pain and me are old friends now. He pointed to the orb. Can you get across from up there? Rebecca kneeled up and turned to Casey Franks, who had a scope up to her eye. She said something to Rebecca, who dropped back onto her stomach again. We think we might be able to get across at the end of the street where it meets the wall, she told Matt. Alex nudged Sam. Our turn. I can give you a leg up if you need it. Sam's response was to snort derisively. Alex rested a hand on Matt's shoulder. It's a tough climb, but there's plenty of handholds. How do you feel? Matt swung his arms, rolled his shoulders, and nodded. I can do this. He looked back up at the fifty feet of jagged rock and repeated it silently. I can do this. Alex nodded. Good man. Okay, you go first. The field patch is numbing the pain, but when it wears off, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Well, that's something to look forward to, Matt said, looking for a place to start. Borshov and his two Spetsnaz lay on the high precipice above the ancient village, watching Hunter and one of his hawks scale out of the chasm. A second group at the far end of the enormous cavern were edging along a rock ledge. Their goal was obviously the strange-looking orb structure at the rear of the gigantic cave. Borshov turned his attention to the cave floor, then the houses and the street. There were plenty of places for concealment and for ambush. He turned to his men. We'll go down into the town and take up attack positions there. Let them bring the Magira weapon to us. One of his Spetsnaz grabbed Borshov's forearm. No, we should stay here, up high. We can pick them off from here. Borshov placed one of his huge, mech-suited hands over his agent's hand and brought his fingers together, just enough to bruise the other man's bones. The man gritted his teeth, hissing as he sucked in the pain. I like your idea, Borshov said. Thank you for the suggestion. But I don't get to fight Arcadian from up here. He let the man's hand go. You ready to follow now? The Spetsnaz withdrew his hand and nodded. They made their way down the stone steps the two Spetsnaz men sometimes sliding on their bellies, and Borshov carefully moving his armored body like a crab on all fours. It took Alex, Sam, and Matt twenty minutes to scale the chasm. Alex grabbed Matt's hand to haul him over the last few feet. The young professor rolled over to lie on his back for a few seconds, puffing hard. Sam was already on his feet, 
scanning the darker areas of the cave. Alex could see the rest of his team edging across a narrow path cut into the cliff face. He looked across the deep rent in the earth at the village. It was a surreal sight, still colorful and vibrant, but empty and without movement, save for the flames that danced on the surface of the dark pools of oil. Sam joined Alex and Matt, who was looking pale and weak. Stay with us, Matt, Alex said. We need you. I'm fine, just a little light-headed. Matt spoke through gritted teeth. By the way, if you ever have another opening for an ancient languages professor, don't call me. Alex smiled. I think you already mentioned that last time, and yet here you are again. He peeled back Matt's collar. The wound was sticky wet. Let me know if you need any help or painkillers. Matt waved him away. Let's just get through this. I miss the sunshine. You and me both, Sam said. Let's do this. The orb stood before them. Huge, smooth, and almost luminous. Matt paced in front of the enormous structure. Well, definitely not built by the Minoans. Alex stood back a few paces to take in the whole thing. I don't think it was built by anyone from around here. There's no door, not even any cracks or seals. Must have punched in from above. Maybe the limestone grew over it. Matt looked up at the cave ceiling, hundreds of feet above. Can't see the roof. It's too dark. But I'm guessing this must have made one hell of a hole. Alex stared upward with his enhanced vision. The roof is intact, and there are no impact fissures around the orb, which you'd expect if it landed here. Franks and the others joined them. Rebecca pointed her flashlight to join Alex's beam. There's a reason there's no hole in the ceiling, she said, moving her light around the sides of the structure. I don't think this thing is being buried. It's emerging. Look, she pointed. The geology here isn't flowstone. The caves in these parts were formed by water running through limestone over millions of years. She turned to face them, accidentally shining her light into Matt's eyes. I think this thing is actually being exposed by erosion and has been here for a long time, well before the time of the Minoans or even the Paleolithic tribes. Alex motioned to the village across the chasm. And that? She nodded. Yeah, I've been wondering about that. Maybe the early Minoans or some other earlier race discovered the orb and somehow managed to open it. Matt spoke softly, and gods came out. Sam grunted, hungry gods by the look of all the bones. Rebecca waved her light over the smooth surface again. Maybe the turning to stone is just an accident. Whatever came out of this orb is so different to us that we can't comprehend what it wants. For all we know, it had, has, no idea that it's hurting us. Are you kidding? Sam said. Newsflash! It's not hurting us. It's freaking killing us without mercy. Believe me, we'll give it the same treatment. I agree with Sam, Alex said. It's lethal, and we won't be taking any risks. He looked at the orb's white surface. We need to open it. Ideas, people? Just one. Sam stepped up, raised the still-functioning arm of his mech suit, and crashed it down on the orb's surface. Even though the blow had the force of a pile driver, there was no dent or abrasion. Matt smiled. Yeah, I'm betting the early humans used that approach. Good to see we've evolved from that. Sam scowled, and Matt winked in return. 
Alex ran his gloved hand over the smooth surface, pushing out his senses, trying to get an impression of anything. Nothing came back to him, no images, sounds, or sensations at all. It was as if the thing was a solid, inert mass. We could try blowing it, Sam said to Alex, eyebrows raised. Matt snorted his derision. We'll put that option on the short list, Alex said, touching the surface again. Somehow the Minoans opened it. Think, what would they have had? What did they use? Rebecca shrugged. Did they open it? I mean, maybe the occupants sensed they were there and came out to meet them. Alex nodded. Either way, it must be able to be opened. We're running out of time. He turned to Sam. Your option is moving up the list. Sam bowed and turned to grin at Matt. Matt groaned. What did the Minoans do? They probably chipped at it, bashed it, maybe even tried to set it on fire. But its skin was impervious, so maybe they tried something less forceful. They would have touched it, Rebecca said. Before anything else, they would have laid their hands on it. We did that, Alex said. Rebecca shook her head. No, we've laid our gloved hands on it but there's been no flesh contact. Alex pulled off his glove and placed his palm against the smooth surface. He closed his eyes and concentrated. This time he felt something. It was like a swarm moving continuously in his head. I feel something. Like a hive. Look! Franks pointed to his hand. A circle had appeared around it, glowing. The circle moved away from Alex's hand to the center of the orb, concentrated like a spot of light from a laser. The glowing dot widened, moving outward like a ripple on a pond. When it got to about ten feet across, it stopped, and the center of the circle vanished, leaving a black hole. Alex stepped back. Seems we're the key. It needed to feel flesh before it would open. Sam lifted his gun to his shoulder. Maybe it needed to know food was available to its crew. You know what this is? Matt said, turning to them. His tone was excited. This is why Magira's been moving across Turkey, making her way here. Whatever's inside, it's important enough for her to come out of hibernation after all those millennia of imprisonment. He turned back to the orb. I think it's where she came from, really came from. He stepped forward, but Alex yanked him back. Give us a few seconds first. Franks, Sam? Franks and Sam stepped forward, their guns ready. Alex moved toward the hole in the orb, then paused. He turned slowly, looking back over his shoulder at the ancient village. We okay here, boss? Franks's gun was trained on the Minoan street. Your puppy dog's back? No, Alex said slowly. But something. He turned back. Thompson, you're on watch. The SAS soldier nodded. Alex stepped up to the black hole in the orb. Let's get this done and then get the hell out of here. He felt Sam and Franks a pace back at each shoulder as he stepped through the hole. As soon as they entered the black interior, a dim illumination kicked in, as though motion sensors had detected their presence. Holy shit, Sam whispered. The interior wasn't a sphere at all. The three hawks were standing in a long tunnel. The lights continued to come on, all the way along the tunnel, until they stopped at a wall about a quarter of a mile in. Just how big is this thing? Sam said. He took a few steps and more lights pinged on, smaller this time, and on walls and panels. The big hawk pulled out a small silver box 
and held it up, moving it over the interior. What have you got? Alex hadn't moved any further along the tunnel. Sam waited a second or two, then spoke without looking up. No detectable signs of life, he looked up. Or a known life, I should say. He read the screen again. About fifteen hundred feet before we hit that wall. He frowned. Holy shit, there's more beyond the wall. I mean, it's not just a wall. It's probably a bulkhead. Alex finally stepped forward. Rebecca was right. This thing didn't crash and embed into the wall down here. It's been eroding out of it for millions of years. Franks was looking at a control panel. Yep, this baby definitely ain't from around here. And then just powers up after all that time, Sam said. There's no radiation trace, so what's the power source? Bring the others in, Alex said. Sam walked to the entrance and waved in Matt, Rebecca, and Reese Thompson. Matt and Rebecca almost fell over each other, clambering in, their eyes wide with wonder. Thompson paused, taking it all in, then exhaled slowly. So, eons ago, humans knock on the door of this thing, and the Gorgons walk out. One didn't, Alex said. He'd moved further inside the enormous hangar-like room, and was now standing in front of a recessed section that held a ten-foot-high tube filled with a cloudy fluid and lit from within by a soft blue light. The figure suspended inside the milky liquid was enormous. Oh, my God! Matt's mouth hung open. Is that Magera? How did it get here before us? Rebecca peered at the tube. Bipedal, two arms, and just the one head, unlike those damned dogs. And what a head! She moved to one side, trying to improve her view. You can see where the legend of the snake hair came from. It looks like growths all over the cranium and neck, like rubbery extrusions, more representative of digits, I think. Maybe an extra set of fingers, she shrugged. Or maybe sensory organs. That is one ugly mother, Frank said, blowing air through her teeth as she looked up at the thing's face. Alex could see that its eyes were closed. The flattened face had no real nose, just two slits with a flap of skin either side that would probably operate like a valve. The mouth was a long slit with tough, rubbery lips. Though it was hard to discern through the milky fluid, the gorgon's skin seemed to have the pallor of wet clay. Holy crap! It's got scales, Sam said, pointing to the small overlapping discs running from the neck to the torso, where they were larger, the size of poker chips. He stood back. Jesus Christ! Tell me again how this thing is supposed to be a woman? There were no discernible genitalia. Instead, below the creature's waist, blood-red tendrils hung down to its knees. Alex placed a hand against the tank. He sensed a living presence, but not a single one, more like millions all operating in unison. I have no idea whether this is Magira or not, he said. But this thing is alive. It's a cryotank. He took his hand away, flexing the fingers. We still haven't tried to speak to her yet, Matt said. We should at least make the attempt. He raised his eyebrows. I volunteer. Alex turned to look at him. Matt, these th things have given us no indication at all that they can or want to communicate with us in any way. We don't even know if they're sentient. Maybe the real owners of this ship are dead, and these Magira things are just specimens they collected on their travels. Rebecca stepped in front of Alex. Colonel Hammerson said we could... 
On a mission, I make the calls, Alex said, cutting her off. Sorry, Matt, Rebecca, we are not letting this thing out. No one's been able to overpower one of them so far. And I'd really like to have some sort of defense in place before the Magira out there joins our little party. So let's find whatever it was the priests used to subdue it. Before we kill them all, Casey Franks finished grimly. Chapter 35 When he was sure they were all distracted by the huge white orb, Tony turned and slipped away. In a few minutes he was edging back across the narrow ledge, stopping several times to regain his balance. The weight of the gold secreted around his body surprised him. For such little objects the coins were enormously heavy. Still, the gold value was one thing. The value of the coins themselves to collectors on the black market was incalculable. Once off the ledge, he tore off his shirt to create a sack and transferred his booty into it. He threw the heavy weight over his shoulder, grunting, and glanced back. He was satisfied not to see anyone reappearing from inside the strange sphere, and even happier that nothing was crawling up out of the dark chasm toward him. He knew there was another hawk stationed with his own men in the Psychro Cave, but the three of them together should be able to subdue him. And if Petro or Andronis was lost in the skirmish, all the more gold for him. He sucked in a deep breath, the sweat streaming down his body. He'd need all his energy for the climb back up the stone steps, hundreds of them. But he'd rather die than leave the gold behind. He stifled a giggle. He'd come back here with a private army. There wouldn't be a single coin or antiquity left when he was finished. He puffed and reached up an arm to wipe his streaming brow. In that split second, something struck the side of his head. Tony went down hard, his makeshift sack spilling coins all around him. He looked up groggily. A man like a spider, all in black and with one glowing red eye, stood over him. Beside him, a one-eyed giant loomed. The giant grinned through a bushy black beard and pressed an enormous boot down on Tony's neck. How many inside Circle Door? The hawks spread out around the hangar-like space while Matt and Rebecca explored the wonders surrounding them. There's a control panel here, Rebecca called out. She was already leaning over it when Alex turned toward her. For Christ's sakes, he muttered under his breath, feeling a small knot of frustration tighten inside him. He forced himself to exhale, recognizing that she was a scientist and being curious was her job, no matter it might get them all killed. The control panel was set into a desk that seemed to grow up out of the floor, Rebecca touched one of the screens, and it flared to life, showing lists of strange symbols. Wow, one side is Minoan and the other... He snorted. Probably their language. He turned, his eyes alight. You know what this is? It's a goddamn Rosetta Stone. They were teaching themselves Minoan so they could communicate, Rebecca said softly. Exactly, Matt nodded, and the writing in the crypt below the Basilica cisterns was maybe the Gorgon attempting to communicate, assuming we'd understand it. He turned to Alex. I told you we should try to... Forget it, Alex cut in. Rebecca touched the screen again, and the outline of a human being, arms and legs outstretched, appeared. She touched the figure and more lists of symbols scrolled up beside it. "'What the hell are you doing?' Alex said, pulling her arm away. "'Don't touch! Wait, look!' she said, jerking her arm out of his hand. "'It's us! Or rather, information about us!' 
She touched the screen again, and it changed to show the human skeletal structure overlaid with the circulatory system, like in a medical school. She kept touching the screen, and the magnification dived down lower, showing individual cells and then strands of DNA with more lists of data. Very detailed information about our physiology. They wanted to understand us, Matt said. He tapped another screen, and a small circle opened on the desk beside them. A cylinder rose up out of the desktop. Inside, suspended in clear fluid, floated a small brown hand and forearm. Matt grimaced. Ah, shit. That's one way to understand us, Sam said. A piece at a time. I'm guessing it's a tissue sample, Rebecca said, peering at the foot-high tube. Like you said, it's exactly what you'd find in a medical school, Matt said. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's quite logical when you think about it. Know your enemy, Frank said. Matt shook his head. Rubbish. You don't need to cut them up to know them. Alex backed up. You might if they were a different species. An image of himself strapped down to a metal cot, and Captain Graham leaning over him with a scalpel jumped into his mind. To understand a different species, Alex thought darkly. He shook the images away, grabbed both scientists and pulled them away from the desk. Immediately the screens went dark. He looked to Sam. We're done here. Let's keep moving. Alex led the way down the long tunnel to the bulkhead, Matt and Rebecca following him, then Sam, followed by Franks and Thompson, like a pair of guard dogs. They had their guns up, moving them back and forth, turning to spot on the far entrance they came through to cover their only exit. In another few minutes, they were standing before a huge, smooth wall, Alex tried placing his bare hand against the surface. Just as before, his hand glowed momentarily before a circle formed around it. The glowing ring widened, then dissolved into an opening. Muted lighting flicked on inside. Alex nodded to Sam to go through first. I don't believe this, Sam said, his voice echoing as he stepped inside. This thing is bigger than an aircraft carrier. The others followed him through. Soft lights continued to come on in a peristaltic wave, out and away from where they stood on a small walkway. There were a dozen levels above them, and at least that many below, in a circular design. Alex calculated it would take an hour or so to jog around the ship's circumference. Every ten feet or so along the wall was a small porthole window. Cargo hold? Alex said. He walked to a window, needing to get up on his toes to peer in. What the hell? He dropped down and looked left and right, then placed his hand on the surface. The door dissolved away. Matt and Rebecca tried to crowd in at his sides, but he pushed them back. The cubicle looked like a storage room, and was filled with long silver tubes stacked one on top of the other. The top side of each had a clear panel, with another smaller panel showing a collection of blinking lights. Alex wiped the surface of one tube and peered inside. Ah, oh, Christ! He examined some of the other tubes and found that each held a body. His mind jumped back to the vision he'd experienced when he'd confronted Magira in the Turkish desert. Fleeting impressions of darkness, water, a landscape dripping with moss and lichens, a city with tall silver spires that touched the sky. He'd seen beings like the one in the cryotank, heads writhing with monstrous outgrowths, escorting thousands of smaller creatures toward the city. Their latest harvest, no doubt— transported there in a craft just like this one. What is it, boss? Sam leaned in close, towering over Matt and Rebecca. Alex grimaced as he straightened. 
I was right. It is a cargo hold. Matt wiped at the panel of another tube, clearing away the condensation. My God! I think they're alive! He turned to the others, exhaling slowly. We've never known why the Minoan race, the most advanced culture of its time, disappeared. We guessed that successive wars, disease, or even earthquakes caused them to abandon their cities and scatter to the mountains. Looks like most of them ended up here instead. Alex pointed around the room. There are ten tubes in here. Judging by the number of rooms, there's got to be tens of thousands of them in this ship. Stacked up like firewood, Sam shook his head. Alex looked at Matt. Still feel like talking to these sons of bitches? Matt didn't reply. He seemed to be in a trance. Rebecca peered in through the clear panel. Maybe the ship crashed here, and its owners couldn't complete their mission. Maybe we humans weren't evolved enough back then to help them repair their ship. She shrugged. The thing is, thousands of years ago we woke them up, and they just continued going about their task. For all we know, they thought they were saving us, keeping us safe in this ark. Ark? Sam snorted and waved a huge arm toward the tanks. You don't collect this many of the same specimen. This isn't an ark. It's a fucking harvester. Alex nodded. A factory ship. He narrowed his eyes. Like a modern whaling ship, hunt, capture, and process the prey aboard the vessel. He nodded toward the cylinders. Are they alive or dead? We need to check. Sam grabbed one end of the cylinder and dragged it out of its harness. The movement pulled Matt out of his trance-like state. He kneeled next to the tube and put his hand on the casing. Nothing happened. He bent over the panel of lights and pressed one of the small buttons, then another. The tube seamlessly unzipped, releasing some kind of gas. Matt held a hand over his face. Jesus, what the hell was that? Not oxygen, Rebecca said and sneezed. But we're still alive, so it's not toxic. Maybe some sort of preservative? The tube collapsed to reveal a young man, no more than twenty, with olive skin and smooth features. His hair was long and oiled, with the long side locks the Minoans wore. He didn't look any more than five feet tall. He groaned and then coughed. Matt leaned forward. Holy shit, he is alive! Rebecca placed a hand on the youth's shoulder. Take it easy, she said softly. It's okay. The youth coughed again, his face wrinkling as if in pain. He crushed his eyes shut and his lips moved. Matt bent forward, listening, translating. He's asking if they've arrived in the Elysian fields yet. That's the Minoan version of heaven. The youth's lips moved again, and Matt's brow furrowed as he concentrated. He says, We are the gift to the gods. He looked up at the others, grinning. This is the first time Minoan, real Minoan, has been spoken in five thousand years. Great, Alex said, and nodded to the youth. Now ask him how they speak to their gods. How do they calm them, sing to them? Hurry it up, Professor. Matt spoke in a soft but guttural tongue. The young man's eyes flicked open. They were the darkest brown and filled with confusion. He grimaced, his teeth clenching together. Matt spoke the same words again, but a little louder. Rebecca laid a hand on his shoulder. He's sick. We need to ease up. He's been asleep for... I don't care, Alex said. Matt, hurry! Matt's words became more urgent. The Minoan coughed wetly, then groaned. His eyes flicked open, wide and rolling, and his mouth opened unnaturally wide, releasing a piercing scream. Jesus Christ! 
Casey Franks grabbed Matt's collar and hauled him back. Thompson did the same to Rebecca. As they watched, the young man's body seemed to inflate. His facial features became distorted, and his eyes turned milky. His cry of pain was abruptly shut off, as first his face and then his body collapsed in on itself. In another few seconds, he was nothing but a foul-smelling mound of sludge. Rebecca gagged, and Matt's mouth was hanging open in horror. What the fuck just happened? Fuck me, Thompson grimaced. Some sort of infection? Alex shook his head. That smell when we opened the tube. Atmospheric gases. His body was saturated in them. Maybe he was being conditioned for another environment. The abrupt change destroyed him. What? Rebecca waved at the other tubes. So they can't live on Earth anymore? All of them? Alex nodded. I think so. I saw it in the Magira's mind when we connected in the desert, but I didn't understand it then. The Gorgons were herding some other race of beings toward this big city, as though they were cattle. Looks like we were to be the next herd. Sam's right. It's a harvest. This entire ship is a livestock transport. These Minoans thought they were gifts to the gods, but they were basically meals on wheels, being transported home. Sam growled deep in his throat. Someone woke up Magira, and it started to go about its business again. For all we know, this might be a scout ship, the first of many. If they like the samples, Earth might turn into their giant stockyard. Fuck em. Frank shook her head, her teeth grinding together. Blow the shit out of it. Wait, what about the Minoans? Matt said. There's thousands of them. They're already dead. Alex said. He turned to the SAS soldier. Plant the C-4, all of it. We'll use the grenades, too, for a bit of extra kick. Let's turn this abomination into atoms, and then bury what's left. On the surface, the mist moved toward the cave entrance, stopping at the Land Rover and the truck left by the Greeks. It hovered by them for a moment, and the nucleus at its center coalesced, darkening. The weeping was drowned out by another noise, a deep roar of fury as it sensed the intrusion below. The mist swept toward the cave's opening, and the metal guardrail buckled as though squeezed by monstrous hands. Once it had entered the darkness, the mist vanished, and the creature within took on physical form, and descended into the cave's Stygian depths. Chapter 36 Sam and Reese Thompson stacked the C-4 in two piles on each side of the door, along with the Hawks M-33 fragmentation grenades. Sam had wired in the small silver tubes, each one amplified with HMX, a powerful nitramine chemical. Because of its high molecular weight, HMX was one of the most potent explosives around, with a lethal shockwave many times that of standard compact military impact devices. Simply put, they were a small package with a huge blast. Sam turned. Boss, time? Sixty minutes, Alex set his watch. Mark! Sam coordinated the timer and stood. We're out of here. Alex looked up at the enormous rock wall above the massive orb. This blows right, it'll take out the entire wall and bring down about a mile of rock. Sam nodded, hands on his hips. It'll work, and even if the blast doesn't kill these things, they'll be sealed in about a billion tons of stone. Better than Constantine's urn. How much time have we got? Matt asked. Plenty. Alex looked at his watch. Fifty-eight minutes. But I wouldn't recommend any more sightseeing, so let's move it. Rebecca had her arms folded tightly across her chest. I wish there was a way to save the Minoans. We'll be killing them as well. 
Frank spat onto the cave floor. You must have skipped the part where the poor sap turned to mud right before our eyes. Like the boss said, they're already dead, lady. Rebecca fumed. There must be a way to save them. We should at least bring a medical team in to... To what? To get turned to stone by that monster? Franks leveled her steely gaze at the scientist. Boss knows what he's doing. Sam looked around the cave. Anyone seen that little Greek asshole? Matt snorted. He's probably halfway home by now, dragging a Santa sack full of gold. He better not try something stupid when we're bugging out. Franks held a scope to her eye, scanning the stone steps in the far distance. Matt shook his head. I think the gold was a priority. Doubt he'd hang around to take a few pot shots at us. Frank snorted. If there's one thing you can count on, it's greed'll win out every time. Alex nodded to the hawks to form up around Matt and Rebecca. If the Greek gets in our way, he'll be staying down here with the Minoans. He glanced down at the chasm. Those dog things are watching us. I can feel them. Like most pack animals, they'll be waiting for a straggler to become separated. So we all stick together. He looked at Matt. Try not to look wounded. Matt gazed into the chasm's dark depths. I don't know if I can run, if we need to. He gave Alex a weak smile. And my head's killing me. Dehydration, Alex said. He turned Matt's head and looked at his neck. Glands are up. Might have been something in their saliva. Good news is you're alive. Just take it easy. We don't want that wound to start bleeding again. Matt raised his eyebrows. Worried about me or leaving a blood trail? Alex could see the fear in his eyes. Don't worry, we'll be fine. We're not going back into the chasm. He gave Matt what he hoped was a reassuring smile and then turned away. He could feel the huge animals in the darkness watching while remaining out of sight. But now he began to sense something else, the creeping feeling of desolation and fury he had felt in the Turkish desert. Magira was approaching, returning to her lair, and it would be a hundred times worse than what was watching them hungrily from below. Their time was fast running out. Just stay close to me. Home soon, Prof, Alex said, and stepped onto the narrow ledge that would take them back to the village. Sam's eyes moved from Alex to the paved street. He'd noticed the hawk leader's eyes shining silver in the darkness, and he seemed to be on high alert. They were moving quickly now. Alex had picked up their pace. No one spoke, and the silence seemed to swallow even the sound of their footsteps. Alex held his fist up and froze. Halt! Sam brought his rifle up and followed Alex's gaze, but didn't see or hear anything. He returned his eyes to the street. What you got, boss? Ambush! Alex exploded into activity, pushing Matt and Rebecca to the ground, his movements so quick that it was hard to follow him. Stay down! Two soft gunshots spat from the line of buildings ahead. One struck the ground where Matt had just been standing. The other kicked Alex's head back. More shots rang out, and the group scrambled for cover. Thompson returned fire, while Casey Franks herded Matt and Rebecca into a space between two buildings. Sam dragged Alex from the street as bullets whacked into his armored back and tore Alex's helmet from his head. Shit! The wound was a deep gouge across his temple and looked like it had depressed some of the skull. How is he? Franks crawled forward, but Sam waved her back. Cover our asses, soldier. Franks rolled away, coming to a stop on her stomach at the corner of the building. Thompson landed beside her, and both of them fired off several rounds. They pulled back as stone chips blew away from the building. I got three bad guys all in tight, Franks said. They're good. I'm betting our Russian friends have joined the party.
Use the laser on wide pulse. Blow the shit out of them, Sam ordered. He put his palm over Alex's wound, causing Alex to convulse. Sam pressed hard to keep him down. One of Alex's hands reached up and gripped Sam's wrist. Sam felt the pressure and was thankful for the mech's armor plating. Alex roared, a sound of pain and anger, and his body shook. Against his hand, Sam felt an unnatural heat emanating from Alex's skin. The wound's edges seemed to sizzle as the flesh knitted itself together. Franks had pulled her K-belt pistol and ramped it up to a single ball of energy. She picked her objective and let the pulse go. It traveled almost at the speed of light to its target and blew the front off the entire building. A figure darted behind the next building, firing back at her. Franks re-aimed, fired, and blew that house to rubble as well. The figure moved again. A grenade went off a dozen feet in front of her, and she pulled back just before she was obliterated. Damn, Thompson said. Like I said, they're good. She leaned back against the wall. We're better, Alex said using Sam's arm to pull himself to a sitting position. Blood dripped from his head onto his legs. He groaned. That hurt. Easy, boss. Sam held up a hand in front of Alex's face. How many fingers? There are fingers? Alex winced and put a hand to his temple. Matt gave Alex a thumbs up. Try not to look wounded. Alex nodded and wiped at the wound. It had already stopped bleeding, and Sam could see the skin at the edges was pink. Alex grabbed Sam's shoulder and dragged himself to his feet. How many are they? Sam nodded to Franks, who gave the report. We're pinned down. Three guns. Borshov's probably one of them. Alex looked at his watch. We need to get out of here. I got someone coming out. Frank said. She lay flat, aiming her rifle instead of the pistol. Got a hostage situation. Alex Hunter, you come out. The deep voice with the thick Russian accent was unmistakable. Oh, crap. Alex shook his head, trying to clear his vision. We have to do this now? The big bastards got hold of the Greek, Frank said. Sam snorted. So what? They've got us pinned down, Alex said. We need to get out of here, and this might be the only way to do it. He grabbed Sam's arm. I can finish this right now, but I need cover. Don't want another headshot. Be ready to make a run for it. Are you kidding, Sam said. Even if your body repairs itself... That pain you're feeling is probably due to your brain just taking a freaking hammer blow. Boss, you can't take on Borshov right now. Even at your sharpest, it'd be a risk. Sure as my grandmother's Irish, that big bastard will have something up his sleeve. Sam stepped in closer and nodded toward Matt and Rebecca. One more thing. You go down, they're dead. We're all fucking dead. Alex's eyes looked lifeless. There are no absolutes in our job, Lieutenant. Sam recognized the use of rank. He let go of Alex and hoisted his weapon. Alex motioned over his shoulder to where the Russians were taking cover. Borshov can keep us pinned down until the roof caves in on us, or he can pick us off one by one while we're trying to protect the civilians. Either way, we all die. He looked straight at Sam. We'll give him what he wants. I'm the diversion. While I'm out there, get ready to move. Borshov grinned at Alex as he stepped out from the cover of the building. He was holding the struggling Greek up in front of him, a knife at his cheek. Alex could hear the man whimpering. He knew the Greek was as good as dead. He'd played this game with Borshov before. No one ever got away. Tell your men to put their weapons down, he said. They shoot, you all die. I tell my men no shoot you. You do the same, da? 
Alex kept his eyes on Borshov's. Already dead. It's just you and me now. Good. Borshov grinned. We are men of honor. Alex moved sideways, looking briefly to where he knew the two Spetsnaz had concealed themselves. He could see the barrels of their guns pointed at his hawks. They obviously thought Borshov didn't need their support. The Russian looked bigger and bulkier than ever. He wore a lumberjack shirt with red and black checks. Combined with the thick beard, it made him look like Paul Bunyan. All he needed was a big blue ox. His face was red. The heat must be stifling for him in the heavy clothing. Alex pointed back to the orb. I've set charges. We need to get out of here or we're all dead. Borshov shrugged. Not your problem anymore. I'm here. Let the others... Alex stopped, remembering how Borshov had killed a hawk in Chechnya, right in front of him, tormenting her, then hanging her by the neck so she slowly strangled, all for his own amusement. The man had no compassion, no soul. He was the embodiment of ruthless brutality. Never had Alex wanted to kill someone so badly. I'm here, Alex said again. He crushed his hands into fists, feeling the armored biological material pop from the strain. His shoulders hunched, and a rush of chemicals flooded his system. The fury welled up, and with it a demand for blood, Borshov's. Alex's jaws clenched as he strained against the beast within him, waking now. He was determined to maintain his self-control until his team was free. Also, he knew the big Russian was up to something. His word was meaningless. There would be a secondary ambush somewhere. Of that, Alex was sure. No guns, Borshov said, shaking the Greek man. He whimpered again, his eyes on Alex, imploring. Just fists, da? Alex shook his head slowly. No guns, just you and me. Borshov made a deep-chested rumbling sound that could have been a laugh. He grabbed the Greek's head and jerked upwards violently, tearing it from its shoulders in a fountain of blood. Borshov flung the head away, and it made a soft sound as it landed in the center of the street. Alex heard Rebecca vomit behind him. Borshov tossed the limp body aside, grinning. He was splattered with blood, streaks of it running down his bristling beard. He half turned to say something in Russian to his men, laughed, and then tore away the lumber shirt to expose the hyper-alloy technology attached to his body. It was a mech suit, like Sam's, except just the upper body framework. Borshov rolled his huge shoulders, and the bars and strapping moved smoothly meaning the nerve implants were also in place. He grinned and shrugged. You stronger? Now I stronger too. So now we see, da? He held up his fists in a boxer's stance and planted his legs. Come, come! No time for this, boss, Sam called. Just say the word. Ah, shit! Alex looked at his watch, then back at Borshov. Let everyone else go, then you and I can settle this. Borshov shook his head. Won't take long. Everyone must see. He nodded toward Tony's head, the eyes wide, a rictus of pain still deforming the features. I want your head. I take it home. He tapped his face just next to his ruined eye. I remember who did this. The first time Alex and Borshov had fought, Alex had been soundly beaten, then shot and left for dead. The second time it was his turn. He had beaten the shit out of the big Russian and left the man buried below tons of rock under the Antarctic ice. This time will be the decider, he thought. One of us will die. He hoped it wasn't going to be him. Borshov started to circle him slowly. The mech was only attached to his upper body. His legs were under his own power. Even though the massive trunk-like limbs were like columns ending in size 18 boots, 
They wouldn't be as fast or as powerful as the rest of him. Alex also noted his head was exposed. He now had two points of attack. Time to end this. He charged, moving so fast that Borshov looked frozen in time. But the mech suit, operated by microprocessors, acted at an even greater speed, reacting to Borshov's nerve impulses, fired off by the brain at over 100 miles per second. As Alex leaped at him like a missile, Borshov's massive fist smashed downwards to bat him away like an annoying fly. Alex got to his feet and shook his head. His ears rang from the pile driver that he'd just collided with. Borshov was a big man, even bigger than Sam, and with the suit's capabilities added in, it was like fighting a lightning-fast bulldozer. Borshov made a fist in the air, his hand sheathed in hyper-alloy plating. Pretty good, huh? Gift from your scientists. Borshov circled one way, and Alex circled the other. The Russian had his hands up, fists clenched in an old-style boxer's stance. He nodded. Try again, Mr. Arcadian. Alex did, coming fast, jinking one way, and then leaping the other, pulling back one arm as he rocketed toward the Russian's exposed face. He knew one blow with all his strength would end it. Even a glancing punch should stun Borshov long enough to give Alex time to wrench free the suit's implants, turning it into an anchor dragging him to the ground. Not even Borshov could fight for long while supporting all that extra dead weight. Once again, the mech suit reacted faster than Alex could move. Borshov caught Alex in midair, his long arms holding the hawk at a distance. One armored glove compressed around Alex's throat, while the other made a huge fist. Alex braced for the impact, knowing a sledgehammer would have been more merciful. Borshov held the fist back, grinning behind his black beard, savoring the moment. He squeezed harder, cutting off Alex's air supply. Alex gripped at the Russian's forearm, feeling the bars and titanium plating shielding it. He raked at the metal, pounded at it, his frustration fueling his anger. Alex felt like his body was on fire. He roared his fury and grabbed at the armored forearm, squeezing with all his strength. One of the support struts began to bend, and there was a ping as rivets separated. But before Alex could finish the task... Borshov rocketed his fist forward. It connected just above Alex's eye. The world spun, and stars exploded across his vision. The bullet wound that had just knitted closed burst open, spraying blood over Borshov's chest. Alex wanted to slip into unconsciousness, but another part of him was never going to let that happen. Weak, it hissed at him. Get out of the way. The voice was full of scorn. It didn't care if Alex's team was safe or whether he was mortally wounded. All it cared about was sating its desire for blood and revenge. Alex ground his teeth, not just fighting against Borshov's grip now, but against the demon rising in his mind. He needed to maintain control. If his team was to escape, he had to keep Borshov occupied and draw the attention of the Spetsnaz. He couldn't afford to forget strategy and tactics and brawl like an animal. Borshov brought his fist back again, his arm having completed its arc from the punch, ready to deliver a backhand as it returned in the opposite direction. Alex's legs drew back, and he kicked out hard into Borshov's gut. There was plating over his torso, but the impact was enough to rock the big man backward and loosen his grip on Alex's throat. Alex felt part of his biological armor suit rip away as he dropped, rolled, and then staggered to his feet. He heard Rebecca and Matt screaming their support, and his fellow hawks calling advice and tactics. The words were garbled, meaningless, drowned out by the other one's voice in his head. Borshov looked over toward Rebecca and grinned. Another woman. Maybe you'd like to watch her die as well? He raised his fists. 
Come on, stop running, fight! Alex circled, looking for an opening. Borshov was growing impatient, obviously thinking he had the hawk's measure, with victory only minutes away. The big Russian lunged, and Alex backed up. He lunged again, and Alex danced back out of his reach. Too late, he realized the Russian had herded him into a small lane between two buildings, a dead end. Alex felt his back strike the wall, no further to go. He glanced down to see more broken swords, bones, and skulls, evidence of another last stand by a group of Constantine's soldiers. The trap was what Borshov had been waiting for. He charged. Alex used the wall to spring at the huge man, flying at him like a human spear. Borshov lunged, incredibly fast, but Alex expected it and twisted away, striking out at the Russian's head as he moved. Borshov's shoulder jerked up in defense, but Alex's blow, delivered with all his extraordinary strength and the extra weight of the biological armor-plated gloves, exploded titanium tubing and the hyper-alloy plating from the Russian's upper arm. Borshov's other arm flicked out, its hammer-like fist thumping into Alex's back. Alex went down, but got back to his feet and turned, smiling. Pain didn't matter anymore. Borshov rolled his shoulder. The movement was slower, and some fluid spurted from a severed tube. He pointed a finger at Alex. You still fast, huh? He reached down to pick up a broken sword, hefted it, and spun it in his hands. The iron was green-coated, and only about a foot of the blade remained. He grunted his approval, and waved the sword back and forth. Soon I be like you. We have your scientist, the smart man who made you. By now he has told us everything. He shrugged. No more Arcadian secrets. Soon be hundreds like you, maybe thousands. You're not home yet, Alex said. He moved sideways, his eyes never leaving Borshov's. The big man slashed the blade back and forth, his eyes darting down to the ground momentarily. Then he grinned and leaped at Alex. Alex stepped back to brace himself, preparing to take the charge head on. But instead of stable ground, his foot stumbled on a skull at his feet. Borshov had positioned him right over it. Alex fell backward as the big man leaped, coming down with the broken sword held in both hands. Alex reached to the side and grabbed a bronze shield, lifting it over his face. The clang of metal on metal was loud in the huge cavern. Alex batted Borshov off him and rolled away, bringing the shield up. He looked across to see Sam's gun up and pointed at Borshov. But Alex knew Sam wouldn't fire until the outcome was clear. Come hell or high water, Sam would stand his ground or die. Thirty minutes, the big hawk yelled. Alex had two options. Spend his last few minutes fighting the huge Russian, or be buried alive and condemn his team to the same fate. Fight or die, the voice in his head whispered. Fight or die, Alex whispered back. He turned, bracing himself as Borshov rushed at him. Alex held the shield up again, and Borshov's blow created a fist-shaped dent in the thick iron. The next moment, Borshov had ripped it from his hands. Grinning, he brought both hands together, and the ancient steel crumpled like a soda can. No more flying away, little hawk, Borshov said, and charged like a bull. Alex saw the Russian had a long machete tucked into his belt. So much for no weapons, he thought. He was outweighed almost two to one, which meant no matter how strong he was, he was on the wrong side of any mass times velocity equation. He needed other tactics. He needed something else. If he couldn't increase his mass, he needed to increase his speed, his strength and ferocity. He knew he had another weapon, but one locked away in its mental prison. Perhaps that something else he sought was there all the time, just waiting to be released from within. Borshov arrived. At the last moment of impact, 
Alex turned sideways, moving in past the Russian's outstretched hands by a hair's breadth. Automatically, Borshov's arms closed around him, the machine sensors allowing him to move faster than he could ever have hoped to by himself. Alex knew he was no match for the suit's super-assisted weight and power, but he now had what he wanted. He was in close. Now, the voice in his head screamed, and Alex felt the familiar sensation of being wrenched in two. The ancient village, the heat, the darkness, his hawks, Matt and Rebecca, all went away, leaving just Borshov, the enemy. A grin of triumph split the Russian's face as he began to compress Alex within his grip. Alex grinned back, then swung his head forward, smashing it into the bridge of Borshov's nose, breaking the already battle-scarred snout. The Russian snorted blood and squeezed harder, and Alex felt the titanic pressure begin to bear upon his spine. Instead of slowing him, it made him more furious. He swung his head into Borshov's face again and again, hammering the squashed nose into a mess of cartilage and bloody pulp. In so close, he couldn't swing his arms for a long punch, but he could use close-quarters combat techniques, his thumbs, the tips of his elbows, his teeth. Though Borshov's upper body was like an armored bulldozer, his face was just flesh and bone. Alex swung at it again, gritting his teeth as his biological armor and also his spine began to crack. One of the Russian's brows split, running blood into his good eye. Before we die, we'll make him pay. The voice didn't care about victory or death, just about the brutality of the battle. Alex headbutted again and again, ripping his elbows back and forth, over and over, until Borshov flung him away. The big Russian wiped at his face, trying to clear blood and gore from his eye. Alex got slowly to his feet, his teeth bared, choosing the next point of attack. He was about to charge in again, when a sensation like a wall of ice smashed up against his spine. He crouched and spun, his senses on high alert to a new and more terrifying danger. Chapter 37 I got a shot, Franks breathed, as she sighted along the barrel. Negative on the shot, Sam said quickly. Boss ordered us to sit tight. Sam kept an eye on the two Spetsnaz, who were undoubtedly doing the same to him. But that wasn't what transfixed him. Instead, it had been the two bloodied titans coming together in all their savage brutality. It reminded him of a ferocious dogfight, but with fists, boots, steel, and strength many times above those of mortal men. Though Borshov was the enemy, and a monstrous adversary in the mech suit, what worried Sam the most was Alex and the way he had changed. He had once again become the thing that was loosed in Italy, the being that even Alex referred to as the Other One. Sam gritted his teeth as the two men smashed into each other again and again. Alex used every part of his body as a weapon, his eyes round and furious. Sam doubted that he remembered or even cared that the cavern was set to come down in mere minutes. The Big Hawk knew he might be forced into an invidious choice. What if Borshov went down? Would the other one be sated, or, in its bloodlust, turn its ferocity onto others? What would he then do against Alex? What could he do? Sam gripped his gun and looked up at the millions of tons of rock overhead. Maybe the cavern coming down might save them all from themselves. Thompson lifted his head. Reed! Reed! We're going to have to move. Got to get Rebecca out of here. Sam cursed, but knew the SAS man was right. Okay, but you two need to be the shields. Take all the heat from Borshov's men. He turned to Franks. Get the sieves out. I'll stay and cover the boss. Franks's lip curled, and she looked as if she was about to challenge him. Sam's voice went up a notch. Do it, soldier. Behind him, Sam heard Matt suck in a deep breath. 
Oh, no, no, no! Look! Sam turned to where Matt was pointing. A mist was forming up at the far end of the street. For fuck's sake, right now? He pulled the helmet visor down over his eyes. Go to visor shields, people. Matt and Rebecca, blindfolds on. Looks like we got a visitor. Sam grabbed Alex's damaged helmet from the ground and moved to the corner of the building, hoping to get a chance to toss it to him. He prayed Alex, the real Alex, would take it. Alex heard Sam call to him, and he spun in time to catch the helmet out of the air. He held it aloft for a few seconds as he used every one of the techniques that Marshall had taught him to control his dark side. He knew that if he could release it, then he could also restrain it. He was in control, not the other way around. Blood spurted from Alex's nose as a hammer blow of pain struck from inside his skull. The cage swung shut. He won. Clarity returned in an instant, and he knew immediately what the danger was. Without a second thought, he jammed the headgear over his head and snapped the visor down. Immediately, the world turned to an artificial landscape, a high-graphics computer game where everything looked real but wasn't quite right. Borshov watched him, his face screwed in confusion. Behind the big Russian, the cloud formed up. Alex could hear it weeping. He wanted the man dead, but wanted to do it himself. It's Magira, he called out. Better shut your eyes, asshole. Then he turned and sprinted toward Sam. Get him moving! Sam roared instructions. Casey Franks dragged Matt and Rebecca, now blindfolded, to their feet and pushed them out into the street. Sam and Thompson ran alongside them, using their large bodies as shields against the Spetsnaz. As Alex had expected, it was unnecessary, as Borshov's agents concentrated their firepower on the solidifying figure rising up behind their commander. Borshov spun, and the figure grabbed him by the throat. Alex heard him groan as Magira compressed the mech suit's armored collar around his neck. Words hissed from between his teeth. Mot stragi! Alex didn't know what the Russian meant, but guessed it was something to do with monster. Borshov struck out, making contact with Magira, but seemingly without effect. He struggled and jerked, but neither his own brute strength nor the mech suit was a match for the being that gripped him. It slowly lifted him from the ground, and Alex heard the powerful suit's hydraulics humming with the strain. He knew the strong alloys were probably the only thing keeping Borshov in one piece now. Its tentacles grasped at Borshov, slithering and writhing, as though each had a mind of its own. Alex could see that the bulbous ropes were tipped with sucker pads. Borshov's men sent more bullets smacking into Magira, but it didn't release its grip on its prey. It turned its terrible gaze on them, and Alex saw their faces first go blank, then twist in pain and horror. What looked like thick vomit poured from their mouths. One of the men struggled to his feet, clawing at his neck, but his movement soon slowed. A golden vapor escaped his lips, flying toward the Magira. It opened its large mouth and inhaled it. Borshov screamed. He screwed his eyes shut as the creature brought his face close to its own and struggled furiously, fighting for his life. The hideous face seemed to elongate toward him from within the mass of writhing tentacles. Borshov seemed compelled to open his eyes, and the gorgon was revealed to him in all its horrifying glory. Borshov's eyes went wide. He coughed and then gagged. A thickened paste of soft stone exploded from his lips and spilled down his beard, solidifying as it hit the air. Borshov stopped struggling. Gradually his face became pale and lined with fissures. He was trapped in a stone prison made of his own skin and bone. The gorgon drew him in close, opened its mouth impossibly wide, and inhaled, sucking out his essence. In those slitted, alien eyes, Alex saw a hell 
that contained the souls of millions. He remembered all the Minoans in the ship, stacked up like firewood, and realized they were food. This was how the monster fed, consuming some essence from within a human being, leaving the body a lifeless block of stone. He glanced at his team, already halfway up the steps that led to the cave's main entrance, and then down at his watch. Seven minutes left. Barely enough time if the collapsing wall brought down the entire tunnel system. He looked back to Magira and saw that its head was turning to him. Pain needled the center of his head, and fragments of static washed across his visor screen. The damaged helmet wasn't working at full capacity. He turned to run, but couldn't. Pain bloomed in his skull. It was too late. Sam brought up the rear of the group. Matt and Rebecca were still blindfolded, so their progress was slower than he'd have liked. Sam glanced back down at Alex and saw that he was staring at the Gorgon, unmoving. Shit, no! The only positive to the situation was that Magira also seemed frozen in place. Borshov's body, now nothing more than calcified stone, and the heavy machinery of the mech suit hung about the creature's neck like an anchor. The sound of weeping rose, then was drowned out by a shriek of fury. As Sam watched through his visor, the Gorgon started to disassemble into mist again, and he had an impression of huge scaled hands grabbing at Borshov and tearing him and the hyper-alloy framework to pieces. Magira was now free to descend on the frozen Alex. Sam roared, The fuck you will! He stepped to the edge of the steps, preparing to leap the more than a hundred feet down to Alex. Don't! Franks yelled, and tried to grab him. Franks, get him up and out, Sam said. That's an order. Franks's face twisted in disbelief. Like hell! Sam leaped into space, and landed like a colossus, shattering the street's paved surface and sinking about six inches into the rock. He went down on one knee, but the mech suit absorbed the impact, and he was immediately up and sprinting toward Alex. Magira descended on Alex, the hideous face forming up beneath the writhing mass of tentacles. As Sam picked up speed, he saw the shattered remains of Borshov and his suit, and knew he stood little chance against the Gorgon. But sacrifice had its own strategic value. He was traveling at around fifty miles per hour now, with the locomotive force of a truck. He dropped his shoulder and launched himself at the huge figure, striking it mid-center and knocking it back twenty feet. Sam rolled and came up fast, turning to Alex. Franks and Thompson were already there, dragging the Hawk leader away from the Gorgon. For once, Sam was glad Franks was so strong-headed. Alex was still unmoving, but he wasn't dead, and he hadn't been turned to stone. Magira rose up like a column of dark smoke, then solidified, screaming her rage. Her focus wasn't on Alex anymore. Game time, Sam said. He gritted his teeth, pulled both his gun and knife, and charged again. Casey Franks pulled Alex's damaged helmet off and slapped his face hard. Boss, you still with us? He opened his eyes, sat forward, and immediately threw up. My head. He looked one way, then the other. Where's Magira? We need to get you up and out of here, Thompson said, putting his arm under Alex's shoulder. Alex pushed him away and rubbed his eyes. If the Gorgon's free, we'll never make it. He pulled on his helmet again and turned in time to see the monster smash Sam aside. And we're not going anywhere without Sam. Matt was suddenly beside him, blindfold off, his computer resting on one knee. He tapped some keys. We got something we can try. A discordant, grating tune emanated from the computer. It sounded eerily alien. Matt jacked up the volume just as the Gorgon glided toward Sam. Sam lowered his head, holding his ground. But Magira stopped and turned toward Matt. Don't look at it, 
Alex said urgently. Keep your eyes covered. Matt turned away, but kept tapping at the keys, making the tune louder again. It's not working, Rebecca said. It's confusing it, but not putting it to sleep. Sam raised his gun and fired. The bullets did nothing other than attract Magira's attention. We need to get out of here, Thompson dragged at Alex. We'll never make it, Alex said, getting to his feet. He saw Borshov turn to stone, the obliterated mech suit. There was no way he'd let his second-in-command suffer the same fate. It wants me. Alex had felt the thing's pleasure when it almost had him in its grip just a moment before. Perhaps it was his enormous strength or the furious being inside him, but whatever it was, Alex knew that he had given it nourishment beyond anything it had felt in countless millennia. Then I'll give it what it wants. Alex ran toward the Russian's remains, picking up the long silver machete and swinging it at Magira. Ten feet out, he leaped in the air, blade high, and brought it down with all his strength on her neck. The blade bit deep, but didn't sever the head as Alex had hoped. Instead, the huge head turned and its mouth dropped open. The wail that emanated from it bounced around the huge cavern like a hurricane of madness and fury. Light poured from the wound. Alex raised the sword again, but before he could move, the pack of Cerberus hounds appeared, slinking between the buildings, their armored hides catching the glow of the flaming lakes of oil, their eyes as red as fire. Alex turned, ready to defend himself from the new threat. Against a few of these huge beasts, he and Sam had only just survived. A pack of them would tear him to shreds. But instead, Alex felt himself grabbed and lifted, and a force far stronger than his own demanded his attention. His helmet was ripped free, and then it was as if the world went away. There was no more sound or sight or heat or any other sensation but the dreadful attraction of the Gorgon's gaze. Alex turned his face away, crushed his eyes shut, and gripped the huge arm that held him. He fought, but he was an insect compared to its colossal strength, and slowly his head turned back. He screamed and raged, thrashing in the creature's impossible grip. The other one's fury exploded to the surface to struggle in unison, but it too was quickly subsumed. Alex's eyes were opened, and he looked. He hadn't known fear for longer than he could remember. No man or beast had ever made him tremble or hesitate. Probably because death held no horrors for him anymore, and pain was something that was endured and overcome. But this feeling dragged at his soul and then tore it from him. Once again the images of the humid world were flashed into his mind. The sense of millions of years of invading, harvesting, and enslaving countless populations for food and slavery, and a determination that the earth would be next. A cold crept over him, first in his fingertips and then his toes. It moved inexorably along his limbs. Alex knew what was happening to him as his body became immobile. The shouts of his comrades, the Cerberus, his own mind and body didn't matter. All that was left were the eyes of the hellish creature that slowly pulled the energy from him. A flash of movement in his dimming periphery was the huge pack of the Cerberus, now picking up speed, mouths hanging open, powerful jaws ready. The ground shook under their combined weight as they charged. Alex would be spared this fate after all, by death. The beasts struck hard, taking the larger figure of the Gorgon to the ground. Alex was dropped and forgotten. He lay shuddering as if in a fit, and felt his team grab and drag him away. He felt cold and weaker than he'd ever felt in his life. He managed to hold up one creaking arm. His vision was blurred, like looking through a curtain of fine gauze, but he could just see that his hand was bare, the glove having been lost. The limb was now white, and as he watched, dust fell from his fingertips. 
He guessed his legs were the same. Can you hear me? Matt asked as he lifted Alex's head a fraction. Alex tried to nod but couldn't. Instead, he parted ash-dry lips. Leave me. There was a small puff of dust, and he wasn't sure the words were heard. He summoned up every ounce of remaining strength he had. Leave me now. Alex knew they were out of time, and also knew he was no longer all flesh anymore. He was already dead, and if they stayed, they would be too. Shit, this is bad. Matt turned to Rebecca, grimacing. Frank stepped in close and lifted him, bringing her face close to Alex's. Don't you fucking dare! She shook him for a second, and then dropped him to shoulder her weapon as she turned to Thompson. We carry him. Wait, look, Rebecca said. Alex continued to watch his hand. A line of healthy color was creeping up from the wrist to the fingers. His vision slowly cleared, and suddenly the heavy weight on his chest lightened. He made a fist several times and blinked. Amazing! He's healing, Matt said, sitting back on his haunches. Get him up! Franks pulled Alex roughly to his feet. Alex nodded, leaning on her for a few seconds. I'm okay, I think. He looked across to the Gorgon, still in its titanic struggle with the pack of Cerberus. Its massive hands tore at their heavily plated limbs, ripping heads off and flinging them away. But their sheer weight of numbers prevailed. More appeared and threw themselves into the fight. Maybe they were the Gorgon's previous cargo, Frank said. Before they found us, Rebecca whispered. Alex turned to see Sam making his way around the Malay, then sprinting to join the others. Three minutes, he yelled to Alex. He grabbed Matt and Rebecca, threw them over each shoulder of the mech suit, and headed for the steps. Go, Alex yelled to Thompson and Franks. He knew the female hawk would never let him carry her, so instead he shoved her hard and fast in the middle of her back, pushing her up the first few steps. He staggered at first, but then picked up speed. Thompson scrambled behind them. Alex looked back to offer him a helping hand, but the SAS man simply pointed to the high cave mouth. Keep going, he yelled. Behind them, the Gorgon had thrown off its remaining attackers and was making its way toward the stone steps. Chapter 38 They barreled along the mosaic tunnel, Sam crushing five thousand year old pristine images under his large boots. The tunnel got narrower, and he had to stop to let Matt and Rebecca off his shoulders. Matt kept one hand on the huge hawk's back, and with the other held on to Rebecca, which meant Sam could still pull them along at great speed. When they came to the flowstone wall, Sam didn't stop. He exploded through it like a bulldozer. They crossed the drained pond and headed for the metal steps, with no time to catch their breath. Their plan was for the Gorgon to be trapped by the rockfall, not to follow them out. Sam led them up the metal steps, his feet clanging heavily on the steel. Matt and Rebecca were right behind him, followed by Casey Franks and Alex. Matt turned his head as he climbed and saw Reese Thompson emerge from the flowstone tunnel, his face beat red. He looked up at them, his face resolute. Then he sucked in a huge breath and simply stopped. Like a gush of foul air, a dark cloud spewed from the cave behind him and enveloped him. It coalesced and solidified, and then huge, scaled hands ripped his helmet from his face. Thompson's mouth dropped open, and his eyes became rounder than Matt had thought was humanly possible. And then he screamed, with such fear it made Matt's legs grow weak. No, Reese! Rebecca stopped and put her hands to her head. Matt grabbed her and pulled her on. He saw Alex pause by the railing, as if contemplating leaping over it. But in the next second, Reese Thompson shuddered 
and turned bone white. Magira sucked in his life force and finished its meal by ripping the petrified husk of his body into a thousand fragments. It was obvious its rage wasn't going to be satisfied by simply draining the intruders. Move, damn it! Alex's face was furious. They were more than halfway up when Matt chanced another look over his shoulder. Magira's solid form had started to dissipate into the dark cloud again, and Matt knew the mist would be able to move at a speed that could outpace even Sam and Alex. Incoming! Casey Franks roared. She pounded up the steps, then turned to fire uselessly at the dark mass hundreds of feet below them. Alex looked at his watch. What the hell happened to... As if in answer, there came a massive hammer blow from deep in the ground. It sounded like a million volcanoes erupting, accompanied by the grinding and cracking of millions of tons of rock. Matt saw that the entire cave system was being sucked into a giant void opening up beneath them. The stairs began to bend and then collapsed, as if the darkness was reeling them in on a length of rope. Huge stalactites fell from the ceiling like monstrous daggers, and walls split open. Rebecca stumbled and fell. Alex sprinted past, gathering her up. He pushed at Matt. Move it, prof! Matt didn't need to be told twice. He ran, his heart hammering with exertion and fear. Vast underground wells burst their confines, pouring millions of gallons of water and debris toward them, turning the cave into a maelstrom of collapsing stone and surging whitewash. Sam was first out into the daylight, followed by Casey, Matt, then Alex and Rebecca. They slowed, but Alex urged them on. We need to get higher. This whole area is going to collapse. They ran hard for another ten minutes, up to a bluff overlooking the cave entrance. Matt's body gave out, and he fell to his knees, gasping. He looked back and gasped. The caves were gone. In their place was a huge black hole, rapidly filling with surging muddy water. Alex stared into its depths, and Matt knew he was searching for anything living coming to the surface. But there was nothing. Matt rolled over to lie on his back. He heard Rebecca whisper, Reese. He saved us, Alex said. He knew what he was doing. Bought us an extra thirty seconds. The difference between that thing swallowing us and getting out. He was a good man. Rebecca nodded and wiped away tears. The Gorgons, the Minoans, the ship. It's like it all never existed. Matt sat up. No one will ever believe it did. Probably a good thing. Some people are better off not knowing what really lurks in the dark. Alex finally looked away from the surging water. No one must ever know about it. We don't want anyone going searching for the ship or the Gorgon. For all we know, it could be waiting down there for someone to dig it out again. On the flight home, Alex sat apart from the others. For once, there was a calm in his mind. No screaming devils calling for bloodshed. No other one in the dark corners of his consciousness, straining at its mental chains, waiting for the opportunity to take over. He dropped his head back against the seat. He was looking forward to continuing his treatment with Alan Marshall. For the first time in years, he felt in control. Though he doubted the furies within him would ever be fully laid to rest, he knew that he was learning to master them. He smiled and opened his hands, then squeezed them into fists, feeling the strength run through him. He felt good. He felt like he had something to offer at last, something to live for. He thought of Amy and Joshua, remembered how the boy had seen him in the trees and waved to him. Somehow his son had sensed the connection with the strange, wild-eyed, bearded man hiding in the forest. He smiled. Now he had something to hope for. Sam collapsed into the seat next to him with a thump. He'd removed the upper body mech gear, but he still overflowed into Alex's space. Unlike Alex, Sam's wounds would take longer to heal. 
Just about every inch of his body was covered in a bandage, stitched or daubed with iodine. Alex grinned. Hey there, Frankenstein. Sam snorted. Just another day at the office. He looked hard at Alex. So, good to be back? The big man was probably the closest thing Alex had to a brother. He nodded. Yeah, it felt good. Damn right it did. Sam punched him in the shoulder. Good to have you back, Arcadian. You're home. Alex grunted and leaned forward to look out the window. Nearly home. Chapter 39 Colonel Jack Hammerson read the Magira report and shook his head. This goddamn world will never cease to amaze me. He closed the folder and fed the hard copy version into a shredder. The online version he allocated to deep storage in the underground information silos beneath U.S. Stratcom. He picked up the next folder and pulled at his lip as he read its contents. It was a report on a covert surveillance operation on a private citizen. He looked at the photograph of the mother and child. He knew the woman well, but she wasn't what interested him. With her was a child, a boy, less than two years old. He studied the face, the gray-blue eyes, piercing, serious. The next shot showed the boy holding up one end of a ride-on car with another kid in it. The child was lifting their combined weight with one hand. Like father, like son, Hammerson said. He flipped the folder onto the desk and rubbed his eyes, then sat back in his chair and stared up at the ceiling. Ah, oh, Amy, there are no secrets left in this world anymore. He sighed. So now what do we do with you and Joshua? The interrogation rooms beneath the Kremlin were for special guests only. They were tiled and insulated, containing the screams that frequently emanated from within and making them easy to hose out. President Vladimir Volkov looked down at the man strapped to the gurney. A metal spike extended from his nostril, with wires leading from it to a box that sent a mild electrical current into the area of his brain between the hippocampus and amygdala. Captain Robert Graham twitched and babbled nonstop, even though his lips were parchment dry. The doctor pulled up one of his eyelids to examine the rolled-back orb. The captain showed no physical response to the touch. He has told us everything he knows about the Arcadian treatment and the subject, the doctor said. He has no more secrets. Volkov grunted. Get the information down to the labs. I want the treatments duplicated and commenced immediately. It seems they didn't have much success, the doctor commented. Only one Arcadian out of over a hundred experiments. Volkov shrugged. That is still one in a hundred, and we have ten thousand volunteers waiting in our gulags. And Captain Graham? the doctor asked. He will never function normally again. Disposal? Volkov's mouth turned down momentarily. No, keep him alive. Let his brain empty completely. Who knows what other useful information he may have stored in there. He stripped off his gloves and dropped them to the floor. So now we make our own Arcadians. He grinned, wolf-like. And in Russia, everything is bigger and better. Belinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of Gorgon. Written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Author's Notes Many readers ask me about the science in my novels. Is it real or fiction? Where do I get the situations, equipment, characters, or their expertise from? And just how much of any legend has a basis in fact? In the case of the Gorgon, 
There are numerous mythological and religious stories, some dating back to the Neolithic Age, of men being turned to stone, of snake goddesses and hideous monsters living in an underworld. The Gorgon The word Gorgon derives from the ancient Greek word meaning fierce, terrible, and grim. Another derivation is from the Greek word gorgos, which means dreadful. So it is an ancient word, as old as Zeus himself. One of the earliest images of a gorgonea, a figure depicting a gorgon head, dates from nearly 3,000 years ago and appears on a coin made of electrum, a natural alloy of gold, silver, and other metals, discovered during excavations at Parium. Images with a gorgon head were also found in the Knossos Palace on Crete, dating from a thousand years earlier. A Lithuanian-American archaeologist, Maria Gimbutas, argued that the gorgon mythology extended back to at least 6,000 B.C., citing a ceramic mask from the Sesklo culture as proof. In her book, Language of the Goddess, she also identified the genesis of the Gorgonaeon in Neolithic art and jewelry. Minoan jewelry found on the island of Moklos in Crete shows the figure of a female goddess with a monstrous writhing head, while other gorgons are portrayed with clawed feet, wings, fangs, tusks, flashing eyes, large teeth, and sometimes a protruding snake-like tongue. In Virgil's Aeneid, written between 29 and 19 B.C., Gorgons are said to live at the entrance to the underworld, dwelling in eternal darkness. In more modern times, the Gorgon's likeness has been immortalized by artists, including Leonardo da Vinci, Peter Paul Rubens, Pablo Picasso, Auguste Rodin, and Benvenuto Cellini. Medusa Medusa is the most famous of the Gorgon creatures, she, along with her sisters, Stheno and Uriale, were the daughters of the sea titans, Forcis and Sito. Many versions of the myth have Medusa, the youngest sister, as a beautiful maiden with long silky hair, said to be extremely wise but very vain. She and her sisters all served as priestesses to the virgin goddess of wisdom, Athena. However, the sea god Poseidon, Neptune, desperately desired Medusa and raped her inside Athena's temple. Athena blamed Medusa for Poseidon's attack and for defiling her place of worship. As punishment, she transformed the three sisters into hideous beasts with scaly skin, dragon wings, and hair formed of dozens of coiling snakes. As further retribution, the Gorgons were so horrifying that any man who beheld them was instantly turned to stone. Medusa and her sisters grew to become vicious monsters that took great pleasure in torturing their victims. Perseus was given gifts by the gods, winged sandals from Hermes, a helmet of invisibility provided by Hades, and Athena's silver shield to help him kill Medusa. Perseus crept up on the sleeping Medusa by looking at her reflection in his shield, cut off her head, and presented it to Athena, who placed it in the center of her aegis, the protective shield she wore over her breastplate. Perseus escaped Medusa's enraged sisters thanks to the winged sandals of Hermes and by wearing Hades' helmet of invisibility. The Medusa tale reaches back even further than classical Greece. She also appears in Libyan images, with her hair sometimes resembling dreadlocks, and was worshipped by the Libyan Amazons as their serpent goddess. Her name there is derived from the Sanskrit word Medha, and Egyptian Met or Mat, meaning wisdom. Medusa's face is usually shown screaming or staring with unblinking eyes. Her tongue sometimes protrudes like a snake's, and her head is often surrounded by a halo of coiling snakes. The Medusa image was frequently used to guard and protect up until the Christian era. Even after that, her face continued to appear on columns, doorways, and gateways, 
signifying her role as the guardian of the threshold, between the realms of the living and the dead, between the temporal world and the underworld. The Medusa is an ancient icon that remains one of the most popular and enduring figures of Greek mythology. She continues to be recreated in pop culture and art today. Her face is carved into a rock at the popular red beach in Metalla, Crete, is used as the logo for the famous fashion brand Versace, and even appears in some Greek bank vaults as a talisman for luck and protection. The Basilica Cistern, Sunken Palace The Basilica Cistern, or Sunken Palace, is the largest of several hundred ancient cisterns that lie beneath the Turkish city of Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, and before that, Byzantium. The Basilica Cistern is located 500 feet southwest of the Hagia Sophia, on the historical peninsula of Sarai Burnu. The name derives from a large public square on the first hill of Constantinople, the Stoa Basilica, beneath which it was originally constructed. The Great Basilica was built between the 3rd and 4th centuries during the early Roman age as a commercial, legal, and artistic center. Ancient texts indicated that the basilica had gardens surrounded by a colonnade and facing Hagia Sophia. According to ancient historians, Emperor Constantine created the original structure, which was later rebuilt and enlarged by Emperor Justinian after the Nica riots of 532 AD, which devastated the city. The underground structure is enormous, even by today's standards and historical texts claim that 7,000 slaves were involved in building it. The cathedral-sized cistern is an underground chamber of approximately 105,000 square feet, capable of holding nearly 3 million cubic feet of water. The ceiling is supported by a forest of over 300 marble columns, each 30 feet high. The Basilica Cistern has undergone several restorations since its original construction, the most recent in 1985, when 50,000 tons of mud was removed and a platform built to replace the boats that once used to take tourists through it. In 1963, before the platform was built, the Basilica Cistern was used as a location for the James Bond film From Russia With Love. Located in the northwest corner of the cistern are two columns that stand on blocks carved with the Medusa's face. The origin of the carvings is unknown, though it's been suggested the blocks might have been brought to the cistern after being removed from a building of the late Roman period. Architects believe the blocks were placed sideways and upside down to form the best support for the columns. However, legend has it that the blocks are oriented sideways and inverted in order to negate the power of the Gorgon's gaze. Many Byzantium-era sword handles and small pedestal columns were engraved with the Gorgon's head upside down to deflect the power of her gaze while still enjoying its protection. The Greek Underworld Hell is viewed by many religions as a place of torment, often for eternity. However, religions with a cyclic history often depict hell as an intermediary state between incarnations, such as between life, death, resurrection, or reincarnation. It is usually located in another dimension, above or below us, and sometimes entered through a volcano's crater, a cave, or even below the sea. It is sometimes portrayed as crawling with demons that torment those who live there, and ruled by a supreme being, a god of death, such as Nergal, Hell, Enma, Satan, or Hades. The Greeks had a rich mythological underworld, a place where souls went after death, described variously as being at the far ends of the ocean, or beneath the depths or ends of the earth. It was considered the counterpart to Mount Olympus, and filled with darkness in opposition to the kingdom of the gods, which was filled with light. In Homer's Iliad, the underworld, Hades, is a dark, damp, and moldy place 
buried inside the depths of the earth. The dead cross a river to get there, must pass through gates guarded by the monstrous many-headed hound Cerberus, and present themselves for judgment before King Hades. In the Odyssey, a sequel to the Iliad, Hades is described in even greater detail, and is now located at the end of the earth, on the far western shore of the massive dark river Okeanos, beyond the gates of the sun and the land of dreams. Hesiod's Theogony describes Hades as lying at the end of the flat disk of the earth, beyond the river Okeanos and the land of evening. Hesiod also introduces the Islands of the Blessed, a paradise realm reserved for the great mythological heroes. Charon, the ferryman of the dead, first appears in the epic poem The Minyad, attributed to Prodicus the Phocaean, date unknown, punting souls across the Acherousian lake in a skiff. Here the dead are often described roaming across fields of asphodel, a pale grey plant that is edible but virtually tasteless, regarded by the ancients as a food of last resort. In most versions, life in the underworld is full of shadows, without sunlight or hope, a joyless place where the souls of the dead eventually fade into nothingness. Few mortals escape back into the land of the living, with two notable exceptions. Hercules descended to Hades to rescue Theseus and also capture the giant hound Cerberus. But in Greek mythology there were few mortals like Hercules, it takes an exceptional person to undertake exceptional adventures, such as Captain Alex Hunter, the Arcadian. Sauromatians, the snake people of ancient Russia. The Sarmatians, or Sauromatians, were an Iranian people whose territory covered the western part of Greater Scythia, modern southern Russia, Ukraine, and the eastern Balkans, from about the 5th century B.C. to the 4th century A.D. Archaeological evidence suggests that Scythian Sarmatian cultures may have given rise to the myth of the Amazons. Graves of women have been found in southern Ukraine and Russia with the women dressed for battle. Their bones showed signs of deep wounds, meaning these women didn't just dress for battle, they also fought. The Greek name Sarmatai derives from the shortening of Sauromatai, which is associated with the word lizard, Sauros. The Greeks compared the Sauromatians to lizards because of their reptile-like scale armor, created by slicing horses' hooves into discs and lashing them together. They also carried dragon standards and had sharp teeth and small, lively eyes. The Sauromatians started to decline in the 3rd century, finally disappearing in the 4th century due to the incursions of the Huns, Goths, and Turks. Stone Man Syndrome How does someone turn to stone, become a living statue? The condition is still largely a mystery today. So is it any wonder that the ancient Greeks, Cretans, Minoans, Iranians, and dozens of other races came up with all manner of legends to account for this bizarre affliction? In the 17th century, the French physician Charles Pétain described a case of a woman who was turning to wood, which was actually the uncontrolled growth of bone. The woman had an incredibly rare condition that caused her flesh, cartilage, tendons, and organs to slowly ossify. In 1736, British physician John Frick described a youth with strange rock-hard swellings all over his back. The disease was named myositis ossificans progressiva, which means muscle turns to bone. The name was officially changed to fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, FOP, in the 1970s. Though fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva is the medical term, the condition is commonly referred to as stone man syndrome. It is extremely rare, affecting one in two million people. A mutation of the body's repair mechanism causes tissue to become ossified when damaged. In many cases, 
Injury causes a joint to become permanently frozen by rapid new bone creation. When the new bone is surgically removed, the body replaces it with even more bone, and the more rapidly the disease progresses. The best-known case is that of Harry Eastlack, 1933-1973, whose condition began at the age of 10. By the time of his death from pneumonia, shortly before his 40th birthday, his body had completely ossified, and he was only able to move his lips. Eastlack donated his body to science, in the hope that scientists might find a cure for this little understood, terrible disease. His preserved skeleton is kept at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, and has been an invaluable source of information in the study of FOP. Why does a healthy person's body turn on itself like this? Evolutionary biologists have theorized that higher mutation rates are beneficial in some situations because they enable organisms to adapt more quickly to their environments. For example, bacteria that is repeatedly exposed to antibiotics can have a much higher mutation rate than the original population, developing into a stronger strain. However, there doesn't seem to be a logical explanation for FOP. It's believed to be caused by a molecular misfire, a major system error in the human body. Something causes the body's wound repair system to malfunction, gradually converting tendons, ligaments, and skeletal muscle into sheets of armor plating. The sufferer becomes a prisoner in his or her own body. Stone Man Syndrome is one of the rarest conditions known to humankind, and one of the body's enduring mysteries. Acknowledgements As a kid, I believed in magic. Now, as an adult, and seeing the way professional editors work their dark art, I believe in magic all over again. Thank you to Nicola and Tara. Your work is a mix of good ideas, good judgment, and magic. Also, thank you to Pan Macmillan's Momentum's entire formidable team, and especially Joel and Mark, who turn my words into a book. Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travelers, families, and people who are on the go. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at bolinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Bolinda audiobook with you.